Welcome, everybody. We are here for the November OCC Clash. We have a heck of a special show for you today because not only do we have three more card reveals for Winter War releasing on November 29th, but we also have the last stop before the Cards World Championship. And uh, we also have some uh, special guest casters here today. So speaking of the World Championship, I mean, we got a, we got a couple folks here I want to talk to uh, about that because, uh, I mean, let's actually, let's start with Starry, who, you know, uh, somebody we we see month over month here, but uh, but Starry, you're uh, you're getting ready to be on your way to Iceland for the first uh, your first opportunity to cast the World Championships live. How are you feeling yeah. about that? Uh, very excited. Um, I will be seeing you and Thanatron. So. I will be there. <laughs> yeah, uh, both of us should be there. So. And uh, and Thanatron, you're you're getting ready, freshly qualified to play in the World Championships. How uh, how are you feeling about that? Uh, really excited. Uh, actually, just received my passport, so all systems are a go. I'm no longer worried about the government not allowing me. So, uh, really, really excited. Actually, now it's uh, it's starting. It's starting to feel real. Awesome. Well, I am excited to see you both, and uh, I I can't wait. It was such an amazing experience last year. It's going to be phenomenal this year as well. But uh, we've got you know a matter at hand here. We have a OCC clash we need to get going on with. So let's bring up the bracket and show you exactly who will be competing today in this November OCC clash. We're going to have J King versus Godion as the first feature quarter finals. We've got Ozzy taking on head. Dandelion against Killswitch is our second feature quarterfinal, with Chaos taking on Birdo Burrito in the final quarterfinal here today. So a quick reminder, we've got a slight tweak to the prize pool here, where uh, the top three will be making some cash. Uh, four through eight will be getting some diamonds. We're also going to see a slight change in format come December, where only the top two players on ladder will actually qualify, uh, which means, you know, more than than, uh, more than just the last two, we'll have to grind it out through the qualifiers to make it here to the clash. So that is going to change for the first time in December and obviously continue through 2024. But let's get into our first matchup here. We got J King versus Guardian. Let's bring up J King's player card. We have seen it um, all but one month so far this year. <laughs> um, and I feel like every time we see it, Starry, he's playing less and less matches to go ahead and qualify first year. Yeah, I mean, 84. 5% win rate is really, really impressive. Um, we see that J King's favorite card is Double Strength, which he's been using recently in a very funny OTK deck. I know that he's been trying for a really long time to make this card work. And the fact that he finally found a list that he felt comfortable with bringing to OCCs that plays Double Strength is hysterical. I love it. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's not much to say about J King uh, other than that he is uh, at an impressive 85% this, this month. And he's back again and getting ready for the World Championships as well. Let's go ahead and take a look at the deck lineup and see if he snuck that double strength list in again this month. Starry, why don't you take us through? Yeah, so J King's first deck is a Soviet Italy deck. Um, I may or may not have been the one that <laughs> came up with something like this. Uh, but he took my list and completely ran with it. He uh, is playing three copies of Fiat, uh, two copies of Five Year Plan, and two Confusion. So uh, what J King did is took this kind of heavy control list and made it have a much lower curve, uh, especially with those Fiats getting the early life gain and the early um, anti aggro being able to trade off with enemy units and then refilling the hand with these five-year plans a little bit different strategy than um some other variants but i uh, definitely curious to see how it does against the control matchups you can bust off those five-year plans and um you know recoup your value and against the aggro matchups you have all of these low cost answers for everything that they have so yeah definitely really creative and uh, curious to see how this version does. Uh, then we have the US Germany frontline list. This is like J King's signature deck. Um, J King is not playing any Stars and Stripes, only playing one copy of 109th Combat Engineers, playing four copies of Greyhound, and one copy of Enigma, and one copy of Eagle Claws. 
The Enigma and the Eagle Claws are definitely interesting. The Eagle Claws has recently been seeing play in a lot of decks to take out stuff like I Achieve Martyr, but the Enigma is something that we've only really seen in the last OCC, in the OCC Ultimate. This is a pretty new development, and it seems like it's pretty expensive to play in Frontline. Um, I'm not sure how I feel about it, but, um, you know, Jake knows what he's doing. I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure that he's tested a plenty. And then the last list is a Britain, France mobilized list. And, I mean, this list is pretty standardized at this point. Um, the, there's a lot of one ofs in this list. Like, for example, one copy of Kitty Hawk, one copy of Carl the Colonies, one copy of Airdrop. But other than that, um, it's a really standard list. You're going to be playing your early game um, mobilize units to try and develop an early field. Then you're going to start keeping them, start comboing them with Potas, and uh, ideally use like Commandos Kiefer and Kitty Hawk to uh, continue to heal, continue to get damage. And then in the end, you're hoping to get a Commonwealth, but because those mobilize units are strong enough on their own sometimes. If they're left unchecked, sometimes you don't need it. Sometimes you just end up with a 15-16-73rd uh, a uh, Regiment d'Infanterie. Uh, so, yep, yeah, those are Jaking's three decks. Right on. Thank you so much, Starry. Let's flip over to the other side and take a look at his opponent, Godyuan, and uh, and take a look at their player cards. So here we have uh, 443 total matches, 65% win rate, finishing 23rd on the season, went through the long road of the qualifiers and gets paired up with the first place competitor, J-King. So um, Thanatron, I haven't seen Godyuan very much. Do you have any insight onto who they are or where they're from? Uh, I don't actually. Uh, this is a player that I am definitely uh, really unfamiliar with. Uh, you can see coming through uh, the 23rd rank, playing the plane, getting through the plane. Uh, that plane is a gauntlet. Anybody that makes it through that plane is pretty much certified, as far as I'm concerned. So, uh, making it to this stage, uh, huge achievement. Uh, he should be very proud of himself. And, you know, anybody that makes it here deserves to be here, in my mind. You know, there's no. There's no paper tigers in uh in the uh, OCC clash, so really definitely going through the see what he's got today. Yeah, definitely going through the play, and there's absolutely no easy path there. Let's bring up their deck lineup and have uh, Thanatron. Let's uh, let's take us through it. So the first thing we see is a Soviet Brit list, uh, which is pretty interesting here. The first thing that sticks out to me is there's only two monsoon rots and only two supply shortages. He's not running any kind of carpet bombs or anything like that either. So uh, this feels pretty thin on AoE to me, which definitely isn't necessarily a bad thing, right? Uh, it's going to maybe play really well into the other control matchup, uh, maybe against J King's uh, Soviet control deck. Uh, there's not going to be a lot of board flood in those control matchups. So being thin on the AoE allows you to take maybe some more units uh, or some more firepower late game. Only one Pedal Yakov, uh, kind of interesting too. Uh, you kind of see sometimes maybe people try to bring the second one in. There's some debate maybe whether that's you know too greedy or not, but uh, Pedal Yakov obviously can be a game wrecker. J King has US Frontline, and we've seen before. I've been on the wrong end of it publicly, uh, playing US Frontline when a Pedal Yakov is out. It is uh, not fun. Uh, and then we come to the first of two different Legions decks, which is really interesting. Uh, the first we have uh, Japan Poland Legions, which is uh, probably the most basic uh, and meta legions that we've seen. Some really normal stuff here with Tarnow and Uprising, Underground States, the Karas, the Plan Wests. It's a very normal legions package, and it's the same kind of thing that we've seen it with a lot. Uh, we've got the Type 94s for pin, we've got big planes, we've got air subs to play off the planes. Uh, so. Really, really cool stuff there. We'll see what happens with that. And then the last deck is a Brit Legions, which is a kind of like a Legions variant I feel like we see a lot less of. Although I personally uh, and some other Team Heavy members, I think, think that maybe that might be the uh, stronger version, the more powerful version. So uh, again, pretty bog standard uh, Legions set here from his Polish cards. But uh, we see 
a lot of uh, great stuff from Britain, including just the ability to uh, stall and play that Commonwealth, right? Uh, you get a whole other win condition when playing Brit Legions of that Commonwealth instead of just having to rely on making some giant legions or getting home with some blitz planes like you might be trying to do with the Japan deck. So really two separate approaches here, and it'll be really interesting to see how he plays both legions decks. Thank you so much, Thanatron. Let's go ahead and bring up the bands so we can get a sense of exactly what these players will be equipped with. So J-King's Soviet list will be banned. Starry, sorry, sorry. Won't get to see that one. Um, and then one of the uh, Legion's deck gets knocked out here, the uh, Brit Polish version. So um, seems like based on what you're saying here, Thanatron, that uh, maybe J-King agrees that that might be the, uh, the go-to Legion's deck, or is it just a question of having Commonwealth in there and maybe not feeling super comfortable with that wing condition? I think it's both, right? Like, uh, when, when your opponent turtles hard and like they're good at turtling, their deck is built for turtling and they're just watching them stack health and there's not much you can do. And you know that as soon as the game reaches turn 12, like, oh, I'm in danger now. Like I could lose at any moment. So uh, it's definitely harder. Uh, it's sort of like fighting a, a fight on two fronts. So it's probably a lot better for J King to just be like, let me, let me play the Japanese version. Uh, you know, I know it's coming at me, uh, and I, I feel, you know, more centered uh, there. I and sorry, let's look at the other side. You know, you were talking about that Soviet Italy list, um, a little bit how, you know, Jaking lowered the curve of it, make it a little bit more flexible. What do you think Godin saw and said, I don't want to deal with that? I'm really surprised, um, personally, that the Soviet Italy list was banned, as it seemed pretty tacked against, like, aggro. Um, but it might just be that, um, like traditionally legions, at least in my experience, I, I'm not shaking, but I really struggle against, uh, legions when I play stuff like frontline. Um, so I don't know. He might've just thought that he had a better matchup against, against like frontline than. Well, this we're, uh... We're going to find out as we get into the first quarterfinals here of our November OCC. So J King is considering throwing back the fifth parachute brigade. That is definitely not what I was expecting. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a really yeah, interesting it... match, right? Because like we start with J King basically playing uh, a hard meta. Uh, these are three out of the four decks that he brought to uh, World Championship for, I believe, top six, and I think even all the way back to top 32, uh, playing Mobilize as his Brit deck. And then uh, Godwin coming with more, you know, these Legions decks, they're not, not meta, right? But they're definitely more of maybe like a little bit of a lower tier. So it feels like he sort of sees something maybe in the matchup or is just really, really comfortable with these sort of like uh legions based or or uh i mean and also his his uh, british deck right uh more control based stuff so i think that's very interesting going into the match mm -hmm. yeah and j king it looks like j king's mulligan was actually really good being able to curve uh turn 173rd into turn two honey into turn three convoy is like that's that's hard to deal with especially when you're going second But yeah, um, God Yuan, something that I noticed between the different deck lists is that the Britain deck is a lot lighter on um, Polish units. Like, there's no Tarnovs, there's no Karas. Um, yeah, I don't know. So I'm curious to see, are, like, uh, he is still playing Uprising, and I'm curious to see if Uprising is going to work when you have less polish units dying and therefore your uprisings are going to be like uh, a lot less damage going through i don't know i'm curious to see how that works yeah it's a really interesting point um great point really he's he also has a silesian which i'm sure i'm not you know, doing a great job of saying but he's a really interesting take as well polish card that's not seen very much uh I yeah would maybe like to see those surprise attacks wait for something like a potes i'm understand that a five six is very large and you know definitely needs dealt with but uh 
it, it might be rough once uh once Jay King starts just healing and drawing. No potes yet, but you you know it's coming and uh the Surrey's gonna allow him to kind of sit for a little bit as well. Yeah, I was thinking the same thing, but I am surprised that Jay King didn't play the the uh seventy third first. Um but instead just opting to trade. I guess keeping the keeping the seventy uh, third for the Potes later, knowing that you have three of them in your deck. So, mobilize kind of does these phases. I guess I call them where like phase one is you're just playing mobilize units because they're good and they're gonna grow, and then phase two you kind of dirtle for a bit and keep back your mobilize units uh, to try and combo with Potes, and like that that phase two happens uh, usually around turn six, and then your last phase is like playing towards Commonwealth. So. And going right along with uh, sort of what you just outlined there, right? Like he could take a Potez draw, but it's it's definitely too early. We see Suri come out, try to buy him some time. Mm -hmm. And now this next upcoming turn, we might see for six credits, the Potez with two mobilized units for two draws. Uh, mm -hmm. But he, holding three mobilized, you know, he might also wait all the way till turn seven. He's really going to try to fix that out. Uh, I'm not a huge mobilized player myself, but I mean, I definitely have played it, and it always feels like mobilized will take you as far as the Potezes take you. They're definitely yep. Yep. absolutely sure. integral. So, although God Yuan did burn those surprise attacks on the first unit, um, they are keeping back that air superiority, specifically to deal with Potez, knowing that like turn six is a pretty key turn to drop Potez usually. Jaking already up to 27 health. And as you called, perfectly the air sup. Very efficient. Take that both draw and heal engine off the table. And we'll see the beginnings of the Polish infantry coming out. Yeah, the, um, the recon is super good in combination with the Tarnovs. Having a one cost infant or a one cost intel card that also puts down a really strong body is one of the reasons why Japan Legions has been seeing increased play since the last expansion. <clears throat> Cause yeah, I don't think Britain has any one one cost um intel cards except for Ortzel and or it's always kind of, kind of meh. It's not super great. Whereas, the recon has a a much stronger effect for the same cost. Not a ton of stuff for Jaking to catch with his countermeasure. Um, raiding brigade, Dina, uh, some smaller, uh, deployment effects. Kind of really all that a Japan Polish list is uh is really gonna have there. So. I wouldn't say that it's, you know, dead in his hand, but. But then again, uh, you know, Surrey, Honeys, the, 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 the mobilized units when they're sort of young, these are going to be things with two or less attacks. So if he can catch Raiding Brigade with it, you know, could be a pretty swingy play. Yeah, God Yuan foiled out, golded out this entire deck. True. It's... I'm I'm assuming that he spent quite a lot of credits or um gold to do that. <laughs> um I guess something that I'm curious about is how J King is gonna try and push for that last little bit of damage because if if J King doesn't wipe this board right here, then God Yuan is just gonna like play long range uh Long Range Recon, I think it's called, and heal way out of Commonwealth range. Surprised to not see that the... Interesting he's making trades. Uh, and yeah, uh, I would have thought that the Recon was going to come out first, but... Especially since we know with the supply shortage that that Aichi is not only dying uh, next turn, but it's also not getting its destruction. Could play it right now for even a little bit less health, but chooses to go second raiding brigade here. We do know the first one is somewhere in the deck. Uh, Kokura is not a bad pick here either, in my opinion. Yeah, 
Yeah, you do have to be careful when you're playing in Britain because if it dies to supply shortage, you don't get that destruction effect. But yeah, having just like a a six six that is hard to remove is pretty strong. But I think raiding brigade makes sense because it takes out honeys, it takes out the East Surrey, takes out Commando's Kiefer. Um, there's a lot of stuff with like smokescreen or these problematic cards that are pretty crucial to get rid of. Making would have loved to see Tarnow be the uh, card that got completely thrown out of the game uh, with God Godwin's full hand. Not the worst for him. Uh, and again, that we know that Aichi is dead. So that was a pretty nice Avre. Yeah, I mean, surely this is the play that makes the most sense, <laughs> but that evasive action coming in. Just one copy of evasive action. Um, you thought which I had I think... one raiding brigade? I have a backup raiding <laughs> brigade. Yeah, Godyuan sees that commonwealth in Jaekun's hand. It is under intel. So Godyuan knows that within the next two turns, they need to either take take jaking below 30 or get above 20 Which and when you're earlier. staring down a churchill <laughs> right and it makes that earlier not playing long range recon extremely interesting you figure in god Yuan's head he's saying i have more time right like i have three or four turns here before commonwealth is a threat so like i have time but the way long range recon works with it being based on how wide the board is to get that health Sometimes you got to grab that value when it's presented to you. I don't know that he's going to see another board truly worth grabbing a, a good bit of health. He's just going to get just enough to not have to worry about Commonwealth, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, gaining eight is a lot, um, but is it enough? That's the key question. Now J. King has the challenge of trying to fight his way through these legions to try and eke out that last eight points. And does, does J. King play Wellington? I didn't see it in his list, but I'm going to double check real quick. Uh, yeah, J. King doesn't play Wellington, which means that um, he's going to have to get through either with um, Kitty Hawk or on the ground or with a fighter, essentially no bombers, no bombers, no artillery. And although it took him a little bit to sort of make the play as he thought everything out, you can tell, you know, Jay King, a true master of threat assessment. He mm -hmm. sees the board, you know, that, that God Yuan is, is sitting on and he knows that the tar now is the most important thing to get rid of. So. Yeah, without around the tar now lines up that big Avre shot. It's really yeah. a problem unit. Without the the, it, if you keep the Tarnov around, it is you're gonna really really struggle to get that last eight points of damage, and both players are very much aware of that. Jaking has a lot of mobilized units and not a lot of payoff for it. Yeah, desperately wants a Potez. Uh, the Ultra sort of looms large here as well. Love to catch the AoE with it, but also might really love to catch that other long range recon and prevent another eight or so health from finding its way to God Yuan's HQ. Yeah, God Yuan is at a critical. Like, um,. The credit total that God Yuan is at allows them to play Tarnov, push up, play some more cards with Intel, and just like keep the keep the value train rolling. The only concern is that you you could potentially deck out, but by the time you do that, your legions are gonna be so huge that it's not gonna matter. 
And it's the second long range that triggers the ultra. So that bombing raid is going to see play. But I don't think that J King is going to be too concerned about that. And there's the photos. My man is about to draw. Getting drawn off the ultra. Yeah, starting off with the Kiefer. Are we going to see another Kiefer? Just start pinging the board like crazy. Also if... holding the retreat card to spawn two units. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, um, okay. if J King finds a way to remove one of those two units, then... Could even throw to... down one last mobilize for one last draw, two more health. Jaking when Potez is down, away. airdrop is an absolutely absurd card. Create two one ones with mobilize, and draw two cards, and gain four HQ defense for three credits. <laughs> yeah, you know what a ridiculous card! Many times. Oh, and retreat, and retreat, <laughs> <laughs> and retreat. We didn't even give it enough ends. That's how good it is. Couldn't even remember them. Yeah, it's only usually one or two of because it's so situational, but it is worth playing just because when you do get to play it, it's unbelievably good. <laughs> it's so strong. But Godjuan is at a crazy HQ defense here. It's going to be tough for Jaking to, to get. You know, that's that you're trying to kill two HQs right there. One of them will die to Commonwealth, but you still have to get through another HQ worth of defense. And that big KI 83 coming down as well. Uh, J King probably going to lack hard removal for that, so. Yeah, and J King's running out of cards in deck. I mean, if we look at J King's deck versus Godion's deck, Godion is has way more cards in deck than J King. And if you play Commonwealth, you're at four less cards in deck, so J King's gotta be really, really, really careful with how they spend every single card at this point. Only one rot for J King in the deck as well. Uh, which yep. has to be coming up. Like you said, he's getting really low, so that rot is, you know, probably coming pretty soon. But And unfortunately with that splash rot out, that's not gonna be quite enough to kill Tarnov. Really considering this under fire, uh, pinning yeah, the sexton is, is definitely going to be very helpful. But, I mean, I have to assume that he's going to run that tar now in because he knows it's dead. So yeah, he'll take yeah. the pin kill on the guard and then run the tar now into the sexton to clear J King's board. And that big KI 83. And there and it is. Rot. Peak of the devil. So, really tenuous position for both players. Yeah, so J King can like play a Kitty Hawk and play some command, like play Commando's Kiefer and just play out some mobilized units, but they're probably not going to stay alive very long. And the key is going to take out the Kitty Hawk. And so, you know, is that enough value out of the Kitty Hawk? Especially since it's one of your few ways to get damage that isn't... Um, that isn't, like, attacking, right? It's one of your few ways to actually get through damage. But even, even if you did manage to keep Kitty Hawk around for a couple turns, there's no way that you're going to play the 17 units necessary to get... God, you on down to twenty for your Commonwealth. So I don't know. It's it's really tough for Jaking here. What's the rot rip now? Because he knows that that Ki eighty three is the biggest target for the monster rot, no matter what. Anyway. Mhm. Mm so. The mobilized units gonna start to come out. There's one Potes left for Jaking, but with so little cards left. 
that draw could be more of a hindrance. Oh, and a beautiful, beautiful draw. Oh, he actually already had a supply shortage. I'm, I'm being silly. <laughs> yeah, but does J King have any way to protect against that? Not cheating. The J King's at the point where. I'm not sure if he's going to be able to guarantee this commonwealth coming up. And if you don't guarantee this commonwealth, 37 is just a completely impossible life total to get through. Yeah, such There's a no way that you're going to get through. You can see mobilized lack of hard removal really coming into play here. Uh, you know, some people may still take defend in depths to try to deal with that. But you can see even in this situation, uh, that would only be three damage. Well, well shortage he would be able to get rid of sheet in there so in many ways this reminds me of credit denial where like if you really only have like 30 damage in your deck and if your opponent gets above 30 then good luck to you <laughs> yeah god Yuan doesn't have any cards in hand but you know one of the weaknesses of mobilize is that a lot of the cards individually are not that strong. Maybe some of the strongest synergy in the game, but individually, a lot of the cards are not super, super strong, especially in the late game. Right, you're just sitting there with uh, a whole bunch of early game stuff in late game that has no time to grow. Yeah, J King has maybe four cards left, it looks like. Pinning the full backline will, will really buy him a turn here, but a lot of what he's holding is also draw, which uh, is not yep. wor worse than worthless at this point. Yep, and now even with the Sincerely Yours, you're not going to be able to get to 30. I think this is pretty much lights out for Jaking here. Yeah, three cards left in deck. Yeah, God Yuan doesn't even really need to do anything at this point. You just survive, which obviously you're going to do because you have a bunch of legions. Potez, bottom three, bottom four of the last Potez there for Jaking. It's it's really hard to win when Potez's show up to work that late. It's uh, it's it's just rough going, you know, mobilize. Like, we, we, we started this game by saying how integral the Potez was to mobilize, so... Just sort of rough there, but, but that's the way that that's going to happen. Yeah, they can, can't even really play for fatigue here. Kika is a great get. Yeah, I mean, is there any possibility that if you let these mobilized guys grow and God Yuan doesn't have enough... Um, you know, value? Is it possible? I mean, Jaking's gonna be taking six, seven, eight, so Jaking has three turns left. I can't imagine just because with all that infantry, it's just too slow. It's way no too slow. Way, way, that, way too slow. That Potes, there's no way. And with the uh, Kika, that makes it a two turn clock, so Jaking needs to present lethal next turn. Yeah, that's that. There's no way. That's that's just not possible. Of course, Jaking though, literally bringing it back from the brink, so far that you even need to consider like, can he? Yeah, really, I mean, can he really pull this off with just the, he, this? He did this a great job sticking in. He 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 hung in there. Thinking it through now, that Potes has to come out after the units because the the fatigue draw, damage from the draw would be more than the two health that it would yield. And we see Potes come out last. J King throws it all down. Yeah, even even with without that underground state, uh, this was not winnable for J King. Yeah, I would have maybe liked to... I, I don't think it would matter, but uh, God Yuan could have killed that with the Aichi and taken a one of three uh, on to try to hit the Potez with the uh, audacity there. 
instead took the one of four and basically killed the only unit that he could have guaranteed killed anyway. Uh, probably not going to matter, but uh, not necessarily the play that you want to make. Uh, we'll see if it yeah. ends up being a true throw, but I think he's fine. I'm very confused as to why J-King isn't conceding here. I mean, it's very clear that it's quite literally impossible to win. You just don't even have... Even if your opponent passed instantly, you still couldn't win. Even if they passed every single turn instantly. And this should be game. J King's gonna take. Sa I, uh, God, Jon, I'm pretty sure that if you just attack IT into Potes and hit face, that's that's it. It's over. Or even to the last man. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's multiple ways to win here. Um, the only really way that doesn't win. That, yeah, I mean, like, you could just win this turn right here, right now. <laughs> you could pass. You could get lethal. <laughs> you could just throw it. Throw all the units in the trash and play for fatigue. Dealer's choice. Yeah, and you have intel on both your opponent's cards. I'm really not sure what's going on here. Just pass. <laughs> Silver. Yeah. Truly odd to see J King play this out as well, but. Making your opponent, you know, think extra and, and any kind of extra stress that you can put on them, uh, I, th I think can be very useful. So. All right, Maybe a little we'll bit see of game action to God Yuan, and God Yuan's gonna need to win with that Soviet deck next. And that Soviet deck, like we said, that Pedro Yakov can just completely brick U.S. frontline to the point where it almost For doesn't sure. function, and For that sure. matchup is now looming. So. Yeah, Pedro Yakov is really, really hard to beat with frontline. It's it's funny because you don't think frontline has that many deployment effects, and then you play it and you realize that like every card has a deployment effect. <laughs> You're like, oh, I mean, like greyhounds and red devils and thirty five T's. Like, oh wait, thirty five T's right. a deployment effect. <laughs> you know, like. And They're cards so that you don't how... even think of as deployment effects, you know, like right. Um, it takes like ranges from being and... a great card yeah. to being a terrible card. <laughs> so we have early AOE and early sickles for God Yuan, which is really good for him. And then we have early mobilize for J King, who kept a Potez. That handle looks really, really nice for J-King. After the Potez is coming so late last game, uh, or at least, you know, the latter two, especially the third one, he is not letting that one slip out of the mulligan for sure. But another big play here uh, is the Confusions. Uh, which, let me check how many uh, of those God Yuan is running, but he's basically going to have his pick of the litter as far as targets for that confusion almost at any point in the game. Really great to grab something like Kiefer's with that uh, so that you can just throw it into another unit, maybe get two kills, get rid of that smoke screen, get rid of those pings. Yeah, well, that would only work if your opponent has a front line. Um... But yeah, confusion, it can be kind of hit or miss against Mobilize, personally, uh, because a lot of Mobilize's units have more defense than they do attack, and so oftentimes they like don't trade into each other super well. Um, Good point, for sure. But if you can manage to trade a unit into another unit, it's like super strong. It is just the one confusion. It's probably day. a bit premature to play a Potez, but at the same time, like J King has all of them. So what else? What else do you do here? If not, a lot more to catch with that evasive action this time around. 
Yeah, the evasive action would catch like a naval brigade or. Um... Yeah, an ISU board clear, something like that. So it'd be really swingy. Or uh, you know, you know what would be a huge deal? Catching thirty ninth. Catching thirty ninth would be huge. And now I think we're gonna see the Potas come out from Jake King. Potas seventy third, seventy third. Mm-hmm. Oh, going for the fifth parachute instead of the other seventy third. Ooh, what, what a, a great, draw! What a great draw! Oh man. Like no longer worried draw. about that Potez, oh, except for oh. the evasive action. Completely we've talked about, about the what it could action. catch, right? And you know, obviously, if you were able to use it to stop like a whole board clear, that would be legendary. But using it just to keep a Potez alive is going to be such a huge boon for the mobile sure. player. Absolutely. Yeah. Any any time that Potez comes down, it needs to die. Just that turn. You you can't even let it live for one turn. Put and here we see, as we spoke a... about <laughs> just seconds ago, about whether J King would take the front line or not, and and you know risk getting hit by that confusion. But with the use of uh, the supply shortage, uh, I uh, God you on, you know that unit is already going to die. So that timeline is is definitely accelerated. So we'll see how we'll see what he does with that. That could be really interesting as well. Yeah. It's kind of awkward here because you don't have a whole lot to do, but you kind of need to play units into the artillery because otherwise you're not drawing, you're not really doing anything, you're not advancing your Commonwealth game plan. So at least this way, J King can put down some chonky boys onto the battlefield. That three defense versus two defense is a pretty big difference. Interesting yeah, that he just takes the kill there. I think I would have thrown it into the Potez. I understand the Potez is clearly like marked for death, right? But uh... yeah, I kind of agree. I mean, it ends up being the right choice just because J King has two more Potezes in hand. But I I do think that in a vacuum it probably makes more sense to to just kill the potas. You're denying you're denying not only draw but like you're denying a lot of health gain as well. Uh, again, to your point, you're not actually right. He's got <laughs> he's got all of his potas, but oh, both hits on the on the uh, the artillery. That's brutal. And J King's just clearing the uh, the supply shortage out of his hand because it doesn't really do anything against this deck. Making room to draw, making sure to not overdraw Commonwealth, very important. Yeah, and Commonwealth truly could be the game here for sure, as J King has zoomed up to over thirty five health, and uh, I don't believe. Let me check if for fortifications. So we got two fortifications uh, in God Yuan's deck. So he's going to hopefully, for his sake, maybe find one of those in the next four turns uh, so that he can kind of, or three turns, so he can kind of feel okay. Obviously, J. King could struggle to draw Commonwealth. It could be as buried as his third Potez was last game, you know, and that's going to end up being really terrible for him. But God Yuan, of course, not going to know that. So. If I was him, I would be really hoping to see one of those fortifications soon. He plays Engineers as well, so uh, he can get some health off that as well. But that's going to require, obviously, losing units.
Yeah, unfortunately, Petlyakov is just not super crazy in this matchup. In a lot of matchups, it just walls your opponent, but this deck plays basically no deployment effects. So... I I like this play from God, you know, on using the mobile defense to draw an extra card. Has Jaking used the evasive action this game? Uh, he has. That's what caught okay. the uh, RD. Oh from yeah, the destroying. Yep. Right, that first. Yes, the thirty ninth is gonna be is gonna come out on whatever God Yuan wants, and that is a strong card. Thirty ninth is a crazy card. Yeah, Mr. Especially... Steal Your Girl, as he is referred to uh, in the Team Heavy ranks, and uh, when he <laughs> steals your girl, it feels terrible. Yeah, especially if your girl has been sitting around on the battlefield with mobilized for a couple turns and you're catching a 5-5 fury with zero operation cost after all that work you put in on the relationship and gone in an instant yeah it's rough buddy yeah, and we'll see he'll take and move it to the front line so that's a 4-4 a four, four Fury. Yeah, J-King is... I mean, God Yuan has to think that J-King has Commonwealth here, right? Like, you're most of, you, you have to play around it, because um, you're most of the way through your deck. J-King is over halfway through the deck. And... Um, let's see... Okay, yeah, J King's Commonwealth is hidden pretty deep, but there's is there any way for God Yuan to get above twenty or get J King below thirty? And and the answer is not really. Yeah, not at really this point, at even all. if you were even if you were able to find uh, a fortification and let's say get to like twenty five, twenty six, with J King at fifty two, I don't really see. Yeah, I don't see and that I, happening. I don't see a GPW either. Uh, in God Yuan's deck, going over the deck list now. Yeah, I yeah I don't see a great patriotic war. So like, uh, the the situation where he's finding fifty two damage, even regardless of surviving Commonwealth at this point, seems very skeptical. Yep. The board clears a good start. Yeah, hitting for 8 a turn is ordinarily quite a lot. Enough to finish your opponent off very quickly. But not in this matchup. 51 is just way too much health to get through. And we're going to see this awesome airdrop come out. Yeah, you have to figure. What a strong card. The health, the buffs, the draw, and there's the, the commonwealth. commonwealth, the 60 health. Yeah, it should be over next turn. I don't really see any way that God Yuan can get out of this. I mean, you could draw fortification. It is possible. Just but that's just delaying the inevitable. The inevitable. Jinx. <laughs> or you could draw like six cards. I mean, at least it feels good. Seven cards. You're gonna overdraw. No fortification. Oh my. There's two fortifications. Oh, it in is. The deck. It is six cards. I'm. I'm very good at math. <laughs> Extremely good at math. Not finding either of the fortifications in the first probably two thirds of his deck. Uh... Yeah, I'm sure that God Yuan isn't happy about that, but at the same time, like. Was it going to matter? Probably not. Very unlikely. No. And we're going to see a game three. We're going to see a front line versus this Soviet Britain list. Pedal Yakov versus front line. A rivalry as old as time. Yeah, a lot of this match is probably going to come down to whether God Yuan can get an early Pedal Yakov protected by Bryansk regulars. That usually 
has a pretty a... big swing on how the match goes. And if you don't get it, then... Um... It feels like a death knell as soon as you see it as the frontline player. Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a really nice start for J-King. It is a very nice start for J-King. J-King also only running one Eagle Claw, which uh, can make Pedro Yakov even uh, more annoying to get rid of. I'm surprised that J-King mulliganed the second um, 164th. But considering that God Yuan doesn't have a Bloody Sickle or Winter Warfare at the moment, it actually is quite astute. No Sickle to make sure that that 1 1's not yielding its buff anywhere either. So, yeah, really I mean, nice if start here for J King. If you're J King, you know that your opponent doesn't have the Winter Warfare or the Bloody Sickle because if if they did, they like have to spend it on the 164th to avoid the buff and the uh, Panzer 35T deployment it's reduction. Down. The Blitz already. Yeah, that's that's Without a play. Using it. I certainly Especially... understand it. O only in that there's no good hammer target. You're trying to greet out on that supply shortage, and your other two cards are obviously six cost on turn three, so they're not viable at all. So rather than pass the entire turn, he sits it down because it's going to take hard r removal or, or order removal no matter what, being that that, that is the, the arty that goes back to hand when attacked. So I, I sort of get it, but it's definitely a poverty play. He's not happy about it. Yeah, it's, it is a little bit... Um, on one hand, it's really, really strong if it sticks around. But on the, on the other hand, if it dies to Eagle Claws, you're like super not happy about it. So, I don't know. It's It really, really heavily played into Eagle Claws, but in the worlds where Jaking doesn't have Eagle Claws, it's really good. So, Only I one claw as well, so playing the odds. Here, I would imagine you almost have to go Briance, Connie. You can maybe make a case for Honey and killing the Sherman with a hammer, but that's not going to feel great either. And that strat yeah. bomb for J King is also looming large for whatever this backline that God Yuan is about to develop. I'm going to be honest, all the plays look suboptimal. Like, you, and pick pick any combination of two cards that God Yuan can play, and none of them really answer the problem. Chooses to kill the Sherman. I expect that we seek a combat engineer. Oh, okay. Yeah, that works. I was expecting like combat engineers hands or push up path track, but yeah, getting the value train rolling with sky train also definitely good. Definitely don't mind that. Sky train gets the game. buff. It's gonna stick around yeah. for quite a while. <laughs> At this point, J King's hand is so extensive that I don't even think that he would care about seeing Pedro Yakov. At least not for like four or five turns. Yeah, I mean, if J King drops strap bombing here, then uh Pedro Yakov doesn't really do anything. Two Briansks would be out of the deck as soon as this one is uh, gone as well, so that is a big deal, although what J-King does not know is that Armored Train is in hand. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I, I would like to see Strap Bomb here. Strap Bomb on Curve is the obviously thing... just great for the credit as well. Yeah, the only thing about Strap Bombing is it's one of your two answers to this BM, your other one being Pathfinders. And so... It's really, really, really hard to justify playing strap bombing. Like, and then just eating two damage to a unit every turn. I don't know. I, I don't. So I wouldn't mind seeing the strap total, bombing, right? have, but. His three answers total, right? It'd be claw, Eagle Claw. There's one Eagle oh, Claw, sorry. there's the yep, one strap bomb, and then there's yeah, the so, one. Yeah, so three answers, yep. Um. Okay. Now then yeah. Now then it's yeah, way I, too I juicy. Yeah, you have to hit him with the strap bombing here. 
Yeah, you just push taking, up the red double. Throwing that, that bad boy down mm -hmm. with gusto. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely a really, really nice play. God, you on just guarding up, just trying to turtle, and there's the Pathfinders. Yeah, J King uh, is playing two copies of Blitzkrieg. Uh, some people have only been playing one recently, but the two copies means that J King can play pretty aggressively and try and set it up. At this point, the U.S. frontline machine has just gone too far. I, I yeah, know it, this is super bleak here. Even if God Yuan manages to monsoon supply shortage, J King just refills the board instantly. Taking the red devils not only is going to cost an extra credit to play. Um, Mr. Steria Girl, but uh, also, you know, J King's not really worried about that. I would almost consider uh, the other battalion. I, I can't remember their name because they're not played very often, but that one extra damage in the front line could maybe be sort of useful. Yeah, maybe. J King's never attacking those red devils, so like you're never really. I mean, maybe you get him to the front line and he has to go through them, but. Yeah, hard to say. Yeah, J King is just setting up this Blitzkrieg every turn. Making it so that God Yuan has to clear the front line every single turn. And those pings might have been nothing, you know? They might have done absolutely nothing, but now it certainly appears that if he would have taken the uh, other infantry unit, that he would have probably got two attacks off with it. So that would be two random damages into the front line. Which yeah. could, you know, set up some sort of trade that maybe, or even something where just the Sherman gets nicked enough that you can come down with Naval Brigade and get that, get that unit kill. Oh, man. I'm, I'm kind of surprised to only see one copy of Engineers. I feel like Engineers is like one of the best cards in Frontline, but. Preparing for rotation, perhaps. <laughs> weaning yourself off of it <laughs> yeah you gotta you gotta get you gotta kick the habit before <laughs> and there it is so many cards. the fabled blitzkrieg the problem is that none of your blitz units have five or more health and you don't really have a great way of getting rid of the naval brigade without double attacking. Yeah. Yeah, I imagine that's sort of what we'll see here. We have he does have pathfinders, right? So yeah, he'll probably you probably have the double can, attack, like, but he probably won't have to triple. Attack and then pathfinders and Yeah, and he'll actually maybe even Play the Blitzkrieg. No, I can't imagine we see Blitzkrieg. Uh, this yeah, this is this is lethal, through. right? Because you can double attack with the two pins of thirty-five T. Oh no, one damage off, right? After the after what? the two to, two to take out the guard and then twelve on the two thirty-five T's. No, yeah, he's got it. Oh, the health. I see. Yeah. I see. Yep. 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 But certainly a a a, a play that it's over, right? Like that one health. J King with Monsoon multiple, not supply shortage. Multiple blitzers in J King's hands. He's got surely two Surely J King Wurbles. doesn't have Surely J King doesn't have a blitz unit. <laughs> yeah, surely he doesn't have a Werble or the other Werble or the other Hellcat. Yeah, I mean you're supposed to save your blitz tanks for as long as possible because they're really strong late game. They allow you to make crazy blitzkrieg plays out of nowhere. So J King just doing the the solid frontline plays, keeping those those blitz tanks until the very end. Oh, okay. I like this play. Making it so that J King needs either two blitz tanks or like an engineer's and a blitz tank or the three health versus 
versus one health is a very big difference against frontline. But yep, shaking it won't will matter win when the, the first comes. match. Moving on to the semifinals, and next up, really we're nice going to have uh, kill switch and is it dandelion? That's right, kill switch versus dandelion is coming up next. I, I think Thanatron, you were going to go in and say that Guardian performed <clears throat> quite well in what might be their first clash playing against you know the de two-time defending world champion, but uh, I think that was that was a great showing on their part. Yeah, no, that was going to be my exact point. Was uh, it's definitely a first showing to be proud of, right? Uh, getting all the way through quals into the big show, uh, going immediately against Jaking. Not only like against Jaking in your first match, but literally the first match of the tournament, uh, and then uh, you know taking a game as well. So really excited to see uh, what they bring forth in the future. Uh, that's the kind of performance that shows that you're you're probably here to, to, to stay, right? Like you're probably, this probably isn't going to be your only time on the stage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and sorry, I wanted to ask you a question about this because I feel like obviously Guardian took the first match, got a bit of momentum, got into that second game, lost to Commonwealth, but I feel like without the Commonwealth in that game, I don't know if J-King would have been really able to pull that off. Yeah, I mean... A lot of times Mobilize isn't. Mobilize is really only good because it can rely on two different win conditions. It can create these super big Mobilize units, and it can create the uh, Commonwealth. But yeah, that's that's the strength of Mobilize. But I did want to say that um, Gaudiwan was in my group for uh, the 120 knockout stage of uh, World Championships, and we were the two people that um, passed from our group. So yeah, definitely a strong player. Um, very and strong player. Hopefully we'll see more of them in 2024. Let's go ahead and bring up the bracket and see where we are at thus far. Um, so we just watched J-King move through in a hard-fought battle. Uh, we see friend of the show, Bruno Burrito, defeating Chaos in one of our off-stream matches, also winning 2-1. to one. Ozzy still playing against Head to determine who will take on J-King. But uh, next up, we've got Dandelion going up against Killswitch. And uh, we're going to be uh, swapping out casters here. Starry's going to be doing double duty, but uh, welcome to the stage, Red Sun. How, uh, how excited are you to be a part of this, uh, this show today? Hello, guys. I'm super excited to be part of the show today. Um, it's been something that's been on my mind for quite a while now. I always wanted to try out casting. I was just like waiting for the right moment to do that, to give it a try. Oh, awesome. We're happy to have you. So let's uh, let's dive into our second feature quarterfinal here. Uh, we're going to go ahead and take a look at Dandelion up first, look at their player card, um, get a little bit of insight. So we do have Dandelion finishing second here, 356 matches, a 55% win rate. Um, Star, do you have any insight into who Dandelion is? Um, I do not recognize this name, uh, nor their player card. So uh, they might have been around before I started casting. I'm not really sure. But at least they ha I can say for certain that they haven't made any recent appearances at an OCC. However, to get to this level, you do have to be a strong player. And we see that they finished second at, in the last season, which is quite impressive. It takes a lot, of, a lot of work to get to second. And they did it in 356 matches, which is, uh, you know, not a ton it's not like they were sitting there grinding the whole time so they're definitely quite a talented player maybe a new player maybe a player that's recently been brought to the scene from mobile potentially <laughs> not sure but um yeah a strong newcomer and i hope that we will get a great opportunity to see how they perform to your point i mean finishing second no slouch whatsoever so let's go ahead and bring up their deck lineup and uh, sorry walk us through exactly what dandelion's got sorted out here yep so dandelion's first deck is a britain italy control list and we've seen this deck a couple of times we saw it um a couple of times in the last couple of events but they are playing one of my favorite cards pact of steel Normally you see Pact of Steel in these Russian decks with the KV1, making your opponent draw four cards, uh, hits them for eight damage. Uh, you don't get that <laughs> when you're playing Britain Main. You are playing Pact of Steel just because it's such a strong draw card. And in my own testing, that's what I found as well. Pact of Steel oftentimes says, like, draw three for me, draw one for my opponent, 
or draw four for me, draw one, uh, draw zero for my opponent, especially when you're playing a deck that has Churchill, Carpet Bombing, Wellington, Commonwealth, like so many high cost cards. Um, so really excited to see Pact of Steel, especially outside of Soviets. But other than that, pretty standard list. Uh, it has a lot of AOE, has a lot like um, two copies of Carpet Bombing, three copies of Supply Shortage, Monsoon Rot. Um, the next deck is a Soviet Italy list, which um, is pretty much the same as uh, J-King's list from uh, last game. In fact, it might even be the same list. Oh, nope, there, <laughs> there are some minor differences. Only playing two copies of Fiat, uh, playing Road to Berlin, which is definitely interesting, playing Yak7, which is a great value engine. I personally really like it in the deck. Um, still two copies of Five Year Plan. Um, but yep, this is just a little bit different than J King's list with some flex choices. And the last card, the last deck, of course, is the classic Japan Germany Jagro. However, this is not your grandma's Jagro list. This is playing two copies of Schutzen, two copies of Arado. And the Arado package is Enigma, two copies of Enigma, two copies of Honorable Death, and then, of course, Audacity and Bombing Raid. And um, no copies of Expansion, because usually when you're playing Arado and Enigma, you don't really feel like you need Expansion. Um, there's one copy of Sakura Regiment, which is a card that I haven't seen in a really, really long time. And because uh, Enigma works best when you don't have a lot of cards in hand. It is not particularly synergistic with 22nd Infantry Regiment, and so we only see one copy of 22nd Infantry Regiment. But yeah, this is this is a Jagger list for the ages. Definitely curious to see how this one works. Um, but yep. I uh, I will have to ask my grandma about her Jagger list, apparently, Starry, um, based on, on your statement about Dandelions. So I um, appreciate you walking us through those lists. Let's take a look on the other side of things at Killswitch. Um, here we've got Killswitch, who finished 26th, only played 85 games, rocking the shades, playing it cool this season, and working their way through the qualifier to go up against Dandelion. Uh, Red Sun, what do we know about Killswitch? Killswitch is no newcomer to the competitive scene. He's been making OCC appearances in the past. He's also been successful in other tournaments, uh, as far as I'm concerned. Um, now, looking at that win rate, uh, it is definitely impressive with so few games uh, finishing 26. Um, that is definitely something to be proud of. Absolutely phenomenal showing being able to do it in 85 games with a solid win rate. Let's bring up Killswitch's deck list. And uh, Redson, I'll ask you to walk us through what they got. So Killswitch's first deck list is classic Soviet Italy control. Um, a few things that I spotted that piqued my interest were the inclusion of double five-year plan, which um, can, which is extremely important to get you ahead in a draw and giving you more options. Two uh, copies of that card um, extend the consistency. This deck can be a super tough nut to crack, um, coming with lots of defensive tools such as uh, hammers, Petlikovs to deny your opponent's deployment effects. He's also running triple Fiat G50s, which um, is a plane that trades extremely nice into Jagro, often getting off two trades of that card. Um, and he's also including naval, naval engagement, which um, has been uh, seen in the past to completely turn games as it just wipes your opponent's backline. And um, yeah. So next up, we have Jagra, which um, <clears throat> seems like a pretty standard version of the deck. Um, Kills were just bringing Naval Supply Run, which is a board buff at the expense of a card, but it's often just enough to close out the game. He's also running double seven Schützen, which gives the deck more mid game punch. And he also includes Eagle Claws, which uh, is a reliable way to eliminate threats in the back line, such as the Aichi and um, Mada, for instance. 
last but not least, we have US Agro. Um, something that I noticed first was the absence of We Can Do It. He's going with a fast loadout, packing four copies of 164th Infantry Regiment and four Greyhounds. He's also running, a, again, a single copy of Eagle Claws to help combating threats in the back line, such as previously mentioned Aichis and Martyrs. Awesome. Thank you so much, Red Sun. So let's go ahead and take a look at the bands. Once again, this is a Conquest format. There's one band in the quarters, and the Sammy's players are going to have to win with their other two decks. Both players banning the Soviet Italy control list. And I think this is interesting. And I, I guess, Starry, I'll start with you about this. You know, we see the Jagros, we see the front lines, but Soviet Italy now has shown up in, I think, three of the four players' lineups. What's kind of made folks lean on this uh, control list in the current meta? It's really, really strong against a lot of the aggressive decks in the format. Um, I, When I brought it to World Championships, I think I maybe lost like one out of the eight games that I played with it, and Birdo lost zero out of the games that he played with it. Um, it has been banned every single time that it is brought today. <laughs> Jaking had a ban. Both of these players are having a ban. Uh, it's really, really good in this current meta because it just answers all of the relevant meta decks. In a, a space like Ladder, where you're going up against like lots of different stuff, it's not quite so strong. But in a format where you know kind of roughly the decks that your opponent is going to be bringing, it is so, so strong. And so Red Sun, is it just a scenario where, okay, it's a strong deck and also like if I'm Kill Switch, hey, I've got two more aggressive decks. I'm just not going to be able to get through a control list to win with my other two. I think Kill Switch is a very strong control player. as uh, shown in the past. And um, he's also, on top of that, he's also a strong aggro player. So I think um, we'll see how it plays out. Um, I haven't seen Dandelion play, but um, I think... Um, yeah, kill switch on control is definitely a force to be reckoned with. A smart move there, likely by Dandelion saying, "Hey, I don't want to, don't want to deal with that. Don't want to play against kill switch. Playing control." Um, Star, you walked us through Jagro, uh, Dandelion's Jagro list a little bit, and you know we're pointing out some of the specific kind of tweaks and changes to it. Any any thoughts around why that might be the case? What made Dandelion choose to like go and mess around a bit with what we see as a fairly standard tournament deck? Uh, I have absolutely no clue. I know that a lot of the Eastern players um, have really liked Honorable Death. Uh, I don't know where Danny Lion is from, but um, if he's taking inspiration from other Eastern players, then um, uh, the Honorable Death has been seeing a lot of play recently. Fair enough. Um... And now I'm looking at Dandelion's lineup and, you know, both players bring in Jagro. Killswitch, again, having the more aggressive lineup. Do you think Killswitch, um, Red Sun, has any concerns about going up against that Brit Italy control list as well? Figuring like, hey, Jagro versus Jagro is one thing, but going up against another control deck, I've got to fight through that. I've got to get either in quickly or dodge some of their um, some of their kind of answers. Yeah, I think what Killswitch is trying to do is like, probably the obvious here is trying to end the game before um, Dandelion can deploy his more powerful cards, um, trying to get a win before, I would say, turn six, um, to just dodge every like dangerous answer that uh, Dandelion might bring. And do you think that, you know, looking at Killswitch having the option of Jagro or Frontline, there's a specific matchup going to that control list that he would rather have? I believe he's going with uh, Frontline here. So you think he'll lead off with frontline and then try and just figuring Jagro's bound to get a good draw in the next two games. If you can win with the front line, you'll probably pull off the Jagro win. Mm -hmm. And it looks like you nailed it here as uh, Killswitch will be starting off with the frontline list and uh, Dandelion going with the Brit Italy control. So we'll see if that will be the case here in our second feature semifinal, quarterfinal. Sorry, getting ahead of myself. Yeah, I really like the inclusion of Air Landing Brigade. It's really underrated, um, but I think the card is really strong. Even if you're not combining it with any any other units, just having a two-cost 
three four with fury um that you know the three four is only for trading into units but um especially against a deck that relies on having the front line mm -hmm. yeah i think people are really sleeping on air landing brigade uh, we saw it played a little bit in brit air during the week <laughs> where we had <laughs> all the brit air cards and air landing brigade legal it was um, that one I know, week, yeah. I know J King was really, really a fan of Air Landing Brigade. And then since then, we just haven't seen a lot of decks that rely on units for Britain. And when you're not really relying on units, not a whole lot of point in playing Air Landing Brigade. Um, but yeah, Kill Switch does get mm. to have this super nice turn one, turn two. Um, it will. Um, it will be stopped by an air landing or a supply shortage, but you know, at least forcing your opponent to answer you is always good. And kill switch establishing the front line here. Mm hmm So I'm curious to see whether the air landing or the honey is gonna come out. But it seems like Danny Lion has decided that the honey is too important to spend right now. Better to wait for later when you can put it behind a guard mm -hmm. and just um If you were kill switch in this position, would you push up the Greyhound and try to um get a buff on the Greyhound through the uh, 164? Oh it's tough. Mm -hmm. On one hand you want to play around supply shortage, but on the other hand like getting an early damage is never bad. Mm, I don't know. I really don't. This is why they're playing and not me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, looks like kill switch is. He should be set for the Sherman next turn if he decides to play it. He could also go for the Enigma to draw. Looks like Come. Dandelion is considering just dropping Bologna. Yeah, it's probably the best play he has here. I mean, the cards yeah, are mean, a bit more expensive. The more unit he loses. Unless Killswitch has Blitzkrieg. I mean, and even if you do have Blitzkrieg, it, you can't trade one for one. So, yeah, no, this seems really nice out of Danny Lion. The only problem is that your opponent does get to... Um, play Sherman, whereas if you if you supply shortage and then trade your air landing into the Greyhound, then your opponent isn't able to Sherman next turn. Um, but Danny Lion deciding better to just get the Bologna down than try and prevent the Sherman draw. And there he's thinking about getting the Sherman online now. I wonder what's keeping him from playing the card. Do you think he's considering Fifth Ranger's front line? Just to secure and just Maybe. to prevent uh, Dandelion from getting the front line? Because kill if Killswitch ever loses the front line here, it's going to be extremely tough to get it back. Oh, yeah, for sure. Because... I mean, I still think that Sherman is probably the best play, just so that you can get it guaranteed that you get it out. But I don't know, maybe not. Fifth Rangers here. <laughs> decisions, decisions. Yeah, I mean, Please. supply shortage in Monty doesn't seem bad. Obviously, you Monty first to see what you find. I think you have to go for the supply yeah. shortage over the convoy. Like, if not, your opponent just has way too big of a front line. You gotta keep that front line in check unless you want to. Uh, yeah, and we see that Kill Switch is doing the same thing that J King is doing by playing Enigma. And on one hand, it seems really good in this matchup because your opponent is gonna have a huge hand the whole game, and you are not. 
But on the other hand, it isn't super synergistic with Sherman. So like sure, like either you play the Sherman and then burn your cards and then play Enigma, right. or play the Enigma but you have one less. You you draw yeah. one less card out of it because you're playing the Shermans. I agree. I don't know. Some, some situations can be kind of counterproductive. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about the Enigma. Clearly, you know, multiple competitive players are playing it. Um, definitely seems a little bit strange to me, but... Okay. So Dandelion here could just drop a Black Watch to... Or you could send the Fifth Rangers back into Killswitch's support line with the Wrath Lightning. True, true. I like that play. I really like that play too. Yeah, Killswitch is kind of struggling. It looked like they had a super established board, but Danny Lion was so efficient in the way that they removed everything. The thing with uh, playing against U.S. frontline, most of the time, no matter how hard you crush their frontline, they're always going to build back, and they're going to build back stronger. Um, okay. Hellcat frontline seems like a good play. I mean, but you could also... Hellcat, you can trade with the Hellcat plus the 164th. Yep. Getting rid of that card. And you even have the credits to dive bombing too. Sure. Yeah, this play looks really nice. One dead Bologna is a guard less to worry about. As soon as you get the as soon as you're able to uh, play the Blitzkrieg. Um, yeah, Bologna is such a strong card. Looks like it's gonna be soon. What an absolutely insane card. I mean, you gotta give Minor Nation something, right? You gotta yeah, have incentive yeah. to play them with their smaller card pool. So, if you had if you had Bologna in a Major Nation, it would be like instantly reworked. <laughs> <laughs> but with smaller nation, with the um the smaller card pool of Minor Nations, you can be a lot more. Uh, you can push design space a lot further, which is one of the reasons that I really enjoy Minor Nations, and I'm super excited to see Finland. So yeah, excited absolutely. to see another minor, minor. I mean, nation. some of the some of the Finnish cards that have, the cards that have been revealed so far look quite strong. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, really curious to see what we have later in store today. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if this is so so hard for kill switch, right? Because you need to get that PIR into the front line, but. To be able to draw. You're essentially just burning three credits here if you play the the 35T. So instead, Kill Switch is saying, "I'm just gonna play the the Sherman, and we can worry about getting the next Sherman next turn, and everything's gonna be fine." And there's the unless, ABRE. Yeah, unless, unless <laughs> my opponent plays AVRE. Now, looking at Dandelion's hand, he has plenty of answers to many different scenarios that Killswitch could. Uh... What do you What do you think is the most optimal play here? Is it just dropping the Aviary, or would you? Would you I kind of like dropping the Aviary, but I don't mind Sexton either. I don't, Sexton I mean, back further. This does allow. You can play Wurble and trade, push up PIR and play Sherman. Get the Sherman. Draw, but it yeah. does play a little bit into board wipes. It does you do overextend a little bit. But if your opponent doesn't board wipe you, you have a great mm. Blitzkrieg. Yeah. And I think Dandelion is aware of that. Um So I think he's probably going to drop the Blackwatch next turn unless he gets something better off his draw. Oh, interesting. Instead mm -hmm. trading out with the Sexton, I don't I don't mind that. I mean mm -hmm. you 
get to have your Sherman on a later turn to Blitzkrieg. And you're tall. You're you're reasonably tall. As in, um, your board is difficult to wipe, but presents value with just two units. You get to play a Sherman next turn, pretty much guaranteed, even if you're opponent carpet bombing. Uh, and yeah, no, I, I like this quite a bit. This is a very good play from Kill Switch. Dandelion debating whether you should send back the PIR. Yeah, I mean, or... it's Wait, tough. He's going for the draw first. Remember, guys, always draw first. <laughs> Something that I struggle to remember whenever I play on ladder. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we've had plenty of OCC games where players do not draw first. I remember um, some of those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You can trade out the Sherman with the Wrath Lightning and play another Sherman and push up PIR, or you could just attack the HQ. Personally, I Drawing like attacking first. the HQ. Um, so he's uh, Killswitch is holding on to that Verbal Wind, knowing that it's a very strong synergy with Blitzkrieg. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, now he's trying to reestablish the front line, at least from judging by the looks of it. Um, he could still trade away the Wrath Lightning, um, which uh, would lead to the destruction of this Sherman through uh, carpet bombing if uh, Dandelion decides to play it. I like this play from Kill Switch because if Dandelion carpet bombings plus trades with one of the Shermans. That leaves the other Sherman alive. And you wouldn't have had lethal with the Werbelwind plus the um plus the Sherman, but now you do. Like kill switch I'm assuming the kill switch realized probably the worst case scenario from Dandelion, which is um I mean, I guess Monsoon Rod Supply Shortage is even worse, but I'm just See, looking. Milan at... doesn't have the option to go for this carpet bombing and trade, or the game is going to be over. Oh. Um, so I'm just looking at Dandelion's hand, and he is prepared. He has four guards in hand. That mm -hmm. is. That just decides to push back and take the front line. This is going to be game lightning. for Kill Switch. Um, kill switch can trade the PIR with the 3-4, push up the um, push up Sherman. the two the Sherman and the Orbowind, and I think mm -hmm. you have exact credits for Blitzkrieg, or you might have one extra. I don't know. I was calculating it earlier, mm -hmm. but yeah, kill switch looks like he sees it. Sees it, yeah. Counting credits, making sure that everything is in order. It's 5 plus 6 damage, that's exactly 11, and it's sure. going to cost you 1, 2, 3, 4, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That's exact credits. Exact credits, exact damage. I could never pull that off. Like, calculating is not my strength. I'm glad he's <laughs> testing with you. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, dropping two of these uh, East uh, East Terry regiments would have probably been the better play. Well, it's always easy to say. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't know. I, like, Churchill hands. looks so safe. It looks so safe, especially if you push the the Wrath Lightning. It looks incredibly yeah. safe. But it's it's just not. It's frontline. <laughs> frontline yeah. is so good. <laughs> but that's also the thing. Like the, the, the safest play might always be the best play, right? Does Killswitch see it? I think he sees I it. I think he does. Yeah. He's calculating. I don't know what's going on with spectator mode right now. <laughs> okay. OK. 
Come on, kill switch. I believe. I believe that you can see it. Maybe he, he saw it already and he's just teasing us <laughs> to create the suspense, you know? It's three credits to push up an attack with the Sherman. Three credits to push up the Whirlwind. Three credits to play Blitzkrieg and one credit to play to trade with the PIR. That's exactly ten. Oh, and oh. it looks like we may or may not be having some technical difficulties. That's always sometimes the challenge with uh, technology and jamming people together from across the globe while we peek in and see what's yeah. going on. But uh, I feel like based on the cards that Kill Switch had hovering, uh, probably had that lethal figured out. Yeah, I hope yeah. so. Uh, yeah. It... Yeah. It I'm looks 99. like that'll nine percent certain yeah. that be... Kill Switch figured it out. It would be extremely surprising. <laughs> if somehow Dandelion not only... If somehow Killswitch didn't see lethal and then Dandelion won almost immediately afterwards from being at like 11 life, mm, I, I, <laughs> I really don't think that happened. I mean, but, but miracles happen ever so often, you know? Like, maybe... Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's theoretically possible, <laughs> which is why we do need to verify and make sure that Kill Switch did win that first game. I do feel though that ordinarily Dandelion would be very well equipped to handle this Jagger deck from Kill Switch, but Dandelion getting stuck with a line for a day and two convoys is just a huge tempo loss, even if you get a lot of value out of it. Um yeah, and Wellington Probably. isn't really what you want to see either. At least you're getting the draw off the honey. Mm -hmm. You're getting the, the life gain off the honey. That is super nice. Or you could alternatively go for attack in the colonies on the IG, but that also seems pretty nice. Personally, I like drawing and then just trading the honey into the... I do too, yeah. yeah. Attacking the colonies is more versatile, <clears throat> and playing convoy when you're not getting the draw off. Oh, and nice. That's a huge supply shortage draw. I mean, ideally, you always want to get the convoys out as long as you have the honeys on board. I'd like to see, yeah. like, Signal, Yokosuka, kill the honey. What do you think, Mr. Diagro player? <laughs> yeah, I think that's, um, yeah, I think that's the best play that Kill Switch has available here. That, or you could or you could he, even play the type over the Yokosuka. Or he could also agree to play Naichi and go face with the other one. <laughs> That seems so bad when your opponent has honey down. I know. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I ever done that before. It's just. Uh... Yeah, you would. You would never miss. I would never. Deck. No, yeah, would never yeah. Play. I'm also never greedy. Um, nah. And there is the second supply shortage. Yeah, this this signal is such a nuisance for Dandelion. Although you can go supply shortage and then mosquito next turn. That is an option. I mean to those who are thinking, yeah, it's just one damage, but that damage stacks up and as long as the signal is on board and whenever you kill something, it can add up to a uh, yeah, a scary number, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. So this issue has to be addressed somehow. I really, you know, um, I'm definitely, uh, I'm not rooting for either player, but I would kind of like to see Dandelion's Jagger list in action. Um, so uh, I, I kind of would like to see uh, a game to, three happen. Yeah, yeah. A game three happen. <laughs> It'd also be interesting to see a Jagro mirror match in game three and see like whose Jagro list is better. <laughs> There's only one right Once answer. And it's 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 Christo's grandma's Jagro list. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. 
personally, I don't like Aichi's at all when going up against Brits, knowing that you're not going to see the second Aichi spawning off the first one if they play Supply Shortage. Yeah. Um, that um, Schutzen. The Schutzen is uh, really annoying for Dandelion. Yeah. It needs to. It has to eat a lion for a day. But, oh, there's what you really want to be lion for a day. Oh. That's what you want to save your lions for, or the K83s, but. Dandelions, they just got worse. Oh. That feels Did so you? bad to to see your opponent top deck the K83 right after eating a lion for a day. It's always so bad. You remove a big unit and you feel this, like, relief until the K83 hits the board and then. Yeah, it sends you back down. Um, yeah. A guard that could help preventing the K83. You could supply anything. shortage and Wellington the uh, K83. Yeah, that is true. But yeah, I mean, Dan Danny Lion is getting draw off of this and. If you can safely use your opponent's key to get draw, pretty good. Especially when you're feeling a little bit behind. He could also just like fill the front line for now. Oh no, never mind. Um I just realized though there's a carpet bombing. Lurking in uh, Dandelion's hand. Yeah, and Dandelion's <laughs> also playing three supply shortages, so you yeah, do gotta be careful true. when you're kill switch to not overextend. But at the same time, you do have to present enough units that you're a threat, because if you're not threatening your opponent's HQ, then but not too that's many a whole to different all. issue. Yeah, it's it's difficult. It's difficult mm -hmm. to. To not play into supply shortage too much, but also play enough units where you actually force your opponent to do something. And at the competitive level, like uh, when we look at players who are really talented at playing Jagro, that's like one of the biggest um, skills that you have to learn as a Jagro player. Is... Estimating when to commit and when to hold back for the right moment. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, I know a lot of players that play Jagro think that um, supply shortage just completely wipes their deck. And yet, we see at the competitive level that these decks that are playing supply shortage aren't, you know, demolishing Jagro. So. Because uh, usually at this level, the Jagro player knows yep. how to use his resources efficiently against those uh, decks running supply shortage. Yep. Hmm. Yeah, so kill switch is kind of down to their last big burst, and Danny Lion has the carpet bombing. Like, Killswitch only has two more units, and uh, if if Danny Lion just plays Carpet Bombing, they all get eaten, and we're seeing the weakness in Eagle Claws and Naval Supply Run. If you don't um, have any units, Naval Supply Run doesn't do much, and if your opponent doesn't have any units, then Eagle Claws doesn't do much. <laughs> so, Eagle Claws on one hand... Seem... Doesn't seem yeah, all too good in this matchup. Um, definitely not in this yeah. matchup. It's definitely meant for the matchups like Frontline and Jagro, where you're getting rid of those Martyrs, those IGs. Exactly, where you see a lot of units. Um... Okay, Dandelion debating whether you should kill the Whirlwind with the Yeah, Dandelion is down to only 9 health. Which is a bit, you know, scary, but on the other hand, they have the fortification in hand, and they have 
pretty much everything you could ever want to stop your phone's advances. So mm -hmm. uh, Dandelion is reaching the point in the game where things are going to start to turn around really quick. It's worth noting that Killswitch is not playing Sheedon, which means that they're going to have to find some other way to get that last 8 damage in, or 7 damage in. You can get 3 of it with Bombing Raid, but that still means that you need to find 4 more. It is always when you see, uh, when you play against um, somebody playing a British deck and they're floating 3 credits, that's a huge red flag most of the time. So Killswitch knows that. He dodges the ultra by playing a uh, surprise attack, <clears throat> which now enables him to play bombing right, getting rid of those two units sitting in Dandelion's back line. Yeah, the only problem with this is you are one off <clears throat> from presenting lethal. <sighs> I might go out on a limb here, but I think that 15th cap is not going to make it. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, Dandelion has all the resources. At this point, you could even start considering just playing Commonwealth just for the value. Hmm. Let me check Killswitch list real quick. He is not running Enigma. Which would have been ideal in this situation. Empty your hand, then get a quick hand refill. Draw five cards. Or four, depending yeah. on whether you want to um, drop the supplier. Uh, enable supplier. Which I think you would, I mean, if you did. But yeah. it's all very hypothetical and not particularly relevant <laughs> as he doesn't have the Enigma. Oh, no, it would have been yeah, I mean... less card anyways, because you get the... You get the uh, surprise attack from the Type 94 TK. So I completely forgot about that. Yeah, looks like we are going to get to see our game three. Judging by the looks of it. It's uh, quite interesting, making sure Any... that the honey can't, can't uh, get into the front line, but. If you're kill switch, yeah. you cannot be happy about no. seeing that sincerely your stop deck. And that black watch coming down could be the nail in the coffin for kill switch here. There's very little things that kill switch could hope for that could impact the game in such a way where he could turn the tides. Um, Yeah. Dandelion has just Dandelion too many has all the value. Is all the answers. And well, Pact of Steel against Jagro is essentially just draw four. Yeah. Yeah, but it is gonna take a while for Dandelion to get that that final blow as Killswitch is sitting at a comfortable 20 health and um, that Commonwealth is pretty far off from being playable. The problem but... is that Killswitch really doesn't have any way to get back into the game. I mean, if that honey moves into the front line, he can just um, knock it Trade out. Trade it off, the... yep. Exactly. Yeah. <sighs> Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to be enough, really. What Killswitch needs is to chain together some expansions, but with the honey being pushed up and the Black Watch coming down, I don't really think that that's going to be possible. Have we seen Killswitch playing any expansions so far? No, and he plays four copies. Hmm. That is really unfortunate. Yep. So it looks like Killswitch is probably just going to trade off here by playing the type, playing the Yokozuka next to it, getting the buff. It'll be a 3-1. 
Um, I feel like you can't really keep the honey around, but nah. I guess you do lose two units. You're getting it bombed by the Wellington, so I don't know. Maybe there is some debate to be had over whether or not it's right to play it. But if you don't trade with the honey, like, what do you do? Like, you're kind of just, like, sitting around accepting defeat. Yeah, you have to do something. Yeah, hope that all of your opponent's cards are completely irrelevant. Which they're not. <laughs> they're not. They're definitely not. No. They're probably seven of the most relevant cards that you could have. But... Yeah, I've never seen... Um, Speaking you know, of relevant cards... <laughs> you know, some people say like they have so many questions. Here's the opposite, where Dandelion has so many answers to basically everything that Killswift can do here. Yeah. Yeah, Killswitch. uh... Killswitch not getting any expansions is really sad to see. Yeah, the game is functionally over, but Danny Lane doesn't have a way to close it out. And he's still quite far away from playing that Commonwealth. There's the Martyr, which isn't particularly helpful in this situation. Not at all. Um, Danny Lion's missing two damage, and we're gonna and, see a uh... game three Jagro Mirror match. <laughs> we're gonna see if the Sakura Regiment is all that Danny Lion thinks it is. <laughs> we'll find out. We've seen it in the past. I mean, it used to be played as a one, one or two of in really old Jagro lists, long, long time ago. Yeah. But uh, we haven't seen it in. A hot, hot second. Looks like it's back from the bench. Yeah. Yeah, um, maybe maybe post-rotation we might be seeing more of it, given that um, Jagro is losing out on uh, Bicycle. Maybe Sakura And Mardas and Rebel. <laughs> I'm, yeah, I'm... I mean... Uh, Jagro is going to need to find some things to replace what they're losing, for sure. So yeah, we could see the return of Sakura Regiment. Okay, Kill Switch has already made his decision to keep Bicycle Regiment, Type 94 TK, and a Panzer 35T. Yeah, Dandelion nice. has two one-drop infantry, a 35T and a Martyr, which is really nice. And it looks like Kill Switch is holding it back. And what this does is it forces Dandelion to play a 2-1 infantry, uh, because Kill Switch has the 35T. And if... Kill switch plays the Yokosuka, it's just gonna get or sorry, if Dandelion plays the Yokosuka, it's just gonna be, get treated out by Kill Switch's 35T. So um, this is like crucial in the in the Jagger mirror. You don't want to give your opponent any opportunity to get value trades. Yep. Two for one trades is a really bad thing in that matchup. Yeah, so Kill Switch here is now faced with a dilemma. You can play the type. And try and get a value trade with the 2 1 15th cavalry, but then if your opponent has 35t, mm -hmm. then they're gonna get the value trade, so you're almost forced to trade your 35t into their 15th cavalry. It's very, it's very tough, it's very mm -hmm. tough to play these Jagger mirrors, especially when both players start with like the most conservative start, which almost telegraphs yeah. that both players have 35t in the history of OCC. Yeah, both players have more or less given away that they have 35T. Or at least are bluffing that they have 35T at a, at a bare mm -hmm. minimum. Yeah, when, when both players start really strong, that's, that's what happens. And as the game progresses, if Killswitch can't manage to get some of these early game value trades, um, then as the game progresses, Danny Lyons increased uh you know you're starting with two cards more than kill switches so 
Um, he definitely has the hand advantage going for him. Yeah, um, if. Yep. If Kill Switch does not manage to get some value trades, then Danny Lion is definitely going to be in a favorable position, especially when you, you're able to drop Martyr turn three, which I guess Kill Switch is also able to drop Martyr turn three. But. Um... The question is, Killswitch you... doesn't have any blitz units really yeah. to like trade out with it. So you drop the martyr, but where do you go from there? That's, exactly, yeah. it's kind of a waste of a martyr. But on the other hand, you don't have anything better to do, so why not? True. You know. True. And there's the first Arado. <laughs> so Arado has six options to get: two copies of Enigma, two copies of Honorable Death, Audacity, and Bombing Raid. Now, Honorable Death would actually be pretty good here. Um, not super great, but you do kind of need to get rid of this Martyr before it starts going crazy. I mean, it gives but... a card, but you don't have to sacrifice any of your own units, which... Um... Yeah. Unfortunately, the other four cards that you can get off Arado are pretty garbage in this position. I mean, mm. they're obviously wonderful cards, but in this <laughs> position, kind of garbage. So... Um, definitely not worth taking the one and three here. That's just way too greedy. You ever just drop the KID three here? Oh, I don't know. Do you? It's... No, you can. You could, I mean, you could trade into. I would the probably type trade 93. with the yeah. Type 93. Start with that, see if you get a one drop Blitz Infantry. <clears throat> and if you do, then you can play it and play expansion. This way you can play Type. And next turn you can expansion and. Mod is just such a threat. So this gives uh, Dandelion the opportunity to drop the Arado. Or alternatively, you could drop the Raiding Brigade, get rid of the Type 94, and trade into the Mod. Yeah. And here's a here's why troll. we play Eagle Claws. That is huge why troll. we play Eagle Claws <laughs> is to get rid of those martyrs. Yeah. That is a prime example why this card is so good in this matchup. And getting the you get your expansion off, which is huge. Whenever you get the opportunity to get your expansions off no in a Jagro mirror. Really nice. The only thing that's missing here in the picture is that Aichi and Dandelion's backline. Uh, yeah, it's it's really cool to see how in Jagromir's, um, the game plan of smacking down your opponent's HQ is completely avoided. Both players are at twenty HQ defense. It's turn five. Don't don't even worry about attacking the HQ. No. Nah. Um. In these dagger mirrors, what is crucial is getting the value advantage over your opponent, because once you have the value advantage, then you can worry about start starting to smack down their HQ. I mean, dagger variants run about the same amount of units, so there is no, I have more units in my deck. Um, okay, he's getting the 22nd infantry, which... Um, he can use later down the road to get more draw. If you slap it, then it's one guaranteed draw most of the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Dina is such a good card in the mirrors. It usually gets to trade into two things while drawing you two cards. Huge value, mm -hmm. absolutely insane. And there's Killswitch's second Martyr. But given that uh, I don't know, you, you could play Martyr here, but I don't think you really need to. I think it's better to just 
play like maybe g83 and 22nd or type and i don't know it's kind of tough on one hand you really want to make sure that that dina doesn't value trade but on the other hand you can't yeah. not unless you're willing to sacrifice your two uh your two types and at that point that they they got yeah. the value trade and didn't even have to spend credits on it so yeah. they got it for free yeah, you can protect your 22nd, but you're not going to draw off of it, and then it's going to get traded out with a Type 94, and... Oh, man. Yeah. That Dina is so strong. Dropping the Mago. Okay. Interesting, okay. interesting. He's starting to dish out face damage. I'm surprised to not see the trade outs there, but... Um... Maybe Killswitch has decided that he is not going to have an easy time recouping the value, and it's better to just try and rush the opponent's face. Or, But without Sheedon, that seems like a pretty questionable game plan. I don't know. I, I'm not really sure what Killswitch is doing here. He still has the seven shoots in hand, which can deal with almost anything. Any single target that sits in the True. front line or that will be sitting in the front line a couple of turns ahead, maybe. Um, the only thing Killswitch should be worried about at the moment is that KI-83 sitting in the in Dandelion's hand. Because um, by the looks of it, he does not have a way of dealing with it at the moment at least. Wow. Dandelion mm. just gave Kill Switch like three draws off the martyr. <laughs> I do not know about that play. I really do not know about that one. I mean it is Kill Switch's last martyr, yes, whereas Dandelion has one more. And Dandelion has Enigma. And, and that is that is something. That is definitely something. And looking but, at Killswitch's hand, that's like all the draw he's been missing the last game. <laughs> but Killswitch is going to be playing like five cards here. Yeah. Establishing a huge board, establishing Signal. And that Enigma is not going to be looking as hot as it is right this second. Mm -hmm. It's definitely not going to be some Enigma for eight or something like that. So we'll see. We'll see how this works. I'm really surprised. Schutz in here? Yeah, is that? What? Maybe he wants to draw the attention off the signal, forcing Dandelion to play those two um, surprise attacks on the Schutzen, but he has answers for both. Drawing yeah, the honorable death, death on the here. signal is um, really nice. And these honorable deaths combined with the Enigma, you know, you can see why they're played together. Yeah. <clears throat> they synergize so well. And I mean, if you're really desperate for draw, you can also play it on your own units. Um... True. I feel like you want to get an Enigma off here. Draw. How much would that be? Draw three? I think, yeah. Is he okay? He's playing both surprise attacks, getting rid of the seven shits in here. Yeah, this plays a little bit into a Shinano, which is, um, you know, something to watch out for. Is Killswitch playing Shinano? Let me check. Uh, no, quick. no, Killswitch isn't playing Shinano, so not something that Dandelion has to worry about. And I don't think Dandelion's mm -hmm. playing Shinano either. Do you think Shinano has fallen out of favor? Because uh, personally, I see it a lot on ladder still. I I mean, I still play it, but mm -hmm. yeah, it definitely has fallen out of favor. Much um, like the Sheedon. Yeah, Sheedon. I, I mean, I don't know. We've seen some people play Sheedon, some people not. I do think Sheedon is more popular than Shinano, though. Yeah, but it's, again, it's far from like what it used to be, being a state. Yeah, for it. sure. Well, even back in the day, there was always debate about whether Hien was better. 
Yeah. I always prefer to stay out of that debate. <laughs> <laughs> Oh. Mm. Yeah, do you get the... Do you really want to let that Dina live there? Okay, he's pinning Dina. Yeah, which just... Um, it's pretty likely that Dandelion has an Enigma at this point. And so I do think that Kill Switch is cognizant of that and just getting rid of cards in hand to make sure that Enigma isn't quite so crazy. Oh, he can answer that with a... IG, yep. You can play IG, make the other IG go to 5 attack and trade out with mm -hmm. the key. It's and like a puzzle. it looks like that's what he's going to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, these Jagger mirrors are tough. They often go really long, and just making slightly better plays than your opponent over and over and over and over again, playing around your mm -hmm. opponent's outs, like, yeah, it's tough. Um, I'm not sure if you played Jagro in the World Championship Qualifiers, but... I was... There was a lot of Jagger mirror matches in the World <laughs> Championship <laughs> yeah, World I that. <laughs> and I also... just playing slightly better than your opponent was the name of the game, making the game go really long and just well, trying to slightly outvalue your opponent. That and um, I think who's going first also plays kind of plays into that. Um, if you're a little struggling bit. with regaining the front line, that's yeah. I don't think first versus second is that big of a deal in Jagro mirrors, but in frontline mirrors, I would say that it's a huge deal. If your opponent goes like turn one red devils, turn two, 35T, turn three, push up, play 99th, like, yeah. <laughs> okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> oh, that's a nightmare. Yeah. Now, do you play that Thanks for the game, I guess. Game? Or do you save the Sendai? I don't know. Seven I mean, it's not slow. like there's that many targets to hit with Sendai. And the key is gone. Like, that's one of the most common targets. Uh -huh. um, but on the other hand, if it comes back, then it gets to trade with another thing, dealing another three damage. So I don't know. It's, I think, a question of... Yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't mind seeing Dandelion uh, at some point, like, uh, use the Vomit Raid to kill the Sendai and then trade out with the front line. But at the same time, if you don't answer this Aichi and Ki, like, yesterday, it's a problem. Yeah. yeah. So I think it, I don't know, it might make more sense to. The rope's burning already. So. Yeah. Maybe the bombing raid mm -hmm. on the on the key, and then trade the fifteenth with the rating and the thirty-five T with the key. Okay. Yep. Looks like that's what's gonna happen. But yeah, now just... Dandelion's down to nothing. Kill switch is gonna dump their hand. Enigma's going to do nothing, so yeah. I, I, this does really feel like a last-ditch effort on Dandelion's part. Yeah, it's not looking too hard for Dandelion here. Yeah, so no matter I mean, what your you... opponent does not play Shinano, like, no reason not to dump your hand. There's nothing really you're trying to play around. And now there's also the issue of, like, no matter what you draw, uh, as uh, as dandelion, um, it's gonna fall victim to the seven shoots, and which then gets veteran deals three damage to. Yeah, this HP. game is looking pretty over. Just because dandelion, yeah, doesn't really have any comeback tools, mm -hmm. um, so 
I mean, the Enigma is obviously a comeback tool, but not in this, not in this Only position. Only if your opponent has the hand for that. Sendai will buy a turn, but you need more than a turn here. You could play Sendai Naval Supply Run Enigma, but you're going to discard one of your two cards next turn. <laughs> there it is! <laughs> There's the legendary Sakura Regiment. Okay, I want to take a bet. I, I, I think um, Naval Supply Run is going to discard it, and we're not going to get I, it. I agree. I yeah, think yeah, that Sakura that's... Regiment is not long for That's this just world. a tease. That's just a tease. There it is. We saw it, but it's going to leave Dandelion. Oh, down. we're not even going to oh. get to see. Oh. <laughs> All right, and Kill Switch moves on to the uh, quarterfinals, taking on, or sorry, semifinals, taking on Birdo Burrito next. That was that was a heck of a series, and I have to say, and and Redson, maybe you can elaborate on it. It felt like Kill Switch played that third game just just masterfully. We talked about how, you know, uh, Jagro goes hard to face, except in the mirror matchup where they slow down and play out smart moves and value trades, and I I think. Killswitch did a phenomenal job of that in the last matchup there. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Um, Killswitch is known as a player who is like, um, no matter what deck he's on, he's always meticulously planning each and every single move. Um, as seen in the past two matches, or three matches, I should say. Um, and he's taking his time. He's calculating each and every possibility. Um, and yeah, most of the time it works out. That's what makes Killswitch such a successful player. And now, Starry, you wanted to know which Jagro deck reigns supreme. Um, we saw that Kill Switch's list maybe eked out. Um, um, oh my gosh, why am I blanking? Dandelions. <laughs> um, and uh, and and you know, we we just had Red Sun kind of break down that Kill Switch is obviously a phenomenal player. Do you think it comes down in this scenario to hey, maybe the deck was just you know tweaked better for this matchup, or do you think it really comes down to the player? Um. A bit of both. I think that Killswitch is a really, really strong player. Um, and the Enigmas, we saw them just, they weren't effective. The Enigmas weren't as effective as Dandelion wanted them to be. They can be really good in some matchups. They can be really strong against control. But in these Jagger Mirrors, if you make your opponent draw cards, give them these Martyr draws, the next turn they're just going to dump their hand. Like, you're not actually going to get an opportunity to get some huge Enigma play. And we literally saw exactly that in this last game where uh, Dandelion gave Killswitch, I don't know, like three or four draws um, with Martyr. And then just, even though Killswitch played it a bit slower than some might have, Dandelion still couldn't really get the Enigma for more than two or three cards. It's just felt like a worse expansion that game. But that's what happens in those mirror matchups. Um, let's go ahead and take a quick peek at the bracket to see where we're at. But uh, stay tuned because we have a card reveal for you coming up in just a moment. So there you go. Head defeating Ozzy going up against J King in our first semifinal. Second semifinal also set. We just watched Kill Switch defeat Dandelion. And we're going to have Birdo Burrito taken on Kill Switch in that second semi after defeating Chaos 2 to 1. But. Uh, before we jump into a quick break here, let's uh, let's take a peek at uh, at another spoiler, another card reveal here for uh, Winter War releasing on November 29th. What do we got, Mark? A British card, entrenched, a two cost standard order. Give a friendly guard unit plus three attack. Fury and Salvage. <laughs> that is hefty. I mean, yeah. For only we... two credits, you can give one of your guard units plus three attack and then salvage two of your opponent's units, attacking into two of your opponent's units. And as we all know, the British are no short of guards. So. Uh... Yeah. Um, and especially given that the British. Um, as we saw yesterday, um, the British bombers are kind of being encouraged, which means that guards are going to synergize well with bombers. They always have, protecting your big bombers. Um, yeah, so I think guards are going to potentially be relevant, and having the ability to take out two of your opponent's frontline units. And getting um, them to your hand. as And then uh, adding salvage. copies of them to your hand through salvage. Yeah, uh, very interesting card. 
definitely feels like they're leaning heavily on, like you were saying, the guard aspect and then the bomber aspect as well, because they do synergize together. You do need to put up a little bit of protection for your your poor lowly bombers who can get picked off otherwise. So uh, really, really curious to see how this all shapes up as we get closer and closer to the release of Winter War. We're going to dive into a quick break and come back with the semifinals.
Welcome back, everybody, to the November OCC Clash. Before we get into things, um, it seems, well, obviously, Birdo is, is playing in this event. Um, Spooz seems to be hanging out on a farm somewhere, and I just have to assume the boxes and boxes of hats have tumbled upon bubbles, which is why he could not be here today. But uh, with that, I get to welcome uh, OH Corn Guy. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. I ran a 5k this morning and I'm ready to see some exciting cards. Stop showing off. Stop it. <laughs> Doesn't make me feel very good about myself, but thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, happy to have you here. Uh, let's, uh, let's get a quick peek of the bracket to show you exactly what we're going to uh, take a look at up here next. We've got our first semifinal on the docket. We got J King taking on head. Uh, we did not see head defeat Ozzy. That was an off stream match, but we did see J King take on Godion in our first feature quarterfinal, winning two to one. So uh, we'll get in here. We'll take another peek at J King's decklist, and then we'll go over to uh, to head side of things. Uh, two players that uh, you know we uh, we saw in the World Championships last year. We've seen them over and over again. So no strangers. Let's uh, let's dive right into it then. Let's get back into uh, J King's list and take a quick peek over at that. Uh, Thanatron, why don't you uh, take us through J King's list one more time? All right, so we start with the uh, Soviet Italy that we have seen a ton throughout, like what has currently settled into what we would maybe call a meta, a deck that uh, had a big place in world championships in both like groups and knockout stage. Uh, so we've already seen it played a little bit today, a lot of removal, a lot of straight targeted removal with those lines uh, that are able to take out just big single units. And then uh, that big naval engagement can wipe out your entire back line. Uh, it's definitely one of the strongest controls that we have right now. Uh, and then we have a pretty standard US front line or at what has become maybe more of a newer standard uh, as we see things like Enigma that weren't necessarily played uh, in the deck before and Eagle Claws again replacing the Stars and Stripes for that cheaper uh, burst of damage. A um, lot of uh, same cards uh, as US Frontline. Otherwise, you know, obviously you're still depending on your combat engineers to get your Frontline buffs. You're still depending on holding that Frontline, still depending on that Sherman, those half-tracks. For your bounce uh, and then his third deck uh we see again is uh mobilize as we saw in the first game in j king's win uh, we saw this deck lose and we saw this deck win and we saw the difference between that loss and that win was those potezes uh very integral to the deck when they are buried uh and mobilize starts really slow it can have trouble uh when they come out sort of maybe the first one on turn six and then maybe the next one sort of around turn 12 then the next one after that in the late game uh, they enable the commonwealth they enable your draw they enable your survivability uh, so super super integral to that deck and j king definitely has a ton of experience uh with spacing that out and you'll basically never see him commit to anything too early Right on. Thank you so much, Thanatron. Let's go over and take a peek at the uh, the other side of things here. We have had, didn't see the player card the first time around, so let's take a look here. Um, that is just wacky. 1,133 total matches, uh, finishing fifth here. So that is uh, that is huge. We've seen head multiple times before, and uh, we have heard the uh, endless amount of head to head puns that we will typically see when head is playing. So let's dive into their deck list. Corn guy, walk us through what head is bringing to this first semifinal. Um, so starting off, we have the Soviet France lineup. Uh, it's a it's a strong combination, you know, as opposed to the Italy ally. He's definitely looking to take advantage of giving his units mobilized with the Rimas and outvalue his opponents, you know, with the strong Soviet elites that he can use and take anything out with the defend in depths. Um, definitely a strong option, and it'll be, you know, fun to see a Soviet versus Soviet match if they uh, those decks fall through the ban phase. Um, moving over to the Jagro list, um, I would like to highlight he does have one Eagle Clause in Jagro. Uh, that card is free in the shop right now, so you can pick that up and play Jagro like head. Um, 
everything else in that looks pretty standard. There's no Enigma, we're only relying on expansions. Um, pretty standard Jagrail list. And then he's also bringing the the recently popularized German Japan list, which which uses the Arados to tutor the Southern plans and try to out tempo the opponent with credit denial. Um, and just has a lot of other unit based draw mechanics. So uh, definitely a strong lineup, um, pretty meta, uh, no no front line. Uh, but I do think that all of these decks can beat uh, front line, so I don't think this that he will be banning J King's front line. Awesome breakdown there, Corn Guy. Let's go ahead and take a look at the bands and see what is going to make it through. Shocker, Soviet is getting banned one more time. Um, so we have yet to see a Soviet list make it through the ban phase in our first three matchups here. Um, let's let's start with you, Thanatron. I mean, is it just a question of, I don't want to deal with control, or this is just a really versatile deck that can probably shut down sort of anything it goes up against? I think probably a lot of column A and column B there. Uh, like, it has the early tools neither of these players are bringing jagro but like in the perspective of trying to play something hyper aggro like jagro you've got briansk and ways to deal with that ways to slow them down uh ways to heal especially if you can get out to your alpini guards uh and then on the other hand with the french side the soviet france kind of the same thing uh rima big guards uh kind of able to play the same way still have your brand still have those early tools and then both decks have uh, good control tools for the late game as well. So we kind of talked about before this game that we expected both players to ban Soviet. Uh, so pretty, pretty non-surprised. And OH, does the same thing apply to the Soviet France list that Head is bringing, or is it a little bit of a different mentality here that J King decided to uh, go ahead and ban the deck? Uh, he def he's bringing Frontline, which relies heavily on deployment effects and seeing you know, having a Petal Yakov on board and just being stymied by that is one of the most frustrating things to deal with. So why not just get rid of it in the ban phase and not have to deal with that scenario? So that is, uh, that's going to be the case. We're not going to see any Soviet in this semifinal. Um, we have seen, you know, a lot of that Germany mid-range list that has popped up in the last few events uh, seems to be a little bit of it here, or a little bit less of it here today. Um, Thanatron, any insights into, you know, it kind of quickly rose in popularity and then quickly kind of seems to have fallen off the map a little bit this week, but uh, any any thoughts behind that? So I think that the a large part of the list, right, was to, it, it's mid-range, so it kind of can function both ways. Uh, it can have good games against Jagger and Frontline, and then it can sort of uh, survive against Control. But I think uh, it's sort of at the mercy of what other people are playing. Uh, like you kind of indicated, it was sort of like a counter deck. So when, uh, you know, the thing that it's built to counter isn't uh, so uh, ubiquitous, it's not so everywhere, then like, uh, it's not so much of a problem, right? So, uh, you know, when you when you bring that deck, you're expecting to see certain things to combat with it. So if you're not expecting to see those things, then you're probably not going to bring it. Fair enough. And, uh, and Corn Guy, if we're talking about head specific lists, got the credit denial piece with Southern Plans, we've also seen the list in a different kind of shape where they would play a little bit more air. Um, you know, you saw superiorities, you saw things like that in there. Is there a reason why head would lean more towards the credit denial aspect uh, for today's event? Sure, it can definitely snowball. You're guaranteeing that you are going to get a credit denial order whether Southern Plan or Admiral Hipper, uh, with an Arado draw. So, you know, you can play around that. And I know that J King right now is just hoping that he does not get high rolled and end up in a scenario where he's staring down a seven credit head with only three credits himself. We've also seen it go the other way, right? Where if you don't end up with your credit denial pieces, you're kind of just behind and in a crummy spot. Is there, do you see much of kind of a, a comeback mechanic in that scenario where if you're in a situation that you don't draw those cards, you don't draw them till they're essentially meaningless down the line. Like, how do you, how do you get ahead there? How do you combat that? You can use, uh, should send, you can draw with the martyr. There's definitely ways to maintain 
the the control of the game without you know hitting the tempo play with the southern plans um but i think the southern plan is not more of a risk reward high roll it's more of a a icing on the cake Uh, this deck can definitely hold its own um and it's something that you definitely want to you know try out to figure that out it can it can beat frontline it can beat jagro and that's what it has to do uh today well you know and mobilize but so we'll, uh, we're just waiting for the players to get into it here. As we start to look at the matchups, um, and I'll swing back over to you, Thanatron. You know, J-King's got the frontline list. We, uh, we I think, in the first round called it J-King's signature deck. He brings it pretty much every event, does consistently well with it. We saw the mobilize list be a little bit fragile. You mentioned the Potez, when it sticks around, great. When it doesn't, a bit challenging. Uh, J-King had a bit of an issue trying to... I guess, win the first game with that mobilized list, and then Commonwealth went ahead and, and kind of blew the doors off that second time around. What's Jaking looking for in the matchup against Mobilize? You know, the Jagro list can push really fast, can do damage, but can't really heal. So if you're able to stabilize there, I feel like Commonwealth could be a good option. That Germany mid-range deck has a lot of different tools. Is there something Jaking's looking for to make sure that Mobilize deck moves through comfortably? Honestly, I am not super familiar with the matchup of Mobilize into the German midrange. Uh, those two decks have had, uh, right, like very different histories. Mobilize starts out, uh, is a keyword uh, early on. Uh, the deck kind of has like a long life with a lot of like rise and fall. Uh, some rise very recently, but like, uh, you know, even a couple months ago, people weren't really playing Mobilize. And now, uh, German Japan midrange kind of comes uh, as this weird counter deck out of nowhere. So uh, I'm honestly not sure, but I would think that uh, the the big folk wolves are going to be a big deal. And looks like what we're getting here is frontline into the German Japan midrange. I think this is maybe what Head wanted to see. But again, I, I don't know. How do you feel about mobilize into German Japan mid range corn? I'm honestly, I've never played it from either side. I would have to say that it's favored for mobilize, but still doable for the German control deck. And uh, we brought up some really good points right before the game, right? About how, uh, you know, if the German mid range doesn't find its credit denial, like its ability to flounder. And uh, now that the Team Heavy takeover of the stream is complete, we can talk about how when Team Heavy did bring this deck into uh, World Final, or I'm sorry, World Cup, uh, a lot of what we did uh, and the way we structured ours was with things like a burst of fire because we felt that it needed more, uh, you know, kind of burst potential out of nowhere to try to find that lethal with things like Comet or even with things just like the big FWs. And, you know, Head doesn't have anything like that. He's going to have to get by with just units, credit denial, and chutzpah. Yeah, his hand doesn't look too strong starting out here. And J. King's, you know, trying to figure out what to do in these early turns. Does he want to, to trade his 164th and buff his Greyhound? Uh, but looks pretty strong. Head doesn't have, you know, the best responses. He does have the Admiral Hipper, and he is going first. So that is something to to consider yeah both players are kind of holding uh tools that are meant for a little later in the game than where we're currently at you see the the big five sixes uh that head is holding but then even j king holding strap bomb and those hellcats you know not really necessarily the early game that you're looking for and head kind of just has to give up his draw bomber here his hindcore just to take his one draw and that's all he's going to get. Never feels great when you play that card and you just know that you're not even getting a chance of a second Ooh. or third. Flying Ponzer is a, a great draw. I was just thinking his hand is not equipped to deal with the deal with this early game, but Flying Ponzer is a great find here. And, you know, Jay King will be able to draw. That's going to be a big point of emphasis for him. But it'd be interesting to see if Head then responds to this Sherman with his hipper and says 
you can have two more cards, but give me your credit slot, son. Right. How how important is he going to hold that credit slot? Because obviously it's it's, it's heads hold turn to Hipper, putting J King back at four. But then I would imagine J King's just coming right back down with the same turn. Is that yeah, but still sticking in the front line, and it looks like head I would imagine would have slammed it if he was going to do it. So yeah, it does look like head is going to he maybe could... draw and get himself an extra credit with MEBF. It's not that that strange either to see this pl- this line, and especially if J King has to waste two credits to move the Sherman to the front line just to be sent back to the hand next turn. Definitely still a a 50-50. I, th- I would say J King is favored here. The longer the match goes, the more he, he will probably be favored uh, if Head can't get this credit denial to start snowballing. J King with a nice play there. Uh, Head clearly set up his units in the back line with that Rubber win in the front to try to get another draw and another extra credit for next turn off of the pincer effect from the MEBF. J King denying that this turn and setting himself up. Yeah, and we're yeah. talking about Head's credit denial, but J King is one turn away from potentially strat bombing and denying Head a credit. You know, saying, nice credit denial deck. I'll, I'll show you my credit denial. A lot of ways head could go here. He could just Aichi and then maybe trade into the Sherman. Uh, he could maybe just throw the Folk Wolf down and just tell him, you know, I have the biggest unit. I'm going to grab some draw here as well. I think a Southern plan here would have been uh, pretty good. Uh, doesn't find it. Definitely the three options are all worth considering here. None standing out too much. Just going for the Aichi, staying patient, staying under control. Both sides just need to carefully consider their options. Strap Bomb is a strong play here. It is. What well, J-King doesn't know if the second Aichi is in Head's hand, so that's going to make the Aichi on the board into a 5 damage bomber. Basically, whenever Head wants, if J-King can't take care of it, the Hellcats obviously can run across the board, blow up a bomber, no problem. Yeah, and interesting to note, Head does not have any blitz options in hand to clog the front line and prevent the front line deck from from using its front line mechanics. Uh, definitely. He doesn't Definitely. need the IT here to kill the Sherman, but then after this turn, now you basically, yeah, you still have to come down with Aichi because what else are you doing with those credits? You can't just, you absolutely oh. can't just. Wow, Pathfinder is here. What a strong pool. I was just going to say, J King only has Eagle Claws left for back backline AoE, but, you know, Pathfinders will do the trick. And it's gonna it's, it's, it's a strong pool top deck. Uh, head head does not want to see this Pathfinders come down. With that and extra tilt sprinkled on top from the top deck. True. Uh, this match has not been going the way that head wanted. Uh, for sure. Uh, he, interestingly, I think he did mulligan the one careless talk at the beginning. That would have been. A interesting card to keep. All the way to turn seven, you can see there. Jaking just checked for the careless talk. It seems now coming down with that uh, pathfinder. Uh, but you know, this going all the way to seven turns without head finding any of his credit denial is uh, not what he wanted whatsoever. Green Jaking. Jaking, so the, oh, yeah, he's trying to protect it here. For sure, the Aichi now no longer can do much. 
You're definitely not going to yeah. hip with that unit of all units. Definitely looking like a low roll if I've ever seen one for head. He's going to have to figure out how to best use his resources on this turn. Uh, otherwise, uh, this could be the, the tipping point in this matchup. And nothing looks too good. You don't want to put the Pathfinders back in hand, but you also... What are your what's your other option? And that looks like a reasonable turn. Yeah, he figures this way he has a better chance of killing Pathfinders. They're gonna come back out uh, and probably take the bomber. But you'll get your bomber from the destruction, and it'll be a two-two Pathfinder. But you can see Not... Jake using the thirty-five T to make that play just a dream. And there's oh, the southern I, plan. plan. Wow. A little too little too late. Yep. Yeah. King seven credits, they call him. That's all he needs. There's Hellcats. Still holding on to those Hellcats. And you've got to, if you're in J King in this position, you're mobilized feels very comfortable versus the the remaining decks. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, J. King winning this uh, this game lines up really well for J. King winning this match. But it's not over yet. He still needs to find a Blitzkrieg to convert his advantage that he's built up. Yeah, whoever loses actually has to stop using the the lighter. They're not allowed to play with it anymore. That's what I've been told. The bet was made before the game. And that would be tragic for Head. Uh, you know, he... Wow. I mean, it's, it's just going... It's just going Jake King's way. I mean, I don't know what what head could do does he have leopold in he doesn't uh, have it he doesn't he does not which is again something that uh alternate versions uh of this deck have started to include and i think for the better uh, what, what's crazy to me is that J King is doing so well he only found one sherman he has not found a second sherman and that hasn't mattered at all uh he hasn't found a blitzkrieg yet he uh has you know Plenty of damage on the board. He's threatening uh, basically lethal with 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Yeah, he's threatening lethal even uh, with the Hellcat uh, after and the Fulkloff takes a unit. Head just hasn't found any Blitz units to contest the front line, and it's more of a story of, of, of Head low rolling than than J King drawing well. I mean, J King's probably drawn average at up to this point. At best, and <laughs> and head is, uh, just not finding the tools. I mean, no no Werble wins. The Flamponzer was probably his best card. I mean, he hasn't found the Schutzens, and you know he found one cavalry regiment, but. It's just not going to be enough, and J King gets the Blitzkrieg finisher in a strong opening, you know, and going to mobilize, he can easily, hopefully, can convert this. Yeah, he's got to feel, he's got to feel like he's in a great position to see, to see another finals. Two chances with mobilize here, and you wonder if Head goes right into that unfamiliar matchup of mobilize into the German mid range, just thinking, you know. I don't even really want to play the Jagra matchup unless I have to. And that's where you would be wrong. No, you're right. I was going to say, I think Southern Plan means I'm right. I know. Well, he does have Southern Plan this time, and it is looking a little bit better, so hopefully we'll be able to see this deck perform a little bit better. And You know, J. King's have... hand is okay. Doesn't go for an errata, keeps two one drops instead of looking for that errata going second because he's got that first southern plan in hand. So he's 
feeling good about it. Don't really want to see both Kiefer's as your first two mobilized units. Definitely not, especially when you have four supply shortages in this deck facing Jagro. You're going to want to to see one of those. And Head is cognizant of Jaking having all the supply shortages and not playing Aichi turn two. Although, if he could see Jaking's hand, he might have he might have uh, reconsidered that. Um, it's always painful to see so much value of an Aichi just get supply shortage away and not trigger the destruction effect. J King really considering this Kiefer, which is going to go right into that careless talk, get blown out of the water. Boom. There's, uh, there's worse things for him to lose. Obviously, like a Potez wow. lost to a careless talk would be deadly, but. I'm, I'm sure and are we going to see this Heinkel kill the. Kill the honey. It you know it makes sense credit wise, and yes, we'll see it. And head has a head has the board, and he's clear to southern plan next turn. All systems go. Although J King did go first, so he has that uh, credit slot uh, advantage. But not just a few cards away from being comfortable. I think if he could find a supply shortage here or there, he'd he'd feel fine about his position. Certainly better. Now the Southern plan coming out, now the credit denial starts. An evasive action could definitely catch this a Yag bomber here. All right, now it's all up. It's all on head. You know, can he convert? You know, he got he got the southern plan off. Um, it's going better than last time. Um, yeah, he's trying to redeem his lighter and get his lighter privileges back. I'd assume. The evasive action could stand to do uh, quite a bit here. Uh, if it can catch that Yag Bomber bounce, that would be pretty juicy. Eventually, you got to figure J King's going to have at least one big unit that's been able to uh, gain stats from Mobilize. And if Head thinks he can send it back and isn't able to do so because of that evasive, that could be a big play. And finding the supply shortage, Jaking's got to to be slightly relieved. You know, can relieve some of the pressure of the board. Pet here would like to find another credit denial to really get the advantage in the credit slot. You know, head head is really okay here it's gonna really come down to some some draws here i'm excited to see uh what head can do i mean 15 damage looking at maybe 11 with j king only having a honey and a kitty hawk in hand Ooh, and we might see see this evasive action trigger yeah, just like we predicted, I'm unsure if... Uh, I think that that's probably the best. Otherwise, Jaking probably would have just stopped a Folk Wolf from drawing, uh, which isn't terrible, right? Like, uh, denying draw is never a bad thing, but probably much more powerful to keep that bounce from triggering. Yeah, and Jaking does have a Monsoon Rot available. He, doesn't ha he does not have the supply shortage to to combine with it but if he does play it now it will will deal with the shitson in the front line and head's got to be fine with that he can put jaking down to to six just with attacking with the egg bomber let alone 
following up with the Werble wind. I'd have to imagine J-King feels uh, on the ropes right now. And even if he was to draw, let's say, uh, a Potez to Ooh. try to figure this out, he's going to... Oh, no, he will not have to play around the Careless this turn. Uh, but he's not going to find the Potez anyway. And interesting Kitty as well, because that Kitty Hawk was one of the only things that could uh, take that Careless talk, which I'm sure is going to be held up next turn. So five to put him down to two, but the Werble Wind will Should heal him back up to three. Well, oh, yeah, correct. We'll heal him back up to three. Very good point. Now, he... Maybe draw for... Draw first, but you're, you're not going to have a removal option. You'd have to find a type 94, get the pin, but yeah, that was playing that... That Kitty Hawk really is saving J King. Yeah, head choosing to absolutely get rid of that does not want to. He could have played the Nasha up first to, to get the credit refund on that trade. That's and then true. he would have potentially had the careless talk to eat this Potez. Gotta be an unfortunate misplay maybe i'll watch this back and realize that it didn't work out like that but imagine that potez just just eats a careless talk uh and or at the very have... least j king has to throw out one of those mobilized units first to test for it and then it's at least you know one less draw and two less health true although comet could could be a uh, a winning find for head if he can find it at this point. Oh, he does have 11 credits to J King's seven. Playing the BF 109, is he looking to trade here and maybe get another draw? Trying to find Comet, maybe? A, a Schutzen would be a strong pool too, being able to trade out the front line and deal three damage. Yeah, or another type for another pin so that he could set up some sort of target kill on one of these big units. Starting to look pretty good for J-King. Hipper would be great if it was uh, five credits, but not at four. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, and he still takes it over the Flamponzer, which could uh, yeah. which could be, you know, could deal with the, the unit in the front line. He could have cleared the front line. No, I believe is that a Kiefer in the front line? I believe that Kiefer is not the Kiefer is not cost one. Could kill unit in the back line True. with the flam. True. So that Kiefer just being a little bit more expensive is a huge play. Makes it stick in the front line. Wow. And I, I that not playing the not the Nosh up to get the refund on that. That trade into the Kitty Hawk, which would allow him to have the careless talk. Uh definitely, you know, could could be a, a lose this this set and you know give him a quick road to the third place match. Gotta figure we see Hipper here on the Kiefer, but I mean it's too little too late once more. Yeah, and that Arado is not gonna draw anything. He can Nothing get two in damage in. A fierce two damage. He could also kill the Sexton, but... Yeah. Survive a couple of turns. The infantry well, he is could, slow. He could get two damage in and then get a draw off the 22nd. Trying to find... Comet to face race. It it will still stay in the front line after the trade, so that still will be possible. Man. This is gonna set up a great carpet bomb for J King. Likely likely game ending carpet bomb here. We'll see. I mean we do have a one Schutzen in hand. J King can also be barely afford the carpet bomb because of all the credit denial. He can't fly the he can't do his three damage if he carpets. Be carpet as well. bomb and pass. 
So I mean, the honey, credit. the honey kefir is going to be strong. Hopefully, it, you know, it will take out a unit and a supply okay. shortage. Oh man, any he heals back up to fourteen health. Really didn't need the carpet bomb whatsoever. At best, he can take the potes out here, but. It's going to be difficult for J King to maybe find this seven health, but I don't think it's going to be as difficult uh, as it will be for Head to kind of fully battle back here. Yeah, both Aichi's coming down here really is going to be a carpet bomb deterrent, I'd have to imagine. Yeah, and, and Head feels a little safe after seeing uh, two supply shortages from J King so far in the game. If J King's only on two cards, I mean, it. I don't know. This matchup is proving to be much more exciting than I would have thought. I would have thought the Mobilize could just run away with it. Oh, and another supply shortage. It's going to hit an Aichi. There's going to be a lot of value there. Jaking's proving to be the customs officer this, this Saturday, you know, and just saying, or where are you taking those supplies? Not into my... Not into my OCC. Head uh, basically drew all three Type 94s, like, slowly after using, like, one or two turns after using the pin for a tempo he play. Can Never... even out the, the HP, and J King's, you know, trying to find some draw. He's finding all his supply shortages, but he's also low on supplies, too. It's both... Both sides equally low on supplies. This game is really twisting around here. Uh, anything like, uh, I mean, it heads a comet draw away from just making it a complete turnaround. I don't know about you, but I'm on the edge of my seat watching this. The sincerely yours is a huge help. J King needs cards and health. Oh, and guess what and a got? Potez top off the top gonna rip it into airborne, just sending his HQ back up. London is being rebuilt by J King as we speak. Oh, and I he was decides. Gonna say, I think yeah, he's gonna hold that back because that five two fighter uh is going to go to five one from supply shortage, and it would be too easy for Head to just rip that trade for a unit that's doomed anyway. So I agree with the play here. He's going to really hope that he draws one more. Just play the, the Arado for a big one damage burst next turn. Man, imagine J King finds airdrop and just really seals this with an airdrop Potez combo. Yeah, an airdrop Potez draw and that airborne is 11, so would not have he actually would need i mean it would still be great right he would still get two but he wouldn't be able to drop the airborne afterwards with only 11 credits because yeah he needs to be able to and I, i'd have to stuff. assume j king's heart rate is follow is growing just like that command mobilize unit every turn oh and head just finding the martyrs a little too late yeah that's such a dead draw he can't even trade into a unit. And the game turns back the other way. And wow. Jaking really showing that he is in world championship form going into Iceland. Although you might have something to say about that. Ah, uh, who isn't in world championship form? It's December, baby. <laughs> oh, man. J King really, really trying to be precise with this. He says, I don't want to lose to some shenanigans. And it does not look like he will fall victim to any shenanigans. 
Yeah, there's truly just nothing. As we said, you know, the even it got credit denial this time, but the late game. Uh, oh man. Adorado, there's just there's only three orders, and we've already used them. So Adorado is not going to do anything. And, and had more planned and... plan to go <laughs> south to the third place match. J King advancing to the finals. I, I can't. I couldn't have hoped for a better match. That was worth the price of admission. That was super interesting. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and I think you worked in at least six Southern Plan um, puns. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely worth the price of admission. The big old zero dollars we all paid to witness that. But uh, no, I agree that that was a phenomenal matchup considering how much we went back and forth before the game around like, hey, what what do we expect? Who knows? We haven't really seen, you know, this happen. And, and it turned out this way. Uh, Corden, let's start with you. Just any thoughts now after seeing it, thinking back to what we were talking about before the matchup, did this kind of make some sense or were you just completely blown away by the direction this matchup took? Uh, definitely made sense. Uh, Head's deck didn't go the best. I can't say that it was the worst either. Definitely was not a favorable matchup versus Mobilize, but he really uh, made a match of it. And sad to see that he couldn't get one win, make it you know to a Jagro Mobilize standoff. But uh, credit to J King for really not not giving up when he might have thought he had advantage and could have rested on his laurels absolutely and then thanatron we saw in that first matchup we talked about that a bit before as well where that mid-range that can suffer a bit when you don't get any credit denial pieces and then jaking just kind of ran over with the frontline deck that he's so well known for uh do you think that the credit denial piece was really the the game changer there that it could have gone a different direction if head had gotten maybe a little bit of a better opener and kind of you know had a better better curve there Certainly, but I almost think that that matchup is sort of just favored for frontline kind of always. Uh, I, you know, I've definitely seen frontline just get high rolled by the credit denial deck, right? Like it's not completely out of the realm of possibilities. But uh, even once you kind of get slowed down uh, money wise, there's so much value in US frontline, whether you're drawing two cards and laying a four drop for only four credits or you're getting a 4-4 a four, four into the front line for only four credits, or you're laying one drops that have zero op costs with a 1-1 one, one destruction buff. Like, there's just a lot, a lot, a lot of value that you can pull out of that deck. So I think it just has ways to not mitigate, right, credit denial, but, like, uh, make it hurt a lot less than some other decks. Right on. So that was our first semifinal. Let's bring up the bracket, take a peek, and see what we got coming up next. Thank you so much, Corn Guy and Thanatron. We're going to swap casters as we go as well. Uh, so there you see Jaykin making their way into the finals. Um, I, I think, you know, Corn Guy mentioned it and nailed it in absolute world championship form, getting warmed up for December 2nd and 3rd, going into the 2023 world championships. We got Kill Switch taking on Birdo Burrito here in our second semifinal semi-final uh let's go ahead and welcome back red sun and starry so we just saw a heck of uh, of a matchup there a heck of a series we've seen that mid-range deck kind of go back and forth it works it does it it seemed to kind of hit a bit of a wall there for head starry any any thoughts on kind of where this mid-range deck sits uh in in the current meta yeah i'm gonna be perfectly honest after playing it myself i'm not a huge huge fan of the deck um Arado, you want to be behind on board to get it off, and then if you're playing Southern Plan, you want to be ahead on board. Like It seems like you don't have the time to play it all the time, and I really don't love the fact that there is no real removal uh, in the deck, and there are some threats that I just can't handle. However, I also can't argue with its uh, success in the competitive scene. We've seen a lot of Eastern players uh, play it to pretty good success so i mean i don't know i don't personally like it but i can't say it's bad well we've definitely seen it fall off a little bit right it kind of came up really quick saw it in a couple different events then it's sort of seen less and less uh, and then we've sort of moved more towards control right we've seen just about everybody bring at least one soviet deck so red sun i'm curious is this just more of a meta shift going like hey the mid-range tools maybe aren't quite enough we have to go full out control to kind of counter the front lines and the jaggers and things like that that we're seeing 
personally, I believe we're in a transitioning phase where a lot of the competitive players are trying to experiment. Um, there's also the expansion coming up, and they're trying to move away from the traditional uh, decks that you see the competitive players have been bringing to tournaments and trying to find new effective ways of um, yeah, securing wins in the future. Well, we've seen Kill Switch line up, so let's go ahead and bring that up as we get into the semifinal. Um, we've seen the Soviet Italy control, we've got the Jagro, we've got the front line. Um, Starry, you want to just kind of rip through these real quick and get everybody up to speed if they did miss our first feature quarterfinal? Sure. So uh, Killswitch's first deck is a Soviet Italy control, of which we've seen quite a lot today. The key features of this deck are three copies of Fiat G50, which is the two-cost Fiat, and it is a great anti-aggro tool. And you kind of combine this with two copies of five-year plan. So you are you have good anti-aggro, you're gaining some HQ defense, then you're losing some HQ defense later in the game to uh, draw a bunch of cards. Um, other than that, playing two Confusion, one Partisans, one Red Banner um, as your steely package where you get to steal your opponent's stuff and trade it away. And then if it still happens to be around, you can Red Banner it. Um, but this list is playing uh, Kuban Cossacks as well, which is uh, some sometimes people play it, sometimes people don't. Um, I really like it. It allows you to trade usually into two things early in the game um, and also can quickly start hitting down your opponent's HQ if you're in an, a nice end game position. The next is a Japan Germany Jagger list. This list is relatively standard, playing four copies of Expansion, two copies of Schutzen, um, one copy of Eagle Claws uh, for to get rid of those pesky backline units. The two copies of Schutzen is a little bit heavy. Um, then one copy of Naval Supply Run, no copies of Shinano. Shinano is not in this deck. And then one copy of Sendai. So pretty standard list. Um, these days, that's kind of been what people are leaning more towards. A couple of important decisions to be made still. But um, yep. And then the last deck is a classic US Germany frontline deck. Probably the most defining deck of this metagame. Uh, swapping out the traditional Stars and Stripes for the Eagle Claws, this has been a pretty normal change recently. Almost everybody's been doing this. No copies of We Can Do It, only one copy of 109th Combat Engineers, and adding an extra copy of Greyhound for a total of four Greyhounds. Um, two copies of Blitzkrieg, some people have been playing one, some people have been playing two, and one copy of Enigma, and I don't really love this card. But, um, you know, I, you know, Killswitch is a, an excellent player, and I can't argue with him taking it. Uh, and then lastly, one copy of Dive Bombing. Some people have been hot on it, some people not so much. But anyways, also, except for the Enigma, pretty standard list. Awesome. Thank you so much, Starry. Now, let's take a look at Killswitch's opponent. We have got the uh, Burrito Man himself with the finger guns. 118 matches, 80% win rate. Like, I don't even know how to explain how ridiculous these some of these win rates are. Amazing, amazing season. Uh, coming in six, probably just due to the lack of overall games played, but that nonetheless gets you a guaranteed seat, though this month is the last time we're going to see that. That's going down to two top players getting guaranteed spots. So Birdo sneaking in here, going into the semifinals. Let's go ahead and bring up Birdo's deck list here. And, uh, and Red Sun, take us through them. So Burrow's first list is what seems to be a classic Soviet-France control. This list um, we've seen with other high-profile players like Head. I know that Head is a big fan of that list. Um, it has uh, numerous ways of dealing with early aggression. Uh, tools such as the Brian's Confusion uh, 39th Rifle, aka the Steely Boys, as some might refer mm -hmm. to it. Um, and this list comes with a full stack of Remas, which in the mid to late game can be extremely scary. They can give mobilize to their adjacent units, which um, yeah, is a threat that has to be addressed with ASAP, unless you want to be steamrolled by units that have mobilize. So next up, we have a Jaguar list, which also looks pretty standard. The only thing that stands out to me here is 
um, Berto is bringing the sheet in, which um, we've mentioned earlier has fallen slightly out of favor uh, with uh, other competitive players in uh, Jagro. It also has no Enigma as a backup plan, which means he's relying on the standard Jagro draw package. The deck aims to just get the early win before draw becomes really necessary without like uh, uh, having to play the Enigma. Um, next up, we have, last but not least, we have Birdo's US Frontline list, which um, again is uh, a list that we see pretty frequently on ladder and in tournaments. He also made the decision to include the uh, card Eagle Claws, which uh, is pretty pretty good against uh, threats in the back line in the Jagro matchup against uh, Aichi's Mada's and also double Blitzkrieg, which gives them a little more wiggle room. So in comparison to other lists that run one copy of Blitzkrieg, where the time you, like the Blitzkrieg has to be extremely well timed, here he has a little more um, consistency in it. Awesome. Thank you so much for breaking that down. Let's go ahead and take a peek at the bands and see exactly what these players are going to be able to. Yeah, shocker. Um, so once again, we are not going to see any Soviet uh, lists here played. Both players are going to get access to Jagro and to Frontline. I feel like we've talked about this before every match. I don't know that there's anything left to add, Starry. Any other additional thoughts worth conveying to our audience about why these Soviet decks are just getting crossed out every single time? Yeah. When I played in Worlds, my Soviet deck also got banned every <laughs> single time. Um, yeah, no, the Soviet decks are really strong against specifically Frontline and Jagro. Uh, almost, almost guaranteed for the Soviet deck to win, especially given that they're teched so heavily to beat these specific decks. They play Petlyakov to deal with the frontline decks, uh, Winter Warfares and Bloody Sickles to deal with the Jagro decks. But uh, one thing that I wanted to point out is they're both playing a Soviet control list, a Jagro list, and a frontline list. They both ban the Soviet, the Soviet list. Um, but Birdo seems to be playing like the old school lists, um, playing the two copies of the Engineers and the Frontline list, two copies of the 99th, um, whereas Killswitch seems to be experimenting with the lists that have been popping up more recently. Um, and so, yeah, it's just interesting to see that um, Birdo is comfortable playing the things that have historically been good. And even if Kill Switch is, you know, attacking them towards certain, uh, making certain key decisions in deck building, that Birdo is confident that the stuff that has historically worked will continue to work. And Unless... we're going to start off both players on frontline, Birdo going first, but not having any one drops. Um, mm -hmm. Normally going first is a pretty huge deal, especially if you're playing two copies of 99th. Birdo's playing two copies of 99th, uh, but Birdo just cannot hit those one drops. This, uh, yeah, it's kind of unfortunate on Birdo's end here. Not finding any of those one drops that you desperately need in this matchup to secure the front line going first. Yeah, with uh, with the amount of one drops in Birdo's deck, uh, Birdo's playing eleven one drops, and a couple weeks ago, I ended up doing the math on um, a deck that plays ten one drops, I believe. And if you're going first with a deck that plays ten one drops, and you mulligan every card that isn't a one drop, which Birdo did, then you have over a ninety percent chance of starting with a one drop. So the fact that Birdo is playing 11 one drops and didn't didn't get a single one drop in either of the two starting hands is you have like an 8% chance or something for that. Um definitely quite unfortunate. Definitely not lucky. 
And Killswitch is taking full advantage of this and has lots of early game plays to make. Yeah, it, it is yeah. a real tough break, Virto. I, I would be <laughs> not super happy <laughs> that I, unfortunately, in such a high-level tournament, a high-profile tournament, it really sucks when you hit that, like, 8% chance. I just had to think of this exact amount. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I feel like in. Sky Train is probably your best bet to get back into this game. It does die to your opponent playing 35T next turn, but it at least takes up their full turn. Well, so you what are your other are options? A... You, you can drop the Martyr or the Hellcat, but you cannot operate them. Yeah, you can drop the Martyr and hope that it doesn't die to Pathfinders or um, Eagle Claws, which would be even worse. Birdo instead opting for the Hellcat, still dies to Pathfinders, but um, it means that Kill Switch would have to trade something in, lest Birdo gets some really nice value trades. I mean, keeping the mod is uh, smart, as long as you don't have a Sherman or a way to like utilize the Sherman's deployment effect. Um, you desperately need the draw in, in, in Burr's situation to like extend your your options. And um, playing the Mada when you're actually able to kill one of your opponent's units is probably the better play here. Oh yeah, 100%. Um, Birdo does have those fifth rangers, which are really good for contesting the front line. They've pretty much guaranteed value trade, uh, at least two trades into the front line. Mm -hmm. Uh, problem is that Kill Switch has that Red Devils, and that Red Devils is so hard to get rid of. And Kill Switch is going to start dropping these Shermans, and even if Birdo does contest the front line, then there's like a whole nother wave uh, that Kill Switch is going to get in these next upcoming turns. It is really, really difficult to be in Birdo's position. And as long as Birdo is, um, as long as Birdo is like back against the wall, that uh, strat. Strat bombing looks extremely threatening. Yeah, for sure. I like this play from Birdo. Yes, you could go Martyr and trade your Engineers into the 164th, try and draw a card. But this play I like a lot better because it allows you to uh, continue to trade out on future turns. This turn you get to attack once. Next turn you're going to get to play the other 5th Rangers and attack twice. Um, so like every turn you get to trade out more and more than the last one. Um, so I really, really like this play. Hmm. Is this a martyr turn here? This could be a martyr turn. Uh, um, I also wouldn't be upset by another 5th Rangers, but you could absolutely play martyr here. Rather than trade the 5th Rangers, then um, push up the 109th to at least uh, yeah, have the um, little buffer in the front line. You could. It's a little bit weak to like any blitz tanks or a 99th, but yeah, no, it's definitely an option. I, I like this play a little bit better from Birdo. Um, I think it's the more conservative play. Um, and since Kill Switch isn't playing stars, Birdo doesn't have to push up if he doesn't want to, but he decides he does. So it looks like. As if Birdo's on his way to stabilize again. Birdo does prevent the second Sherman draw um, by doing this. So, although you might not get the value trades that you would by keeping the fifth rangers back in the long run, it's going to be more helpful to push up here and prevent those Sherman draws. But Kill Switch has such good targets for this Pathfinder. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Really has quite a few options here. Yeah, Kill Switch has absolutely the lion's share of the options. There we go. Think the range is gone. It feels like in this position, position, you almost 
have to go for the Sherman. I mean, yeah, it's you could go for Skytrain, push up 99th, something like that as well. Doesn't seem super bad. Which basically guarantees that you're going to get a Sherman next turn, but it is a little bit risky. And it looks like that's what Virto wants to do, is push up Skytrain and 99th. Yeah, the, I, I think that this is pretty solid as it almost guarantees that you have the front line next turn to Sherman, while also potentially threatening some really nice value trades. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I really like this play. I think this play absolutely makes sense. If Killswitch wants, he could trade off the Pathfinders and the Greyhound. Or not trade them, but at least attack with them, dive bombing and push up the Greyhound uh, from the hand. And that would prevent Birdo from getting the Sherman draw on the next turn. Mm -hmm. um, but instead, Killswitch is saying, okay, Sherman draw is okay with me but I'm going to draw quite a lot of cards as well. Mm -hmm. So... Without having to use any of my Shermans. <laughs> yep. So Birdo's really looking for an Eagle Claws here. Um, Pathfinders would be okay too, but I think that just pushing up and Shermaning, trying desperately to find the Eagle mm -hmm. Claws. If, if Birdo can manage to get an Eagle Claws, this game completely turns around. Yeah, completely that changes the whole dynamic of the suddenly Birdo would have an absolutely commanding position so 180 degree and although it's you know not particularly likely at the same time it wasn't particularly likely that Birdo didn't find a one drop so <laughs> unlikely things happen in this game they happen all the time the um... problem with this is if you don't find anything um, yeah. Then your opponent does get to trade in, drawing stuff off the Martyr. Um... Oh, okay, interesting. Hmm. On one hand, it is a huge tempo play to get rid of the Sherman, but the value of the Sherman getting to come down again, getting to continue to look for the Eagle Claws, I don't know. I don't know, this is a very interesting game. This is an... A fascinating game. If Killswitch doesn't trade off with uh, pretty much everything here, then Birdo could be starting to look for a week and do it. Which would um, if, be... If Birdo can get off one good week and do it, um, then Birdo can value trade the, the rest of the game, and the game is basically over. Um, true. And Killswitch isn't playing we can do it. But we can do a cost five, and five is not super fun uh, trying to fit in five credits into your game plan. Okay, so... That doesn't look particularly... I mean, you could try the 35T for the 35T. Yeah. Want to play Amada first? Yep. Um, that's kind of what I like personally, and that seems to be what Birdo likes as well. Probably gonna trade the Greyhound first, make sure that there's mm -hmm. nothing better. And then thirty-five T can trade, and if you draw another thirty-five T, you could trade again. Uh, probably just makes sense to like push 109th and, yeah, play 109th mm -hmm. and push a 164th. Yep. What is going to get bounced this time? The Engineers. I mean, that's the best thing to get bounced. Yeah. That's, that's cheap, absolutely that's... the best thing to get bounced. Kill switch can play Strat Bombing, but that is going to take up the entire turn. Also, I wouldn't have minded the um the pathfinders bouncing the 99th so you get the deployment true, effect again true 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 um but in terms of cost efficiency 109th 
one hundred ninth yep. is better, probably in terms of cost efficiency. Um, does it make sense to play the strat bombing here? I don't know. It's a lot of credits. You can trade out everything that your opponent has. Yeah. Um, but while keeping the Pathfinders, but at the same time, Pathfinders is all you have if you do that. You have Pathfinders and a, a Greyhound in the back line if you want it. Oh, or or it's or uh, that in the front line. Is now the moment to consider bringing back online the Sky Train? Probably. I mean, mm. I think like Sky Train 109th Sherman, maybe something like that. You need to have a way to to contest this Pathfinders. It'd be really nice if Birdo had a half track. If Birdo had a half yeah. track, this game would look a lot different. You could push up yeah. a 164th, you could play a Sky Train, but Birdo just can't find these. Or sorry, not half tracks. I mean, half track would work too. I was primarily thinking of um Hellcat. If I had a Hellcat and I was able yeah, to yeah, Hellcat would be knock out that Pathfinders. Here. I would probably play that. I would pr play the Sky Train in a heartbeat. Yep, the Sherman Sky just... Train makes the most sense in my opinion as well. Opting for the one sixty fourth and not trading it. Uh, Sherman uh, gets uh, bounced. Oh. And Killswitch has a ha has has a uh, a Hellcat to take out that Sky Train. That Sky Train, unfortunate for sure. Killswitch even has the opportunity to play Martyr. Oh, instead going for a massive Blitzkrieg. That's game over. Ooh. That gotta hurt. Yep. All right. So we're gonna Killswitch is going to need to win with his newfangled Jagger list against either Birdo's frontline list or Birdo's Jagger list. And to be honest, to try and win a mirror and also play like frontline in a Jagro, I mean, you know, both of them are 50 fifties. Yeah. And it's very hard to win two 50 fifties in a row, even if you're, you know, an incredibly skilled player. I mean, both these Which players are both of them, excellent. Yeah, unarguably. Um, I'm just wondering, are we going to see the second, uh... okay. So Birdo's mm -hmm. sticking with the, uh, the frontline list, and it looks like Birdo has a pretty solid start here. Kill Switch would really love to find, uh, some earlier game stuff, because that naval supply run, key 83, shuts in, those are going to be rotting in hand for quite a long time. Yeah. Birdo Birdo starting off with the, yeah, <laughs> starting off with the Red Devils. If those Red Devils make get to the front line, they pose quite a quite a nuisance to Kill Switch's game plan, which is also As like operating from the front line. Absolutely, especially if Birdo can get a PIR buff to come down. Oh. On the uh, Red Devils would mean that it trades really favorably with stuff like Panzer. Um, I suspect that we're going to see, if Killswitch does decide to move up, I'm suspecting that Birdo would prefer to trade out with the Greyhound, as the Red Devils is uh, really valuable in this matchup. It eats up your opponent's credits in them trying to trade it, and it can get a PIR buff, whereas Greyhound can't. If the PIR yeah. isn't selfish. Yeah, PIR <laughs> Which... can be selfish. And this is what it looks like when Frontline gets to go first. And gets their early game units. Denies the... Uh, all of the 1-3s uh, trade so nicely with all the early game infantry from Jagro. Yep. Birdo's got that uh, eagle claws armed and ready, hey. and it hits. The... Hey. Oh, he's and not being selfish. He's not being selfish for <laughs> once. Yep, that's that is a huge hmm. issue for Kill Switch to try and deal with. But I mean, Kill Switch has an Aichi. The Aichi is 
going to be a pain to get rid of. It's going to require an attack. It's going to require Eagle Claws. Um, and Killswitch having Eagle Claws himself means that if Birdo does manage to get like a Martyr online, it's going to be gone. It's going to be gone instantly. Mm. So both players have the Eagle Claws. Um, Killswitch has the Martyr. It just um I would kinda like to see What do you destroy it first? I would destroy it first, personally. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and then send back the I G two point oh. Yeah. The D three two A or something. I think that one is the D three one A and the other one's the D three two A, if I remember correctly. But yeah, um, Birdo a little bit low on resources, and Killswitch does have quite a lot of stuff that can come down later. The question is, can Birdo keep this tempo up quickly enough that Killswitch doesn't necessarily have the opportunity to get down all of this? So, and there's the expansion. Yeah, expansion is <laughs> probably not, not going to get played, no. at least for a very long time. It's not gonna um, but Killswitch does have the opportunity to play um, 41st, uh, the Bicycle, um, play a Panzer 35T, you can trade the Bicycle with the Red Devils, and um, I don't know, maybe keep the 35T around. Or you could even play Aichi again. You could just replay the bicycle. Or you could replay the Aichi and play the bicycle and trade with the, the Red Devils. The Aichi itself like poses a threat, something that you want to remove because it can trade for uh, for free, essentially, with... Uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's not going to take any retaliation damage, so... Yeah. Some... Yep. Um, to go for the IG. Pretty much every one of Berta's draws here is fantastic because when you have such a commanding front line, every card in your deck is online. A 99th is insanely good. A Sherman is insanely good. 22nd is a crazy value engine. Um, what I would do here probably is like trying to. Trying to kill the Aichi so it spawns the um, second Aichi uh, that sets up for an Eagle Claws next turn. If he decides yeah. to play the Mada. Yeah, it uh, makes Kill Switch kind of unable to play super hard into it. Which, um, if you wanna, or if you have to, um, yeah, trade up units on the front line, you might wanna get, you might wanna like capitalize on it, like just drop in the Mada here. Um, yeah, and Birdo is playing around Eagle Claws instead of going for extra damage. Yeah, I was just I was just about to say it's extremely prone to Eagle Claws, but unfortunately, PIR gave the buff to Twenty Second, not the unit that you want to see buffed, especially mm -hmm. when your when your opponent has a bomber. It's not particularly relevant, but you know, Birdo did get the better PIR buff earlier, so can't complain that much. Killswitch has a lot of cards, a lot of really good cards, a lot of really strong options. Problem is, not anywhere near enough credits to play them. He doesn't have the infantry to... Uh, if he had a one drop, he could uh, get those two Panzer 35Ts online and get uh, a favorable trade into the Greyhound and knock out the half track. Yeah, uh, I mean, Jagger really only plays the cream of the crop when it comes to units that cost more than or sorry cards in general that cost more than two like if a card is in jagro and it costs three or more it's, it's completely busted <laughs> like, yeah. it has to be <laughs> otherwise you wouldn't play it so kill switch has all these crazy ridiculously busted cards that cost more than three three or more um but no credits hmm
I like how Berto is like just shoving unit after unit into that front line, making it yeah, and incredibly if, hard. If Berto continues to draw two cards a turn, uh, then this value lead that kills each has <laughs> isn't going to last forever. <clears throat> I wouldn't mind seeing like Sendai, Sendai on the fifth rangers, 35t into the 1-1. One -one. Yeah, you gotta cut. You gotta just like cut off the draw engine here. It's uh, you don't want him well, to. Well, able... I guess, but I feel like the fifth rangers is an even bigger issue than the the draw engine. I... Yeah, I mean, a blitzkrieg is probably even more dangerous than letting your opponent get cards. So yeah, that's probably the better option. Instead, opting to trade with the two two. And uh, with the existing Panzer, instead of playing down another one. This does play around strat bombing a lot better. Yeah, wow. Hmm. These, these players really That's... know what they're doing. They're making key decisions every single turn. Yeah, and it's really anybody's game at this point. Kill switch is starting to get to the point where they have the credits to do what they want to do. Yes, Birdo could find and... a Blitzkrieg over these next couple turns and somehow sneak sneak something crazy, but Kill switch absolutely has the opportunity to get back into this game, especially if Birdo doesn't draw. Um, you know, hits a couple of duds. <laughs> um, so. So far, it looks pretty even to me. Uh, there's a lot of things that can happen, like Kill Switch getting a second Zendai here, or uh, a buff to the a uh, Type 93 to drop the Mada and then uh, Ooh, get that's a kill a with the hands of 35T. Ooh. I mean, I wouldn't say it's even, but I definitely think that Kill Switch mm. has several ways to get back into this game. Uh, like martyr Yokosuka into the twenty second. See if you can find something also, good. Funny how Burrow hasn't played a single Sherman yet. So once he gets those Shermans, they've got to be somewhere. Yeah, they've got to be somewhere. Burdo is playing two copies of twenty second, which a lot of people have cut one copy. Um, because. It's kind of slow, and when you don't have the front line, it isn't that great. It's a 2 cost 2 1 infantry, which is, as far as stats go, pretty bad. I think there's like 2 cost, uh, what's like the best infantry at 2 cost? Just purely stats. Um, like a 2 4, I think there's like 2 4s and stuff. Defense wise, it's gotta be the Briansk, I think. Oh, yeah, I mean, Br Briansk is, yeah, there's. Much, much better stats out there for two cost. Yeah. And so unless you're getting those draws, which aren't always guaranteed, especially in a meta that's so heavily dominated by Frontline and Jagro, uh, it's just it's just a little bit slow. Hmm. And I really like this play from Birdo. Ooh. Yeah. This hurts and kills at, people. At this point, pretty much anything, like, at this point, any unit single-handedly becomes a threat from Birdo because, um, you know, Blitzkrieg with any yeah. two units really is lethal. And having that 6-6 six, six on the front line, he ha he definitely has a tight grip on that front line, and he's not gonna, from what it looks... It uh, looks like this is gonna be it from Kill Switch. Yeah. I think Kill Switch is holding out for a Sendai. Because, you know, you can survive one turn. And if Kill Switch does get a Sendai, the, the Whirlwind, the Panzer, they're going to start trading. You're going to start drawing cards. I mean, Kill Switch can get back into it with a Sendai. But, but you have to find that Sendai. It's you all got to find the Sendai here. And actually, I, you know what? Never mind. I believe that Kill Switch only plays one Sendai. Birdo plays two Sendais, but I'm almost certain that Kill Switch only plays one Sendai. Yeah, Kill Switch only plays one Sendai. So 
What Kill Switch really needs is like. Ooh, uh, I don't even know. Um. Mm, is there anything? Not like really. Not... I'm looking through this list, and without the second Sendai, I don't think there really is anything. Hmm. Yep, that's. Yeah, I mean, it's a little bit premature from Birdo, but... I think they both... Uh... Yeah, they, they both know what's going on yeah. here. Yeah. And we're going to see a game three, a Jagro mm. Mirror. Ooh. <laughs> so Birdo managing to tie it back up. I mean, all the man needs is a one drop, and... See what he's capable of. <laughs> yeah. Um, Kill Switch trying to think of any way out of this. You don't have any way of That's... killing the uh yeah there's no way out because there's no way of killing the 6 6 and the 3 3 and the 3 1 and the 4 2. You have to kill both you have to kill everything in the front line here in order to survive. And you got yeah. four credits and like nothing. Is it just me or is kill switch not particularly lucky with those expansions today? Well, a kill switch plays four of them. And if you play four of them you better have the freaking front line. <laughs> yeah. You better have yeah. it. <laughs> if, it says you, right there on the time. If that's going to be your draw engine, then you need the front line. And in this matchup, it's really tough, especially if you go second. Also if you go second, this is really, really hard. Especially, like, Birdo had a, a red devils. You know? It's also, very hard it's, to get it's it. It's only increasingly things. difficult. Uh, it only gets more difficult when you play against a deck that has literally the name, the word frontline in the, in the name, right? Yeah. So. <laughs> yep. Um, but yeah, I mean, maybe maybe that's why Dandelion was playing those Enigmas. Maybe maybe Enigma is better against frontline or something like that. I don't know. And also, honorable death. Honorable death seems quite good in two. Frontline and the mirror match. Yeah, it's hard to say really. But um yeah, I mean I'm very impressed with both players play. Uh both of them are absolutely phenomenal. Yep. I mean they're up there for a reason. You can you can say that about any player uh, par um part participating in this tournament. It would still be true. Yeah, I think that we probably have some technical difficulties going it on because we should like see it. a clock by now. And uh, yep, Virto did get that win there. No surprise. Which means we're going to um, see the second Jagro mirror match. On a 1 to 10 scale, how excited are you about this? Probably less excited than you are. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You are generally known for uh, being a Jagro fiend. Notoriously. So Birdo has is going first. Kill switch preventing any value trades with that 35T by pinning it. Um, but Birdo has the Martyr and the Signal. The Sheedon is probably not doing a whole lot mm. right this second. Not at the moment. But... Ah, uh, you love to see an early signal, especially if it's golden. <laughs> so are you just gonna see a push up an expansion from Kill Switch? Maybe even a twenty second, just try and increase in value. Or are we gonna see a type come down so that the a type ninety three? So that the type ninety four TK can trade out with the Panzer? I think mm -hmm. both are worth considering. But first, you want to see what you draw. If you, if that's the play that you're going for, then you want to see what you draw first. Yep. As long as Birdo can keep one or two units, 
down, then this martyr could potentially chain into more and more draws. So I do think that Kill Switch's deck is probably a little bit stronger in the mirror. I did not expect expect no, to see the come down there. Me neither. That is quite surprising. And he goes for the one one. But yeah, you know what? This prevents the martyr from coming down. So it ends up working in Kill Switch's favor here. Birdo's bombing mm -hmm. rate is super awkward. I mean, yeah, you can take out a 1-3, but is that really... You, he's he's thinking about this right now. Oh, but... oh I know he's thinking about it. <laughs> I... <laughs> he's, he's definitely thinking about it. You could also just play Martyr Pin, push up, and your opponent yep. can't really trade out with you because unless they have Warbowind specifically... But yeah, um, so that I... does it does kind of lose to Orbowind, which yeah. Mm. Yeah, I'll God, it would feel it feels so bad to see this bombing raid come down. Yeah, but what I, what do you, what else do you do? I you personally, know? yeah, as you suggested, I would I would also probably give this play. Um, yeah, this just hard loses to Orbowind. <laughs> And speaking of, there it is. Oh my god. You predicted the future. Oh, oh god. But uh, on the upside... That's, if... that's what we call dramatic irony. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh gosh. Okay, Berto is really missing the one drops here. Or the draw. So if you get an expansion next turn, do you move up the signal to get the draw? Or do you do... You do? And there it is. And Birdo has to be really pissed that that happened to be the very, very front yeah. card. Okay, mm -hmm. actually, rating Wait, is super what? good here. Rating is an insanely good draw. You get to draw two cards off of it. Damn. Things about positioning. I don't think it matters because mm -hmm. I think you're trading it in most of the time. Most of the time, I think you trade it in. Yeah, but um, as far as like what he's going to draw, uh, I, off the matter, I think um, like the. Yeah, you always gotta consider that you might draw something off Margo that you want to play, but. Okay, Birdo somehow managing to stick in this game. Hmm. <clears throat> So it looks like Kill Switch is gonna do like a Type ninety three Audacity play, so that no matter which one it hits, yeah, it's it, a guaranteed kill. It guaranteed kills, or Kill Switch could just go for the trade first. It goes for the trade first, killing the mm, signal. Guaranteeing killing the signal. I mean, mm. yeah, that's it's definitely not bad. I'd like to just see like bombing raid Aichi here. That's yeah, yeah. And because Birdo has Sheedon, the longer this game goes on and the lower life that Kill Switch is at, Birdo just needs to like trade. Trade and trade and trade. Maybe get a little bit of extra damage in somewhere. You need to find four more damage. Mm -hmm. But overall, um, if Birdo can get this game to go to turn 11, then that's really all you need here. If you reach a certain threshold, then... But getting it to go to turn 11 is going to be a challenge. Yeah. Okay, now we see The Warbowins see Birdo. trade super nicely, but I don't know if that's going to be enough, per se. Especially because you can't get them out of the back line, and that means that an Eagle Claws is going to be coming down next turn. Yeah. So Killswitch has ways of dealing with those verbal wins if they come down. And the IG. Yeah, this is the best play from Birdo. I absolutely agree with this play. It plays around Eagle Claws perfectly and um, prevents your opponent from doing quite a lot. So. And Birdo's sitting in a really comfortable 20 HQ defense. 
Yeah. Uh, like as much value as Kill Switch has here, Birdo absolutely is still in this game. I mean, Kill Switch still has to regain uh, control over the front line. He has to establish units there, uh, and all that while Birdo is also playing units. So. Yep. Uh, unfortunately, you're not going to be able to get the the Type 93 into the front line this turn. But you can play it, hoping... You can play both of them, even, now that you've seen your opponent play the Eagle Claws. You can play both of them, expecting that one of them will get it into the front line next turn. You could also play Sheedon. I mean, Birdo's bombing rate is gone, and uh, does he have another way of getting rid of a Sendai? Um, I'm... I am not entirely sure. Kill Switch only has one more Type 94, which means in order to kill it with the surprise attacks... Um, he would need to find his last copy of Type 94, but yeah, I don't know if Birdo has a way to get rid of Sendai. The Raiding Brigade is gone, the Bombing Raid is gone, um, Audacity, if you get lucky, if you play it correctly. Or two Sendais of your own. Birdo has two Sendais of his, of his own. Is he going for the surprise attack here? Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think this makes <clears> sense. <throat> Ooh, this is a tough one. Probably makes sense to get rid of the Martyr. Maybe even play both mm. types now that the... Hmm, interesting. Oh, Gets another mother. This Sunday has to come down on the Sheedon, right? I would be very surprised if he would not. And getting to and push it's... up the shuts in. Which, yeah. Yeah, Birdo. Is on Birdo's a sweating here. here. in a really, really tough position. You can get the favorable trade here, but then the Schutzen is just gonna wreak havoc on that poor Sendai. Uh, getting him back, uh, getting back the Marder. Yeah, the bombing raid positioning doesn't matter that much, but... There's no way to get rid of that Schutzen from the front line, and this is where we see kill switches new tech being really effective. Mm -hmm. Man, Kill Switch is going to get to eat that Sendai. And... Or even better, this Bombing Raid coming down. And that's going to seal the deal. I mean, Birdo can't come back from that. There's no way to get the... the shits out of the front line, which means that... Uh, the... Expansion is never gonna happen. Can't even really and... trade without the without the Sheedon. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, you had to go for it. Like, I I don't disagree with the Sheedon play, but and that's gonna be game. Yeah. Kill switch securing the second win in this series. Yeah. So congratulations, congratulations. to Kill Switch. Uh, Kill switch will be going to the finals, and Birdo will be duking it out with head for third place kill switch and j king will be our two finalists for the afternoon these these jagro mirror matchups have been wild um it's tough. The, I, yeah it's most certainly showed that these players have like had to really think about every moment and know what's in their opponent's deck and know when to play how to play do i have an answer for this do i have an answer for that 
Um, go, going to this last matchup, Starry, was there something specific that stuck out that gave Killswitch the advantage he was able to uh, to use to win? I think um, Schutzen. Schutzen was a pretty big deal. Being able to get that to the front line made it so that uh, pretty... I mean, I don't think that Birdo has a whole lot of answers to Schutzen in their deck. And in in a mirror match, oftentimes whoever has the heavier deck wins. Whoever has like the, the slightly more value cards... Uh, wins and that's that's what happened. So uh, kill switch playing those two shitsons pretty important in that matchup. And you talked a little bit about that where you know um, Birdo's kind of running the old school Jagro list that's worked, and then kill switch has kind of upgraded it, added a few tweaks. Um, you know the shitson two copies of it actually being being one of them. So definitely played out that way. Um, and then you know Red Sun looking at the first match we saw Birdo go into that frontline list or frontline game with. Um, nothing to play on turn one and then just ended up being behind and um kind of got steamrolled from there how important is it especially in a frontline mirror to be going first and having something to play on turn one because otherwise you're down cards and probably don't have the front line i would say going first is super important in the mirror um but going first without one drops is kind of yeah kind of really tough kind of really tough and it's also like the further the game progresses, it is extremely hard to get back into a position where you can just keep up with the pace that your opponent is setting from, from there onwards, especially if you're lacking the one drops to do so. Um, yeah. Yeah, it really prevents you from being able to challenge that front line, which is what activates, you know, three quarters of your deck. So we saw that play out. Unfortunately, Berto will be falling to the bronze match, which we'll actually get to in just a moment. But before we get there, we do have the second of three card reveals. Uh, the third one will be right before the grand final. So stick around for that. But before we get there, we have the second card reveal for Winter War releasing on November 29th. All right, Red, run us over this one. We got a Soviet 2K order, special reinforcements, which adds a copy of your last destroyed unit to your hand. And um, I, I just love Soviet and Japanese destruction effects, so I'm sure I can cook something with that card. I just fell in love, I think. That <laughs> card is absolutely, you'll see for yourselves. Yeah. That card um... is absolutely tasty. I mean, obviously, all of us can think of, wow, this would be pretty crazy if we played it on a 270 second mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. at the same time it does add it to your hand which means you do have to spend the credits on it you know uh, it's not like it just revives it out of nowhere so it we might see it we might see it in like you know this printer deck that has been going around with the 270 seconds mm -hmm. But we might see it in something completely different because having it being added to your hand uh, instead of you know revived or added to the field um yeah it's, it's a pretty big difference so i think that's the first thing that caught my eye as well star you look at it and you go oh this is really cool oh this costs two and then pops it back into my hand so it's definitely not something you're going to be using in every situation but i i think that uh you know there are definitely scenarios where that can be hugely beneficial i also love the art of the card i think it's so cool it's so well done we've talked about the art in cards a lot but uh phenomenal phenomenal looking card as well so uh let's get moving here we got a bronze match coming up so thank you both we'll see you again for the grand finals in just a little bit but uh, let's get to the bracket first and we'll uh we'll get corn guy and thanatron ready to go here um as we've got head taking on birdo burrito uh we saw head being defeated 2-0 by j king which bought j king the finals first final spot uh kill switch just defeated birdo two to one so that gets kill switch in to the finals and uh, has birdo here in our bronze match so uh we'll get you back acquainted with the decks and the players just uh to give birdo maybe a chance to uh go take a walk get some water run to the uh, little boys room and just uh shake it off to get ready for this bronze match because this is a big deal here you uh you walk away with, with a cash prize if you finish third and you just you get a couple diamonds if you finish fourth and uh diamonds are nice but uh in-game diamonds are not quite as good as cold hard cash so Let's uh why don't why don't we just dive right into it? Let's uh Corn, let's start with you. Let's bring up Head's uh deck list here. We can get a little refresher as to what the lineup looks like. You uh you may have to click the little microphone button there, Corn. Oh, my bad. Um 
I was just way too excited to jump into this as <laughs> Head is looking for redemption on this German deck. We probably are going to have his Soviet deck banned. Um, interestingly enough, he does have the Soviet France matchup uh, with Birdo, but those probably will get banned if we're following true to the trend. So Head is saying, don't fail me now, Southern Plan. High roll. So this is the bronze match. So there's actually no bands in it. Everybody gets to bring everything. Oh. So we are going to see both of these Soviet lists uh, on both sides actually make it through, which uh, just makes things a little bit more interesting. Oh, pardon me. Pardon me. Oh, good. Yeah. So, yeah, th that will definitely be an interesting match. But like I said, Head is just looking for this German match uh, to go a little bit better. And I'm, I'm all here for it. Awesome. Um, anything else you want to highlight through uh, through Head's lineup here? Yeah, we've seen we've seen Jagro come into play. Um, he does have the Schutzens like kill switch, so that could uh, come into play versus Birdo again. And um, I'm always a big fan of the KV one plus Phony War uh, for finisher. Um, and you know, hopefully, we get to see that play because. Uh, it's one of my the most uh, enjoyable plays you can do and pull off in cards. All right, let's take a quick flip over to Birdo Thanatron. We did just see Birdo compete, but uh, give us a little uh, little reminder of what these uh, these three decks look like. So I think the most interesting thing, right, is uh, if there was bands, which there are not, but if there was bands, we'd probably see the Soviets banned again. That's the theme of the day, and I believe it would have continued. Without the bands, we're guaranteed both players playing Soviet France, which is very interesting. If we get a Soviet France mirror, that will be uh, incredible. I couldn't tell you the last time I've seen that or if I've seen that. Uh, but Birdo Soviet France, uh, the two, or I'm sorry, the three Rimas and the three Defend in Depths uh, providing possibly a lot of value. Uh, it'll be interesting if the defending depths can uh, turn into a lot of value. It's possible that he's going to be facing, uh, you know, Jagro or uh, some more aggro decks with uh, that deck, and therefore probably not the thickest hand to get that kind of value. But still, uh, plenty of good stuff in there, and of course has all that late game juice, an ISU board clear possibly uh, Yosef from the guards, possibly two Yosefs with his red banner. And then we move on to uh, his Jagro. What we see here is, you know, as in the last game, uh, Birdo does not have a Schutzen. He's going against Jagro that once again will run a Schutzen. So that's very interesting. Uh, we'll see if maybe uh, next month Birdo is like a full convert to Team Schutzen after this uh, tournament, or if he can kind of uh, maybe stem the tides there. And then... Uh, the third deck is uh, for Birdo, once again, a good U.S. frontline uh, with the Eagle Claw Splash that a lot of players have been using. And here you can see that uh, he also has uh, the Martyrs for Draw and the normal German things you would expect, uh, as well as the Blitzkrieg. So we'll see if he can make that work. U.S. frontline has been rolling all day. Uh, it's been getting wins all day. Everybody that's played it, I think, has been able to find a win with it just about. So we'll see if that can continue. Right on, Thanatron. Thank you so much. Now, uh, again, no bands. We are so looking at a Conquest format. You do have to win with all three of your decks. And I, uh, you know, we've, we've had the Soviet list banned over and over again. So now I'm looking at this, right? And I'm going, mm -hmm. Birdo's got Jagro and Birdo's got the frontline list on top of the Soviet control deck. Is Birdo at a bit of a disadvantage, Corn, since he's got two very aggressive decks and had, I mean, the German mid-range, you've got some flexibility there, can maybe, uh, you know, take an advantage. But um, do, do you think that Birdo's in a worse situation, given that he's got to get one of these two non-Soviet non lists through? Or is he going to rely on, like, that Soviet maybe mirror matchup to make that happen? Uh, no one's at a disadvantage at this point. They've proven that they have what it takes to win with the decks they're comfortable with. I mean, they're at the third place of an OCC clash. So, you know, it's going to come down to to some luck, but you have to give yourself the opportunities with what you have to get lucky when it comes. And they've proven they can do that. Absolutely. Uh, Thanatron, any, any matchups here as you're looking at these six decks that you're thinking like, hey, I want to get my... 
whatever list, my my frontline list in front of that mid range or or anything like that. Is there anything if you're either of these players, you're like, oh, I really want to get this, or I really want to avoid this matchup. I think Berto would like to uh, line up that mid range against his Soviet control uh, because his other two decks are both really aggressive. Uh, you could even maybe say that he would maybe get the front line. Maybe would be his first choice for that uh, for that mid range, but the Soviet control, if not the front line. Uh, I think that's what is going to be kind of the linchpin of this match. Uh, I think if you see Head get a win with that deck, he is going to win the match. I don't think that we're going to see a scenario where, let's say, Head uh, happens to lose two to three and has a win with that deck. I think if you see Head get that win, uh, then we're going to see Head win the match. So uh, how Birdo lines up against it, whether he wants to kind of go heavier with the control and kind of turtle against it and try to win late game, or if he thinks that, you know, U.S. frontline can just value uh, uh, all day and just move and blitz and value and get low op costs and all the good thing and draw all the good things U.S. frontline does. Uh, so I think it'll be it'll be really interesting to see what happens. So playing off of that, and, and Corin, you had talked about how this is Head's opportunity to get kind of redemption with that Germany mid-range deck. Do you say like, hey, I'm going to start with this. I'm going to go with the Germany mid-range. If I'm going to win this series, I need to get a win with this deck and I'm going to lead off with it. Or are you thinking like maybe I get something a little bit more comfortable like Jagro uh, and come back around to it later? I'd have to imagine that both players are going to start with the Soviet decks and just jostle to see who can get that first Soviet win. Um, definitely think that uh, that is a likely uh, matchup. Um, and then after after that Soviet deck, let's say he goes Soviet, gets the win, then probably he would pivot to it. Um, but that's that's what I would uh, foresee as this as this matchup. Well, we're actually not going to see that. So we are going to see Birdo lead with the front line to Thanatron's point. That one's been on fire so far today. And uh, Head's coming out with that Jagger list. So let's see how this plays out here in our bronze match. So we're definitely not starting with the Soviet mirror, Soviet France mirror of my dreams, but I do think that maybe <laughs> it's coming. We have a good chance. We're not, neither player is playing it. So, you know, they could definitely line up against each other. It's going to be a really interesting set as both guys need a win with every deck, right? There's no bands. So you have to find that victory. Two one drops for head. Not bad. Early ad audacity, not bad. Birdo, two one drops himself. Pretty good starting hands. I wouldn't call either of these a high roll, but I wouldn't call either of these a low roll by any means. If you're a Birdo here, you're very comfortable going second into this matchup. You can clear the front line, and then you have another 164th to buff a Greyhound. Uh, but, you know, Head's hand is decent too. So, no, no, uh, no early RNG um, issues for either player. Yeah, I'd really like to see the Greyhound come down from Birdo. I assume that's what he is going to do so that next turn he can set up that uh, one drop zero op yeah. infantry for the buff. No, he just takes uh, his one to one trade. Yeah, because he has another one in hand, so he can do that play next turn and prevent any expansion draws this turn or Panzer 35T triggers. Well, I wouldn't say any expansion draws, right? Uh, plenty of one drops and expansion only costing one. So it's not out of the realm of possibilities that Head would be able to, to necessarily just pull that draw off. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't think it's necessarily wrong. Myself, I think I might have tried to greed a little bit more uh, to try to get both of my buffs. Uh, but the other side of that was that was a bicycle boy, right? So that was Fury. Uh, it was going to have two attacks. If he comes out with a buff wagon, suddenly you lost four health, you know, on turn two. So uh, I don't think that a risk averse play is ever a bad play. And Head having two key cards in hand, <clears throat> the Audacity and the Martyr, which have two defense. So he may feel comfortable playing them. However, Pathfinders in Birdo hand is a immediate response and a strong one at that. This I'm is also considering. this is also a uh, 
a lighter uh, matchup. You got the U.S. lighter versus the, uh, oh, that's the true. other lighter. So, um, and that's a big deal. Bronze match, right? One of these guys is not going to get money. They're going to get diamonds. They're going to cry themselves to sleep into their 750 diamonds, buying more bayonets and table props to soothe their woes. Yeah, and that's a, that's a, a good play from head trading out the front line. Um, you know, Birdo can't respond with the Pathfinders yet, but, you know, this this trade does look <clears throat> very, very strong, able to clear the board. No Shermans yet for Birdo, so he's not really too worried about not having anything in the front line yet. Um, maybe we see that fifth Rangers come down. Yeah, the not Audacity. audacity. That makes a lot of sense, but... It does, but this Pathfinders is going to eat right it on. up. I mean... Putting and it in the front, front line, too. Line. Yeah. And Hedge drawing dead in this match. So, I mean, he can't even respond to it. One, If he plays both of these cards, one of them is going to get bounced. If he plays one of them, it's going to definitely get bounced. I mean... And Hedge just pulling up the deck list right now, saying, all right, what yeah, am I'd like I going to do? Him, I'd like to see him check the encyclopedia quick, just to... I know. The encyclopedia in-game has a lot of helpful hints, but... I don't know if it can has you know anything. Oh, a full pass on turn a five. Full pass. Extremely bold. My man just punted. Is he floating entrapment? No, it's open deckless, so we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> now this is this is the most crucial draw. Oh, Pat, we're, that is a good draw. You can draw off the martyr. And deal with the Pathfinders. Head says, no more bounces, please. But the Sherman draw. Wow. The Sherman. Birdo's just going to keep building his advantage and likely will convert it. He can also trade out that Martyr, preventing any more draw from Head with the Rangers and still get a Panzer 35T in the front line if he wants to just do a little face damage. Uh, or, yeah, even the Greyhound up there is maybe even a better choice. Yeah, and <clears throat> if that weak and do it comes down on three or more units, I mean, that is wrapping this game in a bow for Birdo. Bert Bow. Bert Bow. Trade market. You heard it here first. Head Heads. desperate for that expansion. It's not going to happen, I have to imagine. Yeah, we're not worried. Not worried about not getting a 35T op cost reduction. We'll pay it. We'll pay the cost. Ooh. And the Jasco pool will completely nullify the signal regiment were it to, were it to be found. We'll see if he gets two more consecutive Jaskos for a full TB. <laughs> yeah, this... Oh, but the expansion comes down. And not what you want to see off of it. Definitely not what you want to see. For him, yes. <laughs> Crack that encyclopedia open and, and fight, figure out how to get out of this one. <laughs> You look in there for, for answers for, for calm. You know, they're never Birdo, there, but it helps. <laughs> Birdo's got to be feeling pretty comfortable getting this, this frontline win before it can be challenged by Pedal Yakov. And the frontline fire just keeps on rolling. And, and as you draw expansion, your chances at winning have completely diminished. Not what you want from a card called Expansion. 
That was a really good analytic play. It's nice that you have the whole analytics department behind you to come up with that one. That's a really nice we can do it. Tons of stuff on the board there. That was definitely a win more we can do it. But at this point, I think everything that's Birdo. Win more. Yeah, everything that everything that's not hitting face for Birdo is win more right now. And Head says, I'm okay, we can uh he finally found on. the correct encyclopedia page on the surrender button. <laughs> But yeah, great, great win by Birdo. You know, going second, he was able to capitalize on the early units, trade them out, and build a board. And, you know, Head wasn't able to build up any steam. It was very one-sided. And that's got to be crucial, getting that front line in before the Soviet uh, matches come down to, to threaten front line's deployment effects. And Birdo probably doesn't want to play Jagro into these decks. So I would, yeah, I would oh. expect to see Birdo pivot here to control. And I wonder if Head thought that as well. And if Head thinks that he can hang with this control late game, hopefully stunt it with credit denial. Uh, I'm, I, I wonder if this is the matchup that Head had wanted and expected. Or if we're more more in a uh, uh, just sort of happenstance situation. And if you're Birdo here, you got to be really happy with the first two matchups. You know, I I feel like he would prefer to face this German deck with the Soviet, especially since frontline is gone. Absolutely, uh, I don't think that I'm getting my uh, Soviet France mirror match though. So. I uh, will have to wait. Well, Another I mean, it's still possible. Head can, head can win this and then force a Soviet mirror match and keep us all here a little bit longer. Certainly. We're really thinking about if he wants to put this brand down. And he chooses to. And... This Aichi has got to be pretty comfortable not having any supply shortages to threaten it. But then again, there is a confusion to to steal it. Confusion pretty interesting. I uh, don't know if you pop it now uh, just to get the other version out and maybe set up the defend and death play next turn, but uh, I, I don't think that's the move. Birdo with a full pass here. Birdo Much just more saying reasonable pass on three than five. I mean, the confusion to trade wouldn't be the worst because he he really wants to have that Bryansk and that that uh, T sixty on board turn five to get the the Rima mobilized trigger. But turn five, Birdo might not have five credits to play it, you know, because Head does have that Southern plan locked and loaded in hand, ready to looming. You know, looming. The om the omni ominous ominous? Ominous turn four Southern plan. It's so Omnivore. ominous. It's it's a omnivore, you know? It it it, it's, it eats everything. It's the omnivore of credit. Cause it eats your opponent's credit slot, but it buffs your own. Yeah, we'll we'll roll with that. Thank you for humoring <laughs> me. <laughs> oh, another Bransk is good. Uh, T60, though, coming down first. All of these are good uh, Rima targets, right? Uh, Birdo's going to guard up. He is going to turtle a little bit. And once those Briansks get any kind of mobilized, if they become one attack Briansks, that's really good because then it starts trading with its body as well as with its destruction effect. Of course, that, those Remas are even further away. As you said, the money is now starting to get messed with. Yeah, and I'd imagine Head would love to start buffing his Aichi with the 1 first, but little does he know, the confusion can also profit from a buffed, a buffed Aichi. A 
a tense moment of silence. The yeah, players and, are considering deeply. Ed using the full clock just to sort of plan out his moves, maybe think ahead. Oh, man. A Chaika to deny the bomber shenanigans. Chaika Briansk is going to be really good here. And if he can Rima out of this as well next turn, even if that Chaika is no longer a Chaika, if it becomes that Ishik from the destruction effect, the hatchling plane, as I've called it a couple times, that is going to be really good. That Chaika is basically in there for Aichi. Like, that's why it's there. And it, it just it comes, it does its job. It's just, now the Aichi has to deal with it, and then Aichi has to deal with the next fighter. Yeah, a lot of the, the choices that we've been seeing in this meta have been revolving around the Aichi. I mean, the Eagle Claws, you know, the, I, the Chaikas, all meant to slow down that, that bomber. And we do see Head with the Flamponzer in hand, and the only card it will be able to actually target with its deployment effect will be the Engineer Battalion, the Soviet Engineer Battalion. So it's not that valuable in this matchup. Erdo would love to use a Confusion on a Martyr, but unfortunately there's nothing to kill both the Martyr and the other unit and get him a draw. Not really the cleanest plays. He could perhaps do two of the trades, but yeah, I agree with the play of just getting the Rima out. I think that's absolutely the best scenario. He could maybe make a case for taking the Aichi's first form out and putting down the Aichi's B form while you still have the Ishik up and guarded, but I like getting the mobilized down. Yeah, I mean, when in doubt, guard it out. And Head here is looking for any more a, a credit denial. Not having it, but, you know, it has a formidable, for it. formidable board of guards to deal with that also have mobilized. That's not what you want when you're, you know, trying to deal damage at the HQ, you know. Since he doesn't really like any of his answers, you'd think maybe he'd go looking for some. He could do that with either a Panzer 3H, or he could even just throw the Fulkwolf down so that he gets one draw and at least has a big body to play with. And here comes the Heinkel, the third option. Ah, and he will buff it with the infantry. That's actually a really nice play. Cleans the Ishik up. Gets his draw, survives, value trade. And I have to say, if I was playing, would you prefer to be Birdo in this situation? I mean, Head Head has units and he has hand size, but I think what are they what are they going to do? Yeah, with the partisans and the confusion as well, right? It's only a matter of time before Birdo finds valuable plays for those cards. And the thing is, is he's going to have that time. He's turtled out. He has time to sit. He's got guards, and he's got health, and he's got removal. So those plays are going to probably happen, just a matter of time. And once, uh, once you know, heads boards start to get wiped, it's going to come down to how valuable those full cliffs can be as just big five fives that can trade. Yeah, and Birdo did name this deck Bloody Baguette, and he's really, you know, showing us that, you know, this combination of... Soviet and France is nothing to be laughed at. Um, that does use the confusion there. He doesn't get the uh, uh, martyr as like a kill, but he does get rid of the Heinkel with the draw bomber being, you know, probably even better than the martyr. Uh, it's not going to take return damage, so you can actually use it over and over again to keep picking that draw up. And that draw is selection draw rather than just the next card on your deck. So a lot of. A lot of good uh, threat assessment there by Birdo, taking out the superior draw engine, even if it wasn't great, and also being mobilized to the Martyr, but that's neither here nor there. We're going to see a strong 
Uh, shit's in trigger. But these, you know, the this French, this Soviet versus German standoff is still very tense. You know, they're staring each other down, say, you take the front line. No, you take the front line. And then Head says, I'll take the front line. And defend in depth, uh, you know, are going to be super valuable here. They're they're doing almost what eight or nine damage for only three costs. Basically, any unit that head can put down, Berto can remove for three right now, holding two copies. So that looms pretty large, pretty well. Yeah, and one of head's main win conditions, the comet, being able to deal damage at the HQ and retreat isn't going to be too valuable in this matchup if Birdo can maintain three guards, count them, on the battlefield at all times. Yeah, this talk's an okay mill. It, obviously, if it comes out on the BM, then that's a huge victory for Head, but otherwise, probably just gets uh, tanked by some of those beefy units with not much of a problem. Yeah, and we're Could've reaching been... the we're reaching the point where the credit denial is not going to be too valuable anymore. So he's only going to have to settle for one Southern plan. And like we said, when the credit denial doesn't deny, you can flush it down the Nile. And the second Rima is going to suck up those two pins for that full pin kill. Ooh. <laughs> this this uh winter offensive can be a huge could, board reset. Could be huge. You know, and unlike the German Maelstrom, this will deal damage to the Schützen. And the HQs. Interesting that Berto didn't just spend three to defend in depth the Schutzen. Um, perhaps saving those for the Folklifts? I mean, I'm pretty sure that the 5-5 five, five bodies are the biggest thing that Head can throw. Yeah, Head's going to be checking his deck list and find <clears throat> that there is no doubting to worry about. Especially considering he doesn't have a British ally. Going for the six six perhaps, or to go comfortably into the Briants. Yeah, well, maybe floating those three credits could telegraph that Birdo is sitting on the one or offensive, and Head has to be at least expecting it a little bit with Birdo reaching eight credits. And wow, that Briansk says, "I'm going down, but I'm taking two of you with me." And you know, this, this is a really way. nice way to sort of cycle his board into a new board. If this gets, you know, if Birdo does four damage to himself to destroy this board, it still clearly works out for head. All these low damage and low health units, he's, he's got huge planes coming, so he's not too worried about if this board just yeah. gets sacked. And Birdo almost has to do it. He, I mean, his, Birdo, his other players here is basically just Rima and Pedal, and that's not great. Yeah, he's forced into it, but at the same time, I feel like he's struggling, trying to pull up Google Maps, trying to find that road to Berlin. It would, it would be so much nicer to be able to have road to Berlin up and get get three health back on that rebate trigger from road to Berlin. Now here come the big fighters. And this has to be where Berto just starts spending these defending depths. Yeah, I mean, six health, but Head doesn't have too many Blitz units. I mean, he does have auto cannon, but he can't play six units and auto cannon. You know, this would have been a great turn if he had Comet, but unfortunately, this this German deck has yet to oh, maybe draw he's looking absolutely for it. perfect. Yeah. If he finds it, no, he doesn't find it. I was going to say, if he finds it, Thanatron gives away something to chat, but... I have nothing. <laughs> um, 
that that's good. Uh, we, we like like we expected. We take out we take out the big fighter. We can't let that live. Those are what the defending depths are for. We put the big five five tank in the front line. Give ourselves a little bit of breathing room. Not in Comet range. Comet would only, you know, Comet's a two turn lethal at this point. So if we see Comet once, we can Rima and protect ourselves. You know, these these are these are what Birdo's thinking. But Head just he's got to find six damage, and he's got every card that you know. He's got one of everything that is in his that, deck. That bait. FW the, though is a good play to to throw that tank back into the hand and push up for some face damage, setting up all kinds of nasty lethal lines. And that's why you pick a Yag Bomber out of your draw options. What if Comet was in there too and had chose Yag Bomber over Comet just absolutely making the most precise decisions. Berto would love a one damage to all. He could have his ISU clear, but he doesn't. He's gonna have to Rima here. Nah, he says that. And you'd be able to, yeah, or I'm sorry, you'd be able to auto cannon me anyway. You'd have to Let's imagine Jaking is Jaking is messaging Birdo in his DMs right now and saying, "See, I told you the Italy ally is better." But yeah, you know, head evening it out. You know, when we we suspected that Birdo had the advantage, um, maybe we still can see that Soviet mirror. I mean, would you play Jagro? right now Oof. yeah i don't think either player wants to play jagger into soviet uh, uh france so i think soviet france mirror almost has to happen yes yeah yes, rejoice this is rejoice. the content that you came here for soviet control mirrors let's soviet let's... france super mirror there's going Somebody to be so much mobilize going down. Run a comparison oh, on these decks. Man. Let's see how many cards apart they are. Man. Just when you thought your day couldn't get any better. The Soviet mirror. My day got I... better when I, when I didn't run a 5k this morning. Well, I mean... That was, I am not in 5k shape. I would say that's the rest <laughs> race of my season. <laughs> that was a struggle, but it's not about my struggle. It's about the struggle for third place and to get paid. Mr. Steal Your Girl early on curve can be really, really great, but only really a Chika is the only option. There's a difference in the lists. Head with a... wow. A guard that you don't see very often outside of things like draft or or maybe uh, popper or lower ranks. But I like it, you know. It just ate a bloody circle and a zuka. Well, it the Cossacks. Cossacks. Yeah, Cossacks. Uh, really nice uh, draws here as well, right? We've got Birdo with an armored train to sit on, uh, and the naval brigade as well. Heads, heads version looking a little more aggressive with French cards like Algiers, which Birdo is also not taking. Yeah, and we're seeing a train come down, and not any train. This one's got armor. Heavy armor, one to be specific. And it says really Choo Choo. Interesting here. Choo Choo and kicks out one light infantry with, you know, it's always great to have heavy train and engineer battalion down, so you can just eat up that HQ health while these light infantry people are rushing out of the train into not the best situation that I have to mention. Their sacrifice does not go uh, unrewarded uh, as two HQ will two HQ health and the defend in depth will do five damage to the armored train that comes out pretty quick. Interesting. We saw Birdo hold those for so long to use them against big threats and head coming out early saying 
you know, my deck is a little bit more aggressive. Oh, I've wow. built Soviet France to do a little bit more damage, so I need to. We see the thirty. Get rid of that guard, Mister. Th we see the thirty ninth rifles in Birdo's hand, or as as Team Heavy calls it, Mister Steal Your Girl. And will it? You know, what is a good target? I mean, it can take the Chica, and really, <clears throat> excuse me, it can really profit from it. You know, it steals two units in one. Yeah, you wonder if Birdo is maybe waiting for Briansk, if he'd like to sort of swipe a guard that Head can't rely on uh, to, to Turtle, if that's the play he's looking for, right? Uh, either one, uh, or both, both great plays. Early prediction yeah. here. Do you think we see a fatigue victory with Phony War? No, I don't think that it's going to last that long. I think that Head's version of this deck is extremely viable, but I think that the way that it is built, it's going to maybe lose here to the thicker, more control-type version that Birdo has. Like, the Algiers and things like that are, are really good, but, like, uh, they're also sort of smaller and faster. So it's definitely going to be interesting. It also could just come down to who draws, you know, who draws their big guns. If someone's able to find guards in Red Banner, that's going to be huge for this matchup. And then there's the the terrifying fright of playing Big Soviet against Big Soviet because if you don't have your Red Banner, they might partisan your guards and Red Banner your guards. And now they have three potential Yosefs and you have none. You just go home and cry in the shower. It's terrible. I've definitely been there before. Um, my tears have, you know, have no limit when it comes to my 272nd getting stolen and then red bannered. I mean, that, that's, that's the worst. I don't have it. It's, it's just simple as that. And head doing his best to chip away at these, these Rimas. Only one partisans for head, uh, so you know it's it, it, the 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 combo that you do have to worry about so hard when playing your big guards uh, is maybe a little less likely. I believe Birdo only has one partisans as yeah, well. Yeah, I can confirm that. And what I'm interested in is seeing can someone get a huge ISU board clear as opposed to the other player. Erdo getting all this early engineer's health value as well. How much is that going to play deep into this? Well, seven H seven seven points of damage at this point. Make it make it nine, I'd imagine, pretty soon. Yeah, a tense moment. Birdo calculating all the different lines. His Rima is on its last live. Will he draw for answers? You can't really play too many options. You know, too many different cards could just get eaten up by that artillery. Yeah, he'd love to see a second sickle. And you wonder if he'll just sickle the arty to sort of get that process started, maybe. Good call from Panatron. See what we get. The ISU is big. All right, I, I I like this play. Uh, just throwing the naval out. Um, you know, sometimes you 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 get like a huge, you know, you get an eight seven Yosef and you kill that with a naval and you feel great. But uh, a pesky arty that literally can't be targeted by any other units. Uh, it's it's still a get. It's still it's still a great confirmed kill for your naval brigade. Bang for your buck. Plus the 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 buff. Yeah, I mean, Birdo, that was a great turn from Birdo to eliminate that threat. Um, but, yeah, the the threats continue. Head can actually go to... right through the 5-5 five, five, uh, ambush, though, which is very interesting and effective here for Head. You know, Algiers in the front line is probably where it's most potent, but you almost never see it there. 
And we can get a really wacky play here too. Algiers is three costs, so Birdo has the ability to throw a confusion on that bad boy. Uh, get some get some of his own buffs and then whip it into something. And head with two bloody sickles in hand says, All right, light infantry, I don't care if you go to three. It doesn't bother me. Just takes the trade. The trade is good enough here. And he will get a nice mobilized buff on a 5 5 tank. It'd be very useful. Second Algiers for Head. Head might want to just draw here as well, whether he chooses to do that of his option card or if he starts these sickles, cycling these sickles. Oh, Defending Death is a good pull. Second sickle. We're going right through that 4 2. You know, Defending Depth. Exactly five cards for Birdo. I mean, I'm gonna be surprised to not see Head do it here, and then maybe uh, uh, see what what kind of elites he can maybe. I was almost get. worried that Birdo was gonna end this soon, but Head saying not so fast. We have more Soviet France gameplay to see. And he finds uh, another BM. Uh, oh, no. Birdo Man. is going to be sad if uh, he plays uh, Winter Warfare before the second BM comes down. And I'd imagine he doesn't. I think Head's going to have to play that here pretty shortly. But, Good but Birdo's, Birdo's hand looks really reactive rather than proactive. Oh, I don't, don't think he takes the second ISU here. Maybe he takes an armored train, which is going to allow him to turtle more. Uh, no, second ISU says, uh, give me the clears. Yeah, another name drop. Heroes of the Soviet Union, or or as some more some other prominent members of the community refer to it, uh, Heroes of the Storm, not confused with the other game, finding some great value for Birdo. Thinking about throwing his Briance down, but says, mm -hmm. you know, no threats. I'm cool. I'm comfortable. Getting your Engineer Battalion this late in the game, uh, you're all the way on turn 10, like Head has just drawn his, definitely feels much less effective. Wow. And the clear is set up for one of those ISUs. Look at Birdo's hand. I've never seen a more reactive hand. He's ready for anything Head can throw at him. Multiple ways to wipe the board. I mean, he can he can even take the engineer battalion to have double dual wielding engineers healing him. And instead, what a what a play by Birdo. Just throws down a guard. I'm not committing anymore right now. I'm cool with what I have. I'm holding reactions. I'm going to react. What you got right now, not worth reacting to. Let me see something else, pal. And actually, it looks like Birdo does not have Road to Berlin in his list. Correct me if I'm wrong. Oh, and no Atlas would have found it. Yeah. What more does Head want to commit to this board, not knowing that Birdo can just basically shred any board shown and will? I yeah, think we're going to see an ISU clear here. If anyone in chat was trying to step away to get refreshments, don't go yet. I mean, this is part of like, maybe the swinging point of this bronze match.
Maybe setting up, yeah, setting up, since he has two ISUs, he's setting up this ISU without the one damage to all, allowing him to pair that with the second ISU that Head is not aware of. Really, really smart play by Birdo. Now able to just pocket that board clear for the rest of the game. Yeah, I agree. I mean, Birdo's hand is heavy, but Head's hand doesn't look like it's ready to take this match, uh, you know, you know, take command of it. It looks kind of light. Head's not holding anything like tractor factories to sort of like gut out any sort of victory in the end here as well. Uh, he, he doesn't uh, have tractor factories. Correct. Yeah, he's uh, only really got the KV left and his guards. Uh, and besides that, it's just sort of some some smaller things. Erdo draws his KV first. Big Soviet guns, I think, are about to, to play a role here. Yeah, but defending depth is... Our, ooh, here we go. Dual-wielding engineers. Health going all the way up. Big and gains in the market here. Birdo says, destroy my ISU. I dare you. I'll take that four health rebate. And one health gone from head. That's a five health swing for a sickle. That is like, what do you think the spread is on this match? <laughs> Are you taking Birdo plus five health off that? <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, we're we're at turn 12 now and it still feels like both guys are still packing a good bit I, again i just it seems that birdo's deck uh is just built a little thicker and, and we're seeing the benefit head is unloading his hand to set up a phony war replenish um well if the kv comes down birdo recognizes yeah. it and the kv comes down that is and that would that be, gonna be a block yeah, true, but it can still get defend in depth. Defend I'd imagine conf confusion, steal the steal the chai cut and gain four health and the 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 second stage of it. Sounds like a good play, but you know, Birdo has so many options to consider. Still holding on to his big AoE as well. We mentioned that he's pocketed that ISU clear. He's still holding on to four damage to awe as well. You're going to take that second BM up and say, no more, no more Blitz Arties for you, please. And he does see the setup, throws the KV down, but as you said very astutely, how many cards is he able to bail out to here? Nope, five cards. Oh, we can no longer. No. He well, sees it all. He sees every angle. Defend this depth. Oh, it doesn't matter. Draws a hammer. What a great draw from head. The hammer will come out first, and then probably the uh, right into the draw. He's no longer worried about it. Still going to take five maybe from the the infantry in front, but yeah, I mean he's that. Grief, though. Oh man, I mean. He, he, that might be phony war, but you know this war is in in full force going on right now. And draws a, draw, like... draws a heavy hand. I was gonna say, you know that that's a that's a good refill. Spend in depth, pretty good mill for head to see, but uh, definitely could be better. Something like big guards or big Rima, something like that. Uh, at this point, though, it feels like even if Head is able to drag this to fatigue, he'll he'll just lose in fatigue, especially if he's not able to do anything about Birdo just continuing to benefit four health from every unit he loses. Yeah, but I think it's important. <clears throat> excuse me. I think it's important to to play it all the way out till the last card is played because you never know. Um, you could be. Frust frustrating your opponent, you know, and make them. Oh, uh, we'll see another blitz already. I spoke too soon.
Petal Yakov could be strong here to deny the ISU. And a big difference in the thickness of these decks and what head is missing is that head is missing the board clears. Head does not take a uh, an ISU clear. A head does not take a winter warfare for damage to all. Not only does he not take them, he has to deal with Birdo who has two. Two ISUs and one winter offensive. He's making good use of that Algier buff. Finally finds his guards, maybe hoping to find his Red Dawn. Shadow Yakov with, with uh, Naval Brigade already gone on both sides now. Uh, not a whole, whole lot for Petal Yakov to really catch. Oh man, 43 health is really widening the spread. But now... Yeah, we're going to start to see engineers used used as real infantry here. I mean, I why not? Health. You have enough health and moving. you can maybe trick head into overcommitting into the board. I mean, this is there, there is a skirmish going on this weekend where engineers with four operation costs are really good, and you could see them in the front line on based on that skirmish. But I wouldn't expect to see this in an OCC. Heads kind of confused. Maybe like what am I? What do I do against a four eight engineer? He's just standing there menacingly in the front line, growing larger by the day. He he still has mobilize. <laughs> do you think you, we get a pedal Yakov guarded by the? No, we're gonna see. Oh, get the pedal Yakov down. Man. At least covers ISU, but Birdo. No, not the winner offensive. Has the winner offensive, so he'll trade With out the, the board. clear from the engineers. And remember, Head doesn't know that oh, there's a no. second ISU, so Head might think that it's safe to commit. He hasn't found his red banner, but when he does, oh, he might no. throw his double Yosefs out, thinking that, like, okay, I've seen the board clears, and this is my only shot. And if he does, Berter will gleefully blow that board up, except for the fact, again, second pedal Yakov, which... Oh, no. The defend depth top deck, we are no longer worried about pedal Yakovs. They are not blocking ISU effects. Everything Man. back in play as it was. So, oh, the, uh, not back in play. The other pedal Yakov. Yeah. This is... This is like watching a... 25 minute long ping pong rally between two grandmaster ping pong players. This is identical twins on a seesaw. I mean, this is. I like Ooh, that. Birdo. Birdo with the combo. Partisans in hand for head, but Birdo would never play into it. Not this late. He knows. The only way 272 is coming out is if it's getting red bannered. Oh man, the pressure builds, and like you know, it, we're getting closer to a, a phony war fatigue, and that thirty nine health is is really got to be a solid investment at this point. And Birdo probably checking the deck list and say, what what risk do I have playing my two seventy second? And the answer is none. Go ahead <clears throat> and summon. Two big dogs. Man. Head can try to survive here for a little bit and possibly set up a scenario where he can maybe partisans one. But if he does so, he has to make sure the one he partisans dies on the attack that he or on the trade that he makes with it. 
Otherwise, Partisans would send it back to hand, which would just spawn a new Yosef on the support line. I mean, this is so intense, I'm losing my voice. I don't I have. I'm almost speechless. That's the pollen, actually, in the air. Oh. The pollen. I'll have to talk to you later about that. Maybe we can check the air quality, but... Right now, the air quality is pretty thin as they're running out of decks, de cards in their deck. Yeah, you're definitely going to see those Call of the Colonies just get ripped for health at this point. Head throws his own guards out without a red banner. Birdo used his, so he knows that he's safe. However, there is a regular Partisans. Not really any targets. That Birdo could do anything with, nor is the board laid out in a way that would allow him to do anything truly tricky. Yeah, and one thing to note, Head's hand is very low, and he is very vulnerable to Birdo playing a phony war and forcing him to, to draw up the remaining cards in his deck. I would almost like to see the confusion used here to kill the... Briansk, I understand that it's not a great use of money at this point, but the Yosefs are so cheap to operate, and I don't really know what you're going to get out of that confusion anyway. You might as well throw four damage into something. I'd say that's Maybe an astute, the, an astute observation. The that uh, into the Rima, and then the Petal Yakov into the Rima would kill the Rima, and then you can start moving your big, big Yosefs up. But yeah, but I think we're gonna. The time pressure getting to Birdo, you know, yeah, he's taking full clock here for this turn. He, he's he's not going to move the tanks because he wants to play around the partisans. He's content to challenge the front line from his support line. Knows he has the long game, but Head doesn't know. That we know, that Birdo knows, or there are does known he? knowns and known unknowns, and then unknown unknowns. Yeah, I fully agree. <laughs> and this call to the colonies is kind of a dead card. It's, the health really isn't worth it at this point, and you, you don't really want to draw. And just loading the board. Going all in. Man, this is this is the so this is the full Soviet France experience. Experience. Oh my this is Birdo truly I'm, taking this time here to to think out all of these trades. I'm at a loss of words. Eight more health, little icing on that cake. Wow. Head, head doesn't even really care about Pedal Yakov at this point. Kind of the least of his concerns. He could maybe partisans the 8-3 tank. And then for two more credits, he could run it up into the 8-7. And it will die and take that down. And then he could maybe kill that in a number of ways. You know, and this would be a great play for Head if Birdo didn't find an ISU from the aptly name heroes of the soviet union it's uh, uh yeah with him not i would imagine here that we're gonna see the kv into the yosef because head you know two damage per draw is not gonna be what turns the tide at 42 health and wins this game he needs to get rid of that yosef oh it takes out everything else first it says that birdo can make the choice Birdo can wow. give him his Yosef, but this is just going to maybe set up the 
ISU play that wins the game. If anything, yeah. killing the Petal Yakov was a help to Birdo. And I can only imagine Head's reaction when he sees this is flabbergasted. I mean, that's definitely really, really but... late draw of Mr. Steal Your Girl. No longer helpful. And Birdo really, really got the most out of that that second board clear. He said he just slowly enticed Head to push forward into the trap. And really, Head really didn't have any other oper other other anything else he could do but try to chip away that forty health HQ. Excellent, excellent play by Birdo. Mr. Steal Your Girl will most likely steal someone's girl here, but it will be too little, too late. Oh, and Red Banner was on the bottom. Not what you want for your last card. Big burst damage incoming. One, to be exact. Red Banner? For an out? Too late. My after Red Banner, the infantry unit to get a seven cost and, I don't really and know you know if if birdo top decks phony war we still might be able to see the phony war lethal oh we don't see it just pass your turn birdo <laughs> if you if you steal that you can't trade it into the the tank you can just oh he's going for the big burst damage on that and he gets it, was it his, back with his wow. child that Chica, Chica, that Chica has. Bird was like, it all. I, I've already won, and we both know this, but get your hands off my Chica. I know. It's like, we're, don't you dare surrender before I get my Chica back. And we see Birdo convert on the Soviet France matchup of the month. <laughs> Every month we do this. That's got to be maybe my my favorite game as a spectator uh, of the last months and months. That might that might have been my single game of the year. That was a lot of fun. I mean, I don't know. I it was it was so much fun that Head wants to play it again, but unfortunately, Birdo has to play the his his Jagro deck. And you wonder if we're going to see the Jagro mirror to settle all this because Birdo's going to have to play Jagro into heads uh, Soviet France that we kind of discussed in the earlier game, uh, how it's sort of built with more uh, aggressive tools that might help him out here even more to just sort of crush the aggro and then move on. You almost hate to see a match this good end in something as... Uh, I don't want to say fluky. That's not the right word, right? There's a ton of skill involved in a Jagger mirror match, but something that can be sort of anticlimactic. Yeah, decided on like the whims of uh, maybe the algorithm. That pesky, pesky mm -hmm. algorithm. And you know, Birdo getting to go first. He, he has a strong setup, and Head doesn't have the turn to Briask to to mitigate this early Jagro aggression. This is and, certainly a good start. Oh man, it, if he gets these three units to take the naval supply run buff, he is going to be sprinting into a nice payday in third place. Yeah, God expects that we're going to see uh, Kosix here take out uh, one of the smaller. Well, I mean, anything in the front line will be a value trade for it, but. If he if he trades the the Ishik, he can't do anything else anyway. So he might as well get the second unit on the board. I don't know if he saw that, but Birdo just sheathed and unsheathed his katana, and Head lost two HP just like that. It was so fast. <laughs> Going for the trade doesn't want to doesn't want to greet on the early buff. I'd imagine maybe Audacity is going to be the follow-up here. 
get rid of both units. He knows the fighter is dead, so that the way for the bomber is probably clear. What? Guards at turn four and five for head, which is going to be big against Jagra. Ed has to feel pretty confident about this deck into the Jagro match for him to have brought it to this tournament, you know, expecting expecting Jagro, and it doesn't seem like it's performing to his expectations yet. Here we go. Here's some tools. We got guards on four. We got guards on five. We got a little bit of removal. We got Kachusha. Yeah, Bomber but... is going to be a problem, if, though. If he just plays a guard, Birdo's going to enable Supply Run and then kill it with the Aichi. And I then mean, uh, get a lot of free huge attacks to face. You're not wrong. I mean, head saying, "Where are my my winter warfare?s Where are my sickles? Where are my brands? My brands. Where are my, where are my brands at? I mean, it, it's just it's just not head's day today with the way his decks are drawing. I mean, I like the Kadusha play to. You know, say, hey, attack my Kadusha. You don't want my HQ, you know, dangling a little carrot over there to sa save some health. Erdo, contemplating so many possibilities, almost all of them good. Yeah, I mean, I would say his strategy right now is win. But he is exposing himself to a board a board wipe with Winter Warfare. Not going to find it, though. Head's hand is heavy right now. You know... No Winter Warfare is actually, I believe, in Head's deck. The armored Train is, is good as long as it doesn't get Sendite or... Uh, surprise attacked here, which both are pretty likely the way Birdo's playing and drawing this this Japan yeah, deck. Looking really, really, really bleak here for Head. Just not getting the draws that he needs. And here we go. Yeah, Birdo says game time. Birdo says I'm going all in. I got aces. What you got, head? So much damage. Takes him all the way down to three with a bomber in the back line. There's no fighter for head. No three guard. Health likely means fourth place. I mean, maybe you get some health here, but then you can't even make oh. a trade. Yeah, there's not. There's <laughs> there's nothing. There's nothing. He's reading the encyclopedia on how to draw better. Really, really impressive games here by Birdo to uh, to to make sure that he's uh, filling his uh, real life pockets and not his fictional pockets. You know, but head head really did uh, really well to to make it here, and you know it it wasn't anything he did. You know, he can hold his head high. You know, it it just wasn't his day. But it, we we know head will be back. Really incredible top four. Uh, J King Birdo head kill switch is like, uh, you know, if you've got your four meta decks and your four A tier decks, that's your four meta players. Like, that's your meta top four almost. Maybe like a Vinny uh, or some of our other players that, you know, are, are definitely that we see all the, all the, all the time. But uh, obviously, guys like Tang Tang and Known Five and some really great Chinese players. So, not to take anything away from them, obviously, but that four is. An extremely common, extremely heavy, extremely practiced, extremely experienced top four. That was actually three of our four finalists from last year's World Championship. So uh, absolutely just phenomenal group. And I think that the skill comes out when you start getting those Soviet control mirrors that go on for 30 minutes and every single play they make is absolutely critical. And there's also the fatigue factor, right? Once you get to minute 25 of that match, you're you're ready for it to be done. And just who can kind of push through that is uh, is the difference maker there. And we saw Birdo, uh, an absolute pro at this, go ahead and pull off third place, which, uh, yeah, nets him 300 USD. Not bad at all. Uh, not bad at all. $750, um, uh, 750 sorry, diamonds, um, unfortunately, for head. 
Berto almost getting a dollar per minute played of Soviet Mirror, which is uh, which is, is a good rate. It's a good rate to make. I thought all thirty minutes of that match were glorious. Could have gone forty five minutes, and Absolutely. I would have only only been happier. I uh, think that might make you the only one. So uh, before we get into our grand finals, we have one more guard reveal for you. Let's go ahead and get that up on the screen here. Horn guy, why don't you take us through this British card? Glamour Boys is a, actually a great card to be revealed uh, with Head because we all think of Head as the Glamour Boy of the cards community. Um, and I'm seeing seeing the card. Uh, it's a it's a interesting card. I, I think it can fit into a lot of different formats. Here it comes uh, again. <laughs> okay. You know, I could see it played in Popper. I could see it played in um, Commonwealth decks. Uh, it's not the strongest card, but it definitely, you know, if you you don't want to see it when you've already gone through six other guards. Having the ability to carry four of them is also pretty great, right? I mean, that's a 16 defense if you're able to find them all. Uh, it's like a big Baluk, uh, or Baluch, or however that was said. Only you get more health, and then also the guard key text and a better body. Uh, pretty good for five. I think that we'll see, as you said, a lot of play in any sort of restricted format or any sort of budget kind of list. Uh, you know, Brit never short on guard. Uh, usually not short on ways to gain health. So throwing them both on on a on a decent body for five is it's not bad. Yeah, absolutely. I think to your point, it's it's kind of that budget card, show up and popper, things like that. Probably be okay in in draft and whatnot. Big body, big boy. Some uh, add some defense to your HQ feels pretty good overall. But uh, we're gonna head into our grand finals. I want to thank both of you though. Phenomenal job here. Your first OCC clash, Corn Guy Thanatron. Uh, appreciate you both tremendously. Wonderful job. Let's go get the bracket up here so we can get to the main event of our uh, afternoon, evening, dependent on where you are at. We just saw Birdo defeat Head 3-1 to one for third place, but we want to know who's going to be the grand champion here of the November OCC. Is Jay King going to be able to win it all in an effort to uh, you know, get some momentum going into the world championships? Or is Kill Switch going to pull a, a little bit of an upset here? I don't want to call it a big upset because I know Kill Switch is a phenomenal player. So uh, let's go ahead. Let's welcome back Starry and Red Sun. Let's get things underway here. So um, Starry, I know you had a similar reaction that I did when you saw the control mirror get uh, brought up. Did uh, how, how do you think that played out overall? Yeah, I mean, that was a really hard fought game. Um very impressed with both players for having the tenacity to stick through that um there were some plays that i at the time thought were like a bit questionable and then i saw like further down the road i'm like oh, okay I'm, I'm starting to see where the logic was for example Brito had an opportunity to confusion of briance regulars traded into the 272nd then partisans the 272nd traded into the kv and i was surprised to not see that come out um, but uh, yeah, I mean, keeping the partisans ended up making it so that on future turns he had answers for for stuff. So, and and Red Sun, you know, you've got like that game three, huge control match goes thirty minutes. Birdo takes the win, then goes into that game four, the Jagger list against Soviet. Is there an aspect of just like again that that mental fatigue of like i just had this hard fought match if i'm head i just came out on the losing end i gotta go do this again um does that play into some of this matchup when you're getting into like game four you got jagger coming at you and you're trying to figure out how to hold down the fort it all depends uh, <clears throat> sorry it all depends on the players um on the player's state of mind and um as we've seen in the past birdo is an extremely skilled player he's made it so far because he has this mental like fortitude to just take it this far with a deck that he's confident on and i think uh jaguar is a list uh where um, bird is extremely confident with um with that being said i think that sums it up pretty well absolutely let's get into our grand finals then. and we've got j king taking on kill switch we've seen both these players a couple times already but let's get a quick uh, refresher of the deck list here. So we got J King Starry. What is uh, J King bringing here today? 
So J King's first list is a Soviet Italy control list. Um, he is playing two copies of Five Year Plan, um, which is certainly an interesting card, as well as Kuban Cossacks, two copies of Petlyakov, and uh, three copies of Fiat G50. So there's a lot of anti aggro, anti frontline, anti aggro, just uh, stuff trying to take out these early game decks, um, which is why we've seen it like banned basically every every game up until uh, now. Uh, and then you get to have a big burst of value later in the game by playing these five-year plans. Um, but yeah, there's a couple of important key decisions to be made, but J. King seems to be going the more anti-aggro route as opposed to a heavier uh, a heavier list. Like I, I think that both of the Soviet-France lists we saw were a bit heavier than this. Uh, then we have a U.S.-Germany frontline list. Um, Super, super typical, especially from J King. Uh, no copies of Stars and Stripes, only one copy of One and Nine Combat Engineers, but instead adding a, another copy of Greyhound, adding Eagle Claws, adding Enigma, two copies of Blitzkrieg, two copies of Martyr, um, and only one copy of 99th, and only one copy of, uh, actually, zero copies of. 22nd Infantry Regiment. So going for a more aggressive start uh, and using Enigma instead of 22nd to get your value going. Lastly, we have a Britain-France mobilize list. And uh, J. King seems to really like this deck, has brought it to a couple of tournaments and has done pretty well with it. He seems to be one of the only people that really likes this deck, um, but we've seen it do pretty well today. You have two win cons. You can either try and get your mobilized guys to be very big, especially the French one cost mobilize. Um, or, of course, you can use your potezes to generate cards and um, HQ defense towards a potential Commonwealth win condition. And the fact that your opponent has to play both of these fronts at the same time makes it really, really hard to deal with. But we've seen. Uh, mobilize struggle when they are forced to deal more than like 30 35 damage if you can get your hq up above 30 to 35 uh mobilize can sometimes have a bit of a hard time getting that last 10 to 15 points worth of damage We've absolutely seen that challenge before here today by J King. So hopefully uh, this will be a different result. Let's go take a look at the other side. We got Kill Switch here. Red Sun, um, what are their three decks looking like? So Kill Switch's first deck is Soviet Italy Control, um, a deck that we've been seeing him use into great success in the past. Um, actually, many players. Um, he is, um, as I mentioned earlier, he is a good control player and um as it shows that sometimes it's worth holding on to your um best combos in the deck um to play on a in a later stage of the game to get out the maximum potential for instance um the 270 second guard and um red banner it would be such an example he is also much like jaking running the triple fiat which um trades nicely into most uh Jaguar units are, there's also quite a few um, units in um, US frontline that the G50 trades nice into. Um, he definitely is not short of uh, anti aggro tools. And yep. Yeah. So next up, we have Kill Switch Trusted Jaguar list, which, um, uh, as we've seen, uh, he's been running uh, Eagle Claws, which is, uh, to me personally, is a surprise um, this uh, tournament. But as we've seen, uh, he's been using it to uh, great with great success. And I think that's often just what makes the difference in, um, in the rematches, like the timing of the Eagle Claws coming down. Um, so... Last but not least, we have <coughs> Kills, which is US Agro List, which uh, is also running Eagle Claws, a double Blitzkrieg, um, which uh, is really helpful uh, against uh, control decks, I would 
I would say. Um, and yeah, he's going with a super light loadout, having a plethora of one drops for 160 both infantry regiments and for Greyhounds, which, um, I mean, it's not guaranteed, as we've seen with uh, his match against Birdo, it is not guaranteed that you get a one-drop, but it greatly increases the chances of uh, having a one-drop in your starting hand. Awesome. Thank you, Red Sun. Um, you know what? Stick it with, with you, actually, while we're, we're looking at these deck lists, right? We've got both players bringing the Soviet Italy control. We've got both players with their version of Frontline. you got Jagger on Kill Switch's side. You've got Mobilize on J-King's side. Based on these lineups, do you think one of those decks, kind of those swing decks between the two, is going to be uh, giving one of the players an advantage over the other? Personally, I believe um, that, I mean, both of these players are extremely skilled. Uh, with all the decks that they they bring into the tournament, um, I would believe that I see Jaking being favored on control and Killswitch being favored on uh, aggro on the frontline um, mirror. But that could just be me. That's any uh, any perspective on that story? How these kind of two lineups stack up? Um. Yeah, I'm I'm not sure if Mobilize has what it takes to take out Frontline. Um, so I think that Kill Switch might save it for later so that J King is forced to play Soviet Italy and uh Frontline first. Um and I think I, I could see a world where Kill Switch saves the um frontline deck for the end just because it seems like Mobilize is a pretty easy matchup, I think. I'm not. Don't quote me on that. I we we don't get to see a whole lot of Mobilize uh, at this level, but um, I know that Mobilize is mostly to deal with control and to deal with Jagro, and it kind of the mid range decks are where it's maybe not quite as effective. I I want to touch on something you you just mentioned where you said you know we don't see a lot of the Mobilize matchups. Is that you know? I'm assuming, obviously, Kill Switch prepared well for this this event, but is Mobilize uncommon enough that players maybe haven't had a ton of reps against it and maybe haven't prepared as much going into it? So there might be a little bit of an advantage into the, I don't want to say unknown, because it's not an unknown deck, but just a little bit of a lack of practice there? I think a lot of people play Mobilize, but I also don't think a lot of people play it well. I think that at the competitive level, there's very few players who actually uh, play the deck. And so it might not be... It's probably something that people have played against on ladder a billion times, but playing on ladder and playing versus these top-level players is very different. And I kind of would be surprised if many of these competitive players have gotten in a lot of like practice reps where you're playing against uh, one of your friends who's also a top-level player. Um, but yeah, so we will have to see. We're just waiting for the players to get in here. Uh, winner of this first place match gets 750 US dollars, second place 450. So there is a pretty big delta there. Um, pretty good incentive to try and walk away as the uh, champion of the November OCC. Red Sun, we saw the Soviet France mirror matchup in the previous series. We got Soviet Italy, the potential mirror matchup here. How would that shape up if they went head to head, other than it being a, you know, potentially a 30 minute slugfest? Well, if it comes down to the uh, Soviet Italy mirror, I see shaking slightly favored, but that is really just, uh, there's too, way too many factors that play into the, uh, into this, uh, so I'll I'll just I'll just uh, go with what I uh, what I see and let's uh, let's just jump right into the game. Well, it looks like we're gonna find out who is a slightly favorite in this mirror matchup. So uh, let's get into it. It's our grand finals of the November OCC. Yeah, these decks are almost identical. Um, Kill Switch pretty much just has a couple of cards changed from. J King's version and, and J King has been playing the same version for a while now. Um so it's gonna be really close and a, definitely a, a test of 
skill and resource management more so than it is a test of deck building or who built their deck heavier because i think as far as weight goes as far as how many high-end high value cards i think they're roughly the same um it's always nice to go second in a control matchups uh starting off with two extra cards is always nice what I find surprising is that both players decided to go with uh, two copies of uh, Five Year Plan. Kind of curious to see how that plays out, or if any of the cards get played at all. In this matchup, I don't know. Like the way that we've seen before, the last Soviet matchup that we saw today went to fatigue, and um, that's definitely something that these players have to think about. Traditionally. Um, Soviet decks have actually not played a whole lot of copies of cards like Bloody Sickle because they were so worried about going to fatigue. I don't know if you remember that, but like circa a year ago, um, Bloody Sickle was a pretty uncommon card to see, at least in multiples in these Soviet control decks, because um, you often often go to fatigue and yep. that's um, one of your primary win conditions with this deck. And each uh, bloody sickle that you play gets you closer to it. So. Yep. And Jaking with the uh, early Petnikov. Yeah, I don't know if that's like mm. particularly strong in this matchup as it hurts mm. each player equally, but bombers are never bad, right? I mean, bombers are the second best unit type in the game. So. After artillery, right? Yeah. I'd be surprised mm. to not see a uh, Bologna come out, but... Yeah. It's probably the obvious play. Okay. So... If Jaking plays his artillery, it is going to die to a... Uh... Attack in the colonies, but I think that both players only play one attack in the colonies, so that is going to be it for uh, kill switch as far as attack in the colonies go. Maybe Jaking is just using the his artillery piece to debate out the court of the colonies, so he can just cross it out on on the on the list. Yeah, I mean it's one yeah, less it's one less card that you have to worry about later in the game. Mm -hmm. Counting your opponent's removal is always important. So as far as mm -hmm. answers go, each player has at least uh, a lesser with kill switch. So kill switch has three bloody sickles, two winter warfares, two confusions, one hammer, one partisans, one ISU, one naval brigade, one thirty nine. Two lion for day, one attack in the colonies, one naval engagement. That's a lot of that's a lot of potential removal cards, mm -hmm. and that's kind of why you uh, you see these games going to fatigue a lot of the time, is because the amount of removal that Soviets have access to, especially in combination with Italy, is pretty much unparalleled by any other nation, for better or for worse. And also the amount of guards uh, that these decks play. And there is Killswitch Petlikov. Yeah, I'm curious to see what Killswitch finds off of this Heroes of the of the Soviet Union. Getting a ISU or a 272nd, or even a Yosef Stalin sometimes can have major impacts on the game because it's a card that you you it's harder to play around. You can't play around two copies of ISU and two copies of 272nd, you know, like... No, and you don't... You until, don't have... until you see what it is, um, it's it's hard to make any great guesses, and so... Yeah. Exactly. And it's usually a card that's going to eat one more removal piece. Heroes is definitely a really nice card to have in mirror matches, as long as you don't get super screwed by... Getting low roll, yeah. <laughs> yeah, getting low roll. Getting some of the so. worst elites for that situation. But I like the inclusion of that card, or like um, the so-called elite pickers in control, 
because it adds much more like um, versatility to, to the deck mm -hmm. and helps you adapting in later stages of the game. Yeah, Jay King using an attack mm -hmm. on the, attack in the colonies just to like push through this damage onto the Fetlikov. So he did. That is that's interesting. I mean, obviously, yeah. if neither player plays a fighter, then Jay King will win that war. But is that war worth spending an attack in the colonies on? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Only time will tell. Yeah, I guess we will find out in a couple of minutes. Oh, Ooh, that's a that bit kinda... of a low roll. I mean, armored train is pretty decent, but I mean, and you it... could you could maybe even pick T twenty eight and try and get two copies of like two seventy second, but that's very risky. That I think in... the conservative play is just go with another armored train. Yeah. Also, armored train uh, stones the uh, the uh, little infantry critters that can then just boost up your health and if used in conjunction with the engineers. Uh, which, uh, I mean, stacking up health is never wrong. Yeah, kill switch is instead going for the risky play, taking the T28. It's really good if you can manage to get two copies of an important unit, but um, having your unit partisans removes the pincer effect, and, and sometimes... it's hard to get additional value out of it. Sometimes if you're like desperate for answers to certain cards, having that specific card that is uh, dying, um, being uh, put on top of your deck, isn't exactly what you want. Yeah, I mean, theoretically, your opponent, uh, if they infinitely kill T28, they could just make you draw T28 every turn. But <laughs> T28 does have smoke screen, so that is not really possible, but... Thank God it does, because if it didn't, uh, <laughs> you could get pretty chain. screwed over by your own card. Chain of scrap metal. So, yeah, definitely not surprised to not see the armored train, but... Would you... Hmm. Yeah, I, th I think bloody yeah. circling the Petlyakov is pretty solid. Kill switch still has one more, plus two winter workers. Ground. That's pretty. Yeah, I think I would just go with a train here. Yeah, no train. reason not to really. Yeah, the train sig on three defense dodges a uh, line per day. Mm -hmm. um... It'd also be kind of a waste of line for a day. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, J King has a lot of good cards, but if Kill Switch happens to have like Partisan's Red Banner, then this two seventy second is it's probably too dangerous to play because if if Kill Switch happens to have Partisan's Red Banner, that's yeah. it's just gonna be really hard to come back from. But I mean, uh, yeah, you can and... naval engagement, but um, just losing the two seventy second is pretty that's... rough. As for stealing the 272nd, as we've seen in like uh, one of the previous matches, um, the players at, at this level, they usually know, they, they're, they're usually aware of the fact that in mirrors, your opponent might have a partisan uh, to steal your 272nd at any given time. And so they try to play around it as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Is it is it naval engagement time yet? Uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, it eats two cards. Like you're trading one card for two cards, and the cards that you're getting rid of are both. I mean, neither of them are super heavy. Like you know, um, is is two or two seventy second. Yeah. But they're both medium sized cards that are threats. Like armored train and Alpini are both. On the yeah. higher end of the spectrum in this control mirror, and if you can get rid of two of them with one card, seems yeah. seems okay. Definitely not. And all that while you have in the front line and denying your opponent access to it. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how much the front line is going to matter this game. We'll see. Yeah, 
Virtue with the amount of guards that both players carry. Kill switch is interesting. One yeah, kill switch has an absolutely fantastic hand there, but in doing so, they are closer to fatigue. They do take five damage, but um, they're planning ahead, five years ahead even. And J King deciding that uh, gonna play a little bit of a copycat game. Why not? <laughs> He's paying tribute to Kill Switch's play last turn. Um, only in this matchup, there's not a whole lot of fantastic 39th targets. I guess you have the Fiats, but Briansk mm -hmm. is kind of a feels bad. You can take the 329th Engineers. Which is um, probably the best target in most cases. The, the further the game progresses, getting close to fatigue. Yeah, um, I mean, it probably is the best target, but everything is relative. Like, yeah, depending on the <laughs> compared to a Compared to a 3-5 Greyhound, doesn't yeah. feel super great. Or a 15-16 uh, uh, mobilized... Uh, Exactly. I mean, yeah, you, you know what card I'm talking about. Yeah, the 70, 73rd. Yeah, the little Frenchie. Oh, and that's J King's second pet deck off we see here. Yeah, and he can't get through this fiat without trading one for one. But even just denying the deployment effects, Kill Switch has a lot more deployment. Of, actually, mm, yeah, Kill Switch does have more deployment effects mm. than J King in hand. But Kill Switch deciding that now is worth a naval engagement that really mm. surprises me. I think naval engagement is an insanely strong card, and yeah. that just seemed like a really, really low value naval engagement. I. When that card came out, I completely underestimated it. I was like, why would you pay nine credits for it? And then somebody played it against me. And then a couple of games later, somebody else played it against me. And I um, decided to try it out myself. And I learned to appreciate the card. Super helpful. Yep, for sure. And painful, depending on where you start. I, d I also undervalued <laughs> the card. And then Birdo convinced me that it's actually pretty good. Mm. Now that the naval engagements are gone, Kill Switch can start to think about 272nd Red Banner, as there's significantly more limited options to take take out the the US of Stalins. Doesn't really need to happen right now or anytime soon, but the option is becoming more and more reasonable. And kill switch is gonna start being able to hit that HQ if J King doesn't play the seventh Alpini. So I'm expecting that that's what we're gonna see. Hmm. What, what is, is the card the, in the, the left of J King's hand? I was yeah. just about to ask the same. Yeah. It might be a lion, lion for a day. Oh, I think you're right. Yeah, I think that's Lion. Because we talked about it earlier, and he hasn't played one since, so... Um... Yeah, that's Lion. Is he going to hold on to that card, or is he going to use it against the uh, Naval Brigade? Probably not. Feels like a waste at this point. Um... Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I mean... Naval Brigade is, is an issue, and nothing really trades favorably into it, so I, I don't necessarily mind burning a lion for a day on it. The only thing is you have to be careful that you still have answers for 272nd Red Banner, and Kill Switch 
burned the naval engagement. So I don't know. <laughs> like I feel like now that she burned the naval engagement and and the uh, the naval brigade, I feel like your options for. I I don't know if if you can burn that lion. I mean, if worse comes to worse, both players still have uh, ice use slumbering somewhere in their decks. True, but I mean, your ISU needs to... Get to your hand first. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, and not only that, but you have limited answers to your opponent's threats, and yeah, ISU is one answer, but you, you want more than one answer if your opponent is putting down more than one threat, which they mm -hmm. will. This game seems to be favoring J-King at the moment, just because J-King has access to a lot more removal. But, you know, it's still far from... far from over. I mean, uh, look at... just look at Killswitch's new profile pic... or picture. He seems hella dedicated to take that title. Yeah, he, he's he got the... the cool guy shades on. The shades, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, J King probably debating whether or not to play the Winter Warfare. And the Brian's just to top it off, guarding against the Fiat. Kill Switch could take the Fiat or the um the Brian's always an option. If With you're Mr. really dedicated <laughs> Mr. to getting in, <laughs> Mister Steel Your Girl. Girl, yeah. Yeah, I remember when that card came out. I was like, wow. What a mm. crazy, crazy good card. It's uh, like a slightly worse confusion with a body, but not just any body, it's a 5-5. Five, five. Yeah, 5-cast five 5-5 five, five with one of the strongest deployment mm. effects out there. Mm -hmm. Pretty freaking good. <laughs> As I call him, Mr. Steal My Signal. Get your hands off my signal. Yep. Alright, okay. Kill switch Alright, kill that. switch is going for it. Knowing it, that. it could be punished by Winter Warfare IS um, ISU, but given that J King just burned a Winter Warfare, there's only one more, I believe, in J King's deck. I believe J King plays oh, two. He has two line for days in his hand. Yeah, so only one more Winter Warfare from J King, and J King is going to need to save it for the IS, ISU. Alright, what is J King going to find the here? Drum roll. Oh, an okay. armor train. <laughs> okay, so. Assuming that the other options were. Probably not what he wanted to. Yeah, I mean, Armored Train is not amazing, but not bad either. It does require an answer eventually. It's an and... okay pick most of the time. Yeah, J King saved those line for days for the Yosef Stalins, which I think is a really good use of them. Skill switch re-establishing a board here. I mean, now he's uh, he's aware that uh, J King played his. Uh, can you remind me real quick? Is J King running two naval engagements? Yeah, I think just he... one, I believe. Yeah, so he is safe to do that, not having to fear the complete backline wipe. I think knowing that um, both line for days are out now. He, uh, kill switch is safe to move stuff into the front line. Um, Probably, yeah. So, I think he's probably thinking about moving the Bryansk and the 7th Alpini up, so... Uh, Jaikin cannot play uh, Partisans on... Or, at, le at least he won't be able to hit stuff in... Um, Kill switches back line. Mm 
Yeah, it's, um, I don't know, these games are just really tough. You gotta think about every decision and the consequences of it. And they definitely are. They're definitely thinking through it. But, um... I think there's no other matchup where um, noting down uh, what your opponent has played is more important than... Oh, 100%. I 100% yeah. agree with that. I mean, in, in, in Jagger, it's like you can you can roughly keep track of it, but here, as long as the games go, the, the harder it becomes to just like keep all the stuff that has been played in mind. Yeah, um, especially if you're like practicing against your friend and you're both playing the same decks and you're like, was that this game or five games ago i don't it all blurs yeah. together and then one um, tells the other dude we've been sitting here for like five hours i don't remember um right. yeah it's yeah i'm curious to see if j king is gonna try and empty the hand a little play towards this five-year plan um i think that exactly what's gonna happen Not gonna get the infantry off the armored train. Very sad. Yeah. Quite unfortunate. But J King felt that getting rid of the Alpini was more important. Which, given that the Alpini is gonna gain like four health off of every light infantry that it eats, yeah, yeah makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I can't be I can't be that critical. Kale okay, switch debating whether you should ram that fiat into the armor train. I mean, he could do that and. Oh, wait, no. Never mind, I was just thinking about like playing winter offensive here. Oh, he, he is playing winter offensive. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Wiping the board, yeah. Wouldn't you want to attack with the Vrions first? So that, that was, yeah. Yeah, so that you get the, the health off of the, the, engineers. the engineers. Yeah. Are we going to see a... Nope. And this is where it gets interesting. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm sure that both these players are fatigued. It's the last match of the day. Yeah. And they're fighting like this is this is probably the hardest matchup in the game, the Soviet control mirror match. Yeah. And it requires a lot of brain power. Yeah, and so it's I'm not really surprised that it looks like Killswitch made a very minor ordering error. But I mean, it's not that... I'm sure that there's stuff that I've missed just watching it yeah, yeah. that I haven't I mean, even thought about. <laughs> each, each and every player makes mistakes. Even even Jaking makes mistakes. The 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 key thing is um who makes fewer mistakes. Right? Yeah, for sure. So... Yeah, this T28 is just like sitting in kill switch's hand <laughs> and because <laughs> J King killed off the T seventy second. What's like the next best target for the T twenty eight? What do you even put it on? Maybe an ICU if you can get it down. Yeah, I mean, I guess. But if you, you can, if you don't, <laughs> I mean, certainly not a Bransk. Or, um. The Kuvin Cossacks trade. I mean, the thing about um, putting the T29, uh, T28 pincer effect on the ICU is you also need the stuff to, uh, you also need like a winter warface to damage your opponent's uh, units to be able yep. to use the ICU to, don't get me wrong, like it has a good stat line, but you want to utilize, you want to get something out of the effect. So, and unless you have the winter warface to do that, probably not. 
and jacking with the rotor balloon. Yeah, so jaking is also playing Road to Berlin. Um, so, yeah, what what are the differences between these two decks? Are they just the same deck? Uh, I believe so. I'm gonna double check. Look over everything. Yeah, I'm almost 100% certain that these are the same deck list. So really just a, it comes down to how well these players use their resources. And so far, I'm going to give it to Jaking. I think Jaking has been more effective with his use of resources, but... Yeah, he's been doing an excellent job with uh, conserving uh, most of his... Uh removal and using it effectively for instance the the double uh double line for a day against these two uh ice twos mm -hmm. yep i agree oh and there's mr steel you go but kill switch does have a lot more life i don't think that mm -hmm. it's gonna matter that much but if they do happen to come down to Given that they have the exact same amount of draw in their deck, if it does come down to fatigue, it is better to have a lot of life. However, Killswitch did go second, which means Killswitch is slightly lower on cards if they if they both draw the same amount. Alternatively, Killswitch has ways to put cards back into his deck. Uh, cough, cough, T28. So Should delaying maybe it's team. not so simple. <laughs> yeah. Maybe it was all ca calculated, right? Yeah, maybe kill switch was <laughs> like the T twenty eight is how I'm gonna get myself out of fatigue. <laughs> Seriously, I mean, like as yeah. as crazy as it sounds, like maybe no, no, maybe that maybe that's what kill switch was thinking the entire time is that T twenty eight is gonna save him on fatigue. Because it didn't make sense at the time, but. Maybe 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 kill switch that's, is just ten thousand IQ. See, that's 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 what I mean when I say like these these players like all of these players in the in the especially in the top eight OCCs, but also qualifiers too. Uh, they think turns ahead. They plan turns ahead, and that's what makes them so good. That's what makes them so, uh, you know. Is he going to steal the? Yeah. I think the fiat makes more sense. You can start. Increasing the gap between life totals even more. And then Briansk isn't really hurting anybody. Not really doing anything. Yeah. Oh, interesting. Just like so Forcing the Briansk back into the back line with confusion. Three cost retreat hmm. target unit. Um, it's not super great, but confusion is not the strongest card in the world in this matchup, so I guess there's definitely worse uses for it. Fighting over over who gets to keep what units. And we'll probably just see a bloody sickle come out and yeah, yeah. have the oh, 39th pushed up. Both players are, are keeping ice use in their hand. So, yeah, I'm curious if Banatron thinks that this is the better Soviet Soviet mirror, or, uh, or if um, Ped he, versus Virto is the better Soviet mirror. I'll you know to what? Ask him. I I will ask him right after the broadcast. I'm curious myself. <laughs> what do you personally think is the better uh, Soviet control list? Soviet control deck? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, you already know the answer to that. One. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Italiano vero, as they say in the, the Mediterranean. Uh, yeah, I mean, I given that I had some amount of hand in coming up with this mm -hmm. list, I think that this list is better. But the only thing that I'm not super sold on are the fiats. 
I'm, I'm kind of curious now, is there anything you would say that um, uh, Soviet France control does better 100% of the time? Ooh, um, creating threats. With remotes. Yep. Yeah, they do a better job of creating threats. Hmm. Jay King on his, uh, I believe that's his last seventh opinion, right? I think so. Yes, I think you're right. Yep. Hmm. You can kill switch during this position. I um, mean, you could use a hammer. You can. The thing is, he he's probably holding back on deploying too many units because he's well aware of the fact that it's the exact same list. So of course, Jake yeah, is running ICs. Yeah, I think that uh, given that J King is. Use. I'm not sure how many bloody sickles shaking is used, but probably probably running pretty low on them. So mm. this five one is <coughs> not in that much danger. Jaking only has a winter worker to deal with it, and you want to save that for your ISU. Jaking's second armored train of the game coming down. Winter offensive. Interesting. Getting rid of both of the both of the kill switch units. <clears throat> yeah, kill switch has an absolutely oh. massive health lead here, and they are both players are approaching fatigue. <laughs> about, uh, I mean, resting on almost fifty health uh, while like steering right into fatigue. Well, your opponent is sitting on 15 health. Yeah. That always comes with some sort of confidence, right? Like, he can he can just uh, lay back, uh, guard up. And um, the only thing that needs to be addressed is the uh, looming thread that is so the 270 second. It looks like J King has slightly more cards in deck. Could be wrong, but that's what it looks like. And that T twenty eight on the Breons, I mean you called it earlier. You called it. Getting getting multiple Breonsks. Ooh baby. Who could ask for more? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not an ideal target, but mm -hmm. you know, that is what happens if you run out 272nd. It, it's tough, right? I mean, if you run out 272nd, play the T28, then it's just going to get uh, part, um, partisans, right? <clears throat> yeah. But if you. That's... Oh, okay. So kill switch is it's one to three cards. I now see why Kill Switch is doing that on the Bryansk. Cause what's worth noting though is that Kill Switch could have saved it until later, and um, and used it to reset fatigue, which might end up being really relevant. It's crazy mm. to me that Kill Switch used both five-year plans. And yet is roughly even with J King on fatigue. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, they're running the exact same list, right? That's... Yes, I think so. <laughs> I mean, um... kill switch is close to killing J King here. I mean, you can partisan this ISU. So I think we can agree on uh, that second five-year plan in, in Jaking's hand is a dead card. 
Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, 100%. It's not gonna... At this, point, at this point, it is giving your opponent 3 HQ defense while you take, like, t uh, 10. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, plus fatigue, I forgot. Um, so, oh, yeah, plus fatigue, like, 15. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah it's definitely dead card at this point. Whew. Ironically, kill switch... Kill switch. Uh, the 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 difference in HQ defense totals is pretty significant. I'm trying to I'm trying to figure out a way. Uh, J King could can turn things to his advantage. Um, I mean, I'm not sure that J King I mean, isn't in the advantage. Um, yeah, he still has his two hundred and seventy second. He has the two seventy second, which is really important. Right, he, he, oh, okay. There. Oh, is. there's this. Oh. Okay, that's that's why I wasn't gonna say him. Like, mm. it's crazy that. Yeah, that makes a lot more sense. <laughs> now I understand mm. what was going on. So, things are far from over for Jay King. Yeah, and I'm sure that Kill Switch knows that J King has the 272nd because he hasn't seen it yet. Has J King used the the red banner? I don't think so. I don't think so either. It's I think probably I think down it's in J King's deck. In the bottom two cards of this deck. Which means that like if you're if you're Kill Switch, you have to save this one more for ISU for that. Yeah. Which means you have to use the lion for a day on this. Oh, this yeah, is so I mean, Kill intense. Switch is just like out of <laughs> out of cards to deal with this stuff, but at the same time, like J King's health total is so much lower. Man, this is a crazy game. The, the... At some point, he has to play the 272nd, but he's also well aware that it gets stolen. Yeah, and he knows that Kill Switch has the ISU still. True, yeah. True. This is a lot of mind games going on right here. <laughs> it's a lot of, like, playing chicken. The first person to... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, which card is checking highlighting the train? Mm, the yes. Okay. I totally knew that and didn't mm. wait for him to play it before I said that. <laughs> <laughs> it's worth noting that the road to Berlin's are gonna trigger off of each other's fatigue, so it's gonna be interesting how that all interacts. And there it is. That's the red banner. The last card in a stack. J King, play the five year plan. I'm the little <laughs> devil on his shoulder that we both know you want to I'm the other devil. We got rid of the angels. Hmm. Yeah, J King is gonna start taking some pretty major damage here. <laughs> I think if J King, how is J King going to get through this Briansk? It's going to take a crazy long time to get through it just by, just by playing your 1-1s. One I think you have to play the Fiat here if you're J King. Yeah, yeah, agree. And to bait out your opponent's ISU and I think I mean, you have you to. need to gain some health. Well, yeah, but more important than that is you need to get through this Briansk in time where you're still able you're to still alive to hit with yeah. these with these light infantry exactly man this is this is a close game hmm. 
Yeah, this is this is tough. Is Jay King really? Uh, okay, I thought he was hovering over Red Banner. I'm like, that's crazy. No, There's no way. Can't be serious, Jay King. So, are we gonna? I mean, maybe it's not crazy. Maybe turning it into either the 6-5 KV2 or the 7-7 seven, seven guy that repairs himself at the end of the turn. Defensive, oh, yeah. The yeah. defensive guy, I think. Like, both of those would be pretty solid here. So maybe maybe Red Banner is the play. But it seems a little bit late now. And this is the problem, J King is just a little bit slow. And even though Kill Switch is ahead on fatigue, he put enough distance between the HQ totals that Okay, so the fatigue Looking... is not triggering each other's road to Berlin's. I could have sworn mm. that it yeah. did, that it I I, I, I would have bet money on it that that fatigue triggers road to Berlin. I uh, I must have misremembered it then. Mandela effect. Probably. Yeah. So. Yeah. So uh, Jaking is gonna drop this. Play the red banner. Uh, and kill switch is gonna ISU, and then it's gonna be kill switch's game. He's not red bannering yet. Oh, no red banner, mm. huh? Okay, okay. <laughs> Making it so if kill switch burns it, J King is gonna have an 8 8. How much is Jake King taking next turn? Three or four? I think four. Okay, so who would win in that race? I think Kill Switch would still win. Or, no, maybe not. No, no, no. I think Jake King would win. Oh. I mean, knowing about knowing oh. about the ICU and Kill Switch's hand, he's probably not going to Red Banner. Yeah, no, red bannering would be a mistake for sure. Interesting. Oh, this is so inclined. <sighs> yeah, Jaking would need to end the game this turn, which he can't because he's missing the damage. So and then next Dang, turn, I didn't think only... that the HQ defenses were going to be relevant. But uh But indeed they are. I mean Yeah, it ended up coming down to who had more health in the end. Jaking had more resources, but a good eight to die. Coming from kill switch here who yeah, kill switch knows what's in Jaking's hand. Or should, if he's been paying attention, so... Quite a game, mm -hmm. for sure. There's no way out of this. Jaking is about to take 4 damage. <clears throat> the second kill switch ends his turn. Kill switch taken six fatigue here. And that is game one going to kill switch. Alright. So kill switch needs to win with Jagro and Frontline. And J King needs to win with Soviet Control, Frontline, and Mobilize. <sighs> 
I mean, J King's probably gonna take um, Soviet control again, realistically, because it's a super good matchup in devoted good, kill yeah. switches decks. I believe kill switch is going to go with Jagra. Oh, and that is in fact what we're gonna see. That Pelyakov is so strong in this matchup, but without a guard, it's a little bit fragile. <clears throat> and Killswitch debating between uh, saying I'm going to keep a half track to bounce your Bryansk. Um, nope, instead throwing it back. And Killswitch has a really nice early game start. Um, yep. But this matchup is pretty brutal for frontline, so especially with the turn two fiat. Turn two fiat, I can just uh, yeah deal with these uh, 164 uh, infantry regiments. Yeah, J King, if J King had a confusion here, that'd be super nice. I think in this could matchup... could also attack the Greyhound and then Bloody Sickle. Yeah, which is probably... Probably what he's going to go for. Yep. Alrighty. I believe Killswitch is uh, holding back the half tracks for those big guards. Yeah, um, but he's going to be sorely disappointed when J King drops that Pelikov and true. <laughs> starts to look a lot less good really quick. Killswitch could just trade the Greyhound with the Fiat. And then deploy the uh, other Greyhound. Yeah, otherwise oh, the, oh, no, the wait, Fiat is yeah. just going to eat the Greyhound. I'm about, I'm, I'm in, yeah. Or you could attack the HQ and play the Greyhound. It's an option too. Oh, okay. Yeah, managing to keep managing to keep all the units on the board. A little bit weak to Winter Warfare, but really strong if you can manage to keep these units on the board. Maybe get a Blitzkrieg in the next couple turns. End the game early, which is really your only shot when playing against this deck. Like, if J-King doesn't answer this Greyhound, then Sherman is coming down next turn for kill switch. And it does not look like that's going to happen. Kill switch could play Ribblewind, could play the say, 164th and push up the Greyhound and attack. And he decided to attack with a... Greyhound. Yeah, setting up a potentially strong Blitzkrieg. Maybe. Mm. Potentially. Mm. And there and is there. the winner word there. <laughs> there comes the front line. And there's the and Blitzkrieg. And there's the oh Blitzkrieg. <laughs> Just a little bit too late. I mean, it, realistically, yeah. Killswitch didn't have the credits and the units to make the most out of it, but still disappointing that mm. it kind of comes just a little bit after you would have liked it. Yeah, okay, this is a... Yeah, this is a pretty... Oh! <laughs> this is a pretty brutal lock. Three units in hand, out of which all of them get cancelled by a single 2-4 bomber. Yeah, especially uh, Fifth Rangers. Yeah. Really brutal. J King not skipping a beat and taking the opportunity to get that pet like I've done. Showing no mercy. I mean, so Killswitch knows that J King is. Holding the um, BM artillery in his hand. So he's mm -hmm. probably going to wait for that thing to come down again. 
before he plays strategic Strat bombing? bombing? Yep, for sure. <laughs> Yeah, setting it up for strat bombing. I mean, kill switch is just gonna take the front line over the next couple turns and make. Did I say kill switch? I J King is gonna take the front line over the next couple turns and make kill switch's life absolutely hell. Or kill switch. Okay, how many cards does kill switch have that answer this pet deck off at the moment? It is um so through guards bomb? none. Uh, he's running that one copy of Eagle Claw, so if he can get that. Uh, yeah, him. I mean theoretically, yeah. theoretically that is you'd have to combine strap bombing and Eagle Claws, and then there's still another another Pelikov later that yeah, but... you have to deal with. But yeah, I mean. This point, At it's least just this wishful, way you get rid of the guards. Wishful thinking. <clears throat> yeah, I don't really see a world where. Goes for the trade. I was thinking about it for quite a while. Pushing up the BM. <laughs> Yeah, just securing that front line. That is uh... Kill switch has the fantastic opportunity to play fifth rangers and attack for four <laughs> credits. Unbelievably strong. <laughs> 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 four four with four operation cost and blitz. Amazing. Such a good card in that situation. I mean, and I love the... that it makes you choose between the two, even yeah, though you don't even matter. get anything. The illusion of a choice, right? The illusion <laughs> of choice. <laughs> so, kind of, kind of astonishing to see how many times this plane there ruins people's days. This is. Infuriating to say the least. <laughs> Whatever kills Yeah, I mean, J King right can just play 39th because yeah. hopefully it's... that Pelikov is going to stay there the entire game. So, better to just get stuff into the front line, protect your Pelikov, than play mm. around when the Pelikov mm. dies. Kill switch, drawing another Blitzkrieg here. Yep, that's that is not what you need. No. This would have been a pretty good. Still not a bad strap bombing, but you have to figure out a way to get that Pelikov out of the game. Shaking can just double bloody sickle. Which um I mean Or even just attack with Pelikov. Nah, now no, there's the eagle claws. I was just about to say that. Oh, if, is that worth if you have gotten, like If he would have gotten this one turn earlier, he could have double. Uh, he, he could have strat bombing and eagle claws uh, <clears throat> to finish off uh, both the 39th and the Petlekov. Yeah. Same time. Well, he, yeah. I don't think he had the credits for it, but. Mm. Yeah, this is tough. Killswitch he's, finally found the answer that he needs, but he's one he uses it, he's still going. really not in a great position with no mm. resources left and just praying that praying that you can find something. Pushing back the Yeah, I mean, you have to play this with yeah. Rangers as an 8-8. You don't have an option. No. Q 
kills which still fighting through. Oh, this is rough. This is yeah, there is um the uh, seven Golpini touches the bone. <clears throat> Yeah, Kill Switch can push everything up. Blitzkrieg trade out with the Hellcat, but it's probably better to just push up the 8 3 and trade that way. I need to save on the. save the Hellcat. So I think um, uh, Blitz units are pretty. Valuable in this, um, absolutely, especially not, not in, take out stuff like, like like armored train, <laughs> take out um, IS twos, ISUs. Might be that yeah, Hellcat yeah. is super important. Oh, Sky Ooh. Train, Ooh. Kill Switch can start generating value. The sky above Kill Switch, Kill Switch's head has just cleared. Yeah, I mean, J-King is going to end those hopes and dreams pretty quickly with a winner. Yeah, with the win Okay, but... yeah. I completely looked, uh, overlooked that card. Jesus. Oh. Oh. Wow. Oh, this is... Hmm. That's, that's brutal. Okay, but, but uh, Kill Switch can play Hellcat and draw a Sherman. Opting to draw again with Sherman player. over attacking. Oh. Oh. <clears throat> Jake I mean, now has some issues that he needs to deal with sooner rather than later. So he can. And there he goes. Got one of the. Yep, good play from Jake. That is really what you want out of confusion is to just trade two of your. It, it's it's. Four credits, one card, destroy two units. That's better than high altitude bombing. Way, way better than high altitude bombing. Um, but. <clears throat> you can half track, but Is if only awesome? if only he knew, if only Kill Switch knew that those cards were two seventy second in Red Banner, I feel like he would reconsider the half track. I think I think he's not gonna play half track though. He might be in a one. Uh, he might have won the first game, but um, he knows what's at stake. So he's probably holding on to that uh, half track, or is he? Question mark. We will see. I mean, Kill Switch needs value here, but no amount of value is going to be able to handle a 270 second red banner. Nah. Doesn't matter what you do. Enigma, just as an expensive convoy, feels bad. <laughs> Yeah, I'm not. I'm not feeling this enigma in frontline. What do you think? Um, there, it, it's highly situational. There's, like many other cards, there's situations where you like, um, thank God that I drew my enigma. But I think the majority of the time, it it's a liability. I would say. Yeah, um, I, I feel. I feel like it decreases consistency, and. Yeah doesn't really get you that much in return. Also like um if you're if you're laddering with frontline and you run enigmas, like how many times do you come across uh, Jago and Jago is not a deck that is known for its huge hand size, right? So players mm -hmm. empty the, the empty out the hands as quickly as possible. And um while most Jago lists that that are being run on ladder have or are running Enigma themselves, so yeah, you're not going to get very far with that. But then again, there's situations where Enigma really comes in clutch, and you get to draw like I've seen people draw enough, uh, yeah, up to seven, uh, six cards. Uh, off sure, the wall, and I, you know, I've I've seen that too. But in a deck that's so heavily tempo focused, like Frontline, 
I feel like taking taking the time to spend four to draw that much when you could just Sherman. Yeah. It's... I don't know. I really don't know how I feel about and that. And if you if you already played Shermans, then it's kind of counterproductive because your hand is going to hold a significant amount of cards where kill switch is fishing for a kill here. <laughs> With three guards in his back line, that could be a bit tricky. Yeah, it's definitely very tricky. Um, is J King gonna play this red banner? I, I think he might as well, right? Like the strap bombing and the evil are gone. He's not playing it on the. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. Playing it to try and get another 270 second, uh, knowing that both of the costs, uh, both of the options at eight cost are a six, six or six, seven infantry with guard that generates value. So, yeah, that's that actually makes a lot of sense. He also knows how valuable guards are in his situation mm -hmm. because there's half tracks that can bounce uh, either one of his uh, infantry units on the back line. So, is he going? To... Yeah, it's it's hard for Jake King to find what he needs to win, even if he's outvaluing kill switch left and right. But actually finding what you need to to get through kill switches frontline is tough. Let me just check the list again. I think kill switch was running. Yeah, he's running two copies of Blitzkrieg. So that is the second uh, Blitzkrieg. Mm -hmm. And he's played the first one. Yep. Um, <clears throat> Has he played? I'm not sure. Has he played dive bombing? Yep. He played it on the 272nd. Oh, yeah. So he is running out of removal very quickly. He could clear those two guards and the, uh, and the resulting. Uh, Ice two. What's the yellow cap? Um, uh, does he have enough credits? Yep. Yeah, but you would just have a Blitzkrieg in hand versus your opponent's Fiat. I feel like it's not a good position to be in, but it might be his best play. I mean, it's probably I'm probably the wrong person to um to judge here, but I really, really dislike the um the fact that uh, kills, which is U.S. Uh, German mid range list, is doing without he can do it. I think it's one of the best cards in the deck. You think? I'm not super hot on we can do it. I maybe I'm just so accustomed to. I'm not really a frontline player myself. Whenever I built a frontline, uh, US frontline list, um, yeah, it felt like such a mainstay. But, I mean, it kind of feels like win more in some ways. Mm. And this is gonna be it for Kill Switch. Kill Switch can trade yeah. with the Bologna, but cannot. He, you know, he. Yeah. And he it, if it. you push the Werbo into the front line, then the Alpini is gonna trade it off, yeah. and then you can. Yeah, it's a tough matchup. So, so both definitely... players have won with their Soviet Italy decks. Jaking has Mobilize and Frontline, and Killswitch has Jagro and Frontline. Will we I see think... another mirror in mm -hmm. our OCC finals? I I think it's gonna be we're gonna see uh, Mobilize versus Jagro. Or I don't I know if that's think wishful we're gonna thinking. see. Frontline from J King. Yep. Oh, the frontline mirror. Okay. <clears throat> I think J King wants to save Mobilize um, to beat Jagro. 
And we see Kill Switch going second. Thinking about keeping the fifth rangers here. No. Okay, and that is a. It's a lot of greyhounds. <clears throat> it's what happens when yeah. you play four copies of them. Mm -hmm. Or not, as we've seen in the. You but again. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, you know, you're replacing one of these 1 and 9th combat engineers with a Greyhound. It makes your, makes your Panzer 35T a little less consistent. But then and again... I really don't understand J. King's play here. That doesn't make any sense to me, why he's playing 35T, but... Maybe you can explain it to me later. <laughs> yeah. Also something on the long... Um long uh, list of things that I need to ask these players. It's um, tempting for J King to play Martyr here, but it totally gets blown out by Eagle Claws. Just so quick completely on, annihilated. On on the subject of um making the 35Ps less uh less effective, um I think with uh a full stack of Greyhounds you get more damage from hand and it's it's also cheaper to use than a 35T. If provided that you don't have infantry, um, which um... Oh. yeah, but I mean, I don't know. It's it's no joke to have a tank with zero operation cost. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, kill switch and J King are both playing around the eagle claws, which is very smart on both their parts. Ooh, this steps a little bit into an Eagle Claws. I'm kind of surprised to see that play from J. King, but on the other hand, J. King does have two Martyrs that are now a lot more safe. A lot more safe yeah. to be played. Um, both players are running um, a single copy of Eagle Claws, right? Yep. And if J. King can get this Martyr to stick around for the Pathfinders, ooh, baby, it's going to be good. Doesn't look like it. Oh, okay. Kill yep. switch establishing Kill martyr switch their own. With his own. I guarantee the J King is gonna <laughs> either play martyr pathfinders or like pathfinders something else. But yeah, I think martyr pathfinders make sense. Martyr pathfinders on the other martyr. Martyr is just such a crazy card. Absolutely yeah. crazy. Like the amount of draw you can get of a well timed martyr is just, uh, yeah, it's just Taking insane. deciding sometimes. better to keep the martyr pathfinders combo for later in the game. And J -King, all of J King's deployment effects, save for mar <coughs> or for pathfinders, are really just not useful unless you control the front line. More unuseful deployment effects. You can push back the fifth ranger with this. Yeah, but then what? True, then what? Then what? Um, if you got the front line after it, it'd be worth it. But yeah, but you don't. that's not really the case here. Hmm. <laughs> it's a tough position for J King, but on the other hand, J King has a lot more value than Kill Switch. Kill Switch instantly be lining for that trade. Yeah. Which makes sense. It's a high priority target. They already attacked with that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, um, given how long this uh, tournament's been going today, and they're both in the finals, they're they must be exhausted. Oh, um, both I'm of them. I'm exhausted, and I'm not yeah. even playing. Yeah, <laughs> I'm exhausted by just watching. <laughs> this martyr is coming out to get huge trades. 
striking with a fifth rangers on his own. Striking with kill switches fifth rangers, which is yeah. Um ooh. Kill switch almost has Hold lethal on. here. Hold on. Hold on. It's not lethal, but it's it's close. It's three off. And then there's also this nice little car called strap on me, right? The... True. But do you really wanna like play in a way that that's like your best chance at winning? No, or... no, 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 you're not playing off the top deck here. You wanna play it safe, right? Um... Probably. Yeah, almost lethal. Very close. Three damage shard. I mean, um, you you absolutely can play towards strap bombing. That is an option, but it leaves a little bit too much to chance, in my opinion. Yeah, I would probably on a second thought, I would probably just trade with the modder. Yeah. And it appears as though Kill Switch should have gone for the HQ because J King didn't have a way to. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Didn't so... have a Blitz unit. <laughs> Once one of J King's units make it to the front line, there's no. If if the Sherman makes it to the front line, there's no getting it back soon, right? That would require kill switch to trade with the Sherman, leaving little. Yeah, kill switch is so close to lethal here, so close, and. If J King didn't have the Blitz unit before, then it's unlikely that he has it now. So I think that Killswitch can pretty safely say that he's gonna be able to get in for four with his Sherman. I think I think this play makes sense. Absolutely. And that's gonna be and game. There it is. J King bluffing missing in an open deckless tournament. <laughs> Kill switch only needs a win with Jagro to be the this OCC Clash's champion, and he gets two two uh, opportunities at it. And it's very hard to lose twice with Jagro. <laughs> it's very hard to beat Jagro twice. So Kill switch <laughs> has an absolutely excellent shot at making it into first place for. 750 US dollars prize money. Shaking going for mobilize, pretty expected. Mobilize, one of the reasons that Jaking likes it is because it can have a strong matchup into Jagro. Chaos was probably debating whether they should keep the second rating. Yeah, raiding is really, really, really good against mobilize. It takes out a mobilize unit early, it takes out honey, takes out keepers. Like, raiding yes. is an insanely good card in this matchup. Yes, there is. And they, there's just too many targets to name them all. Yeah, I mean, Jaking does have the evasive action. <laughs> yeah. So, we'll see how that goes. Kill can just set up with a werewolf. Yep, I think that <laughs> makes sense, as it's unlikely that J King is going to be able to kill the bicycle, and even if he could, getting a werewolf out is kind of important. And J King realizing that the critical turn is turn three, the first important deployment effect is Raiding Brigade. Mm -hmm. 
And so he throws up that evasive action. Making sure, you know, it, you don't want to catch a 35T deployment effect with evasive yeah. action. That doesn't get you anything. Uh, you want to make sure that you catch something good and turn three with Raiding Brigade. Now that he has Honey, now that he has a um, a first uh, first Airborne. Or it's also extremely effective uh, in like later later in the game when um, Kill Switch is trying to remove one of these um, big mobilized units with a Sendai, for instance, and then. Uh, yeah, that semi goes down the drain. Yeah, and we're seeing very quickly why Mobilize is considered a good matchup against Jagro. There is the evasive. Yeah, that's really brutal. So You can push switch. up, but it dies, and then you don't get to expansion next turn. But if you don't push up, then you probably not your opponent is going to take lines. the front line, so kind of damned if you do, damned if you don't. It's not a position that I envy at all. Frankly, no. Jaking can use that first airborne to trade into both frontline units and then push up the Usuri. Yeah. And which is yikes. Pretty, yikes, yikes, yikes. Pretty resilient against like anything Kill Switch's deck has to offer. Yeah, J King mm -hmm. deciding the Ultra is more important than trading out. Huh. I wonder what J King is so worried about. Maybe Naval Sapphire? Mm. Maybe Enigma? I would think Enigma, because Naval Supply run on uh, effectively two units, because the signal is not going to matter for a couple of turns. Um, the kill switch is only on five credits. Yeah, I don't know. I'm really, really confused about this. Maybe, um, like, Audacity? Maybe trying to catch Audacity? Yeah, that would make sense. Ooh, there's an airdrop. I would say put it on the list of like long, long list of things of stuff that I want to ask the players. <laughs> Jaking's still holding it up instead of going for airdrop. I mean, he can still play airdrop, rather complicating things for kill switch. Yeah, but you'd have to get rid of Ultra. Oh yeah, right. My bad, sorry. Alright, so this does give Kill Switch the opportunity to expansion, which <laughs> I am very surprised. Very Let's... surprised that this expansion is even playable. If I had to take a bet earlier, I would have said that expansion isn't being played anytime soon. Not even close. But um mm -hmm. it is gonna get caught by the Ultra. And I don't think J King is going to be super thrilled about that. That's not a super great catch. Okay, okay. You could play Kiefer's and Convoy and start pinging your opponents. Seems pretty nice. Hmm. Jaking's thinking about it. Going for that play, going for the convoy, you draw two cards, you gain two life off of honey, you get two pings off a of kefir. But those pings just weren't where they needed to go. Yeah. Either want to kill the Yokosuka or kill the martyr or hit face, but you don't you definitely don't want it to be split amongst the units that don't die. <laughs> that is not super ideal. Aren't Jesus is on kill switch side here. Yeah, maybe. Do you 
right? Mod and then push up shits in? Probably, right? I don't I don't know if you push it. Pro you probably push up shits in. Yeah, yeah, that probably makes the most sense, because J King is never gonna push up any units that are in danger of dying anyways. The only time that J King is pushing up units is if they're like freaking massive. So yeah, I don't I don't think pushing up shits in is bad. Definitely don't have a problem with that. Yeah, kill switch will still if he if he decides to go for that <clears throat> go down that line. He's still going to drop wait, is he? He's trading with a okay, that's interesting. Okay, yeah, to try and generate as much value off you can. As much value off the martyr as you can. <laughs> oh, it's been a long day. Yeah. <laughs> And J King hit this crucial, uh, this crucial Potez turn, where you start to get to do crazy things. Oof. Yeah, this this martyr, and then trade with the Potez. Probably, right? I think, yeah, yeah I think the, the Potas has to die. <clears throat> or you could trade with the Potas in Bombing Raid. Hmm. Those are kind of the important decisions. Both plays are fine, but I would... Yeah, both are fine, for sure. Up for more draw here. Yeah, I'll trade with the Potas. So see the problem is here. That here is uh, the the longer these mobilized units stay. I mean, there's only yeah. Okay, there's only the Sendai right, that I can reliably, good. reliably deal with them. Yeah, and as we discussed earlier, there's only one copy in kill such as deck. Mm -hmm. Jaking has all the supply shortages in the world. Oh. A girl couldn't ask for more. Supply shortage is just too good against Aichu's. It's just... It's so strong. I mean, it's good against the entire deck of Jagger. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, especially, but especially against Aichu. If you compare it to an Eagle Clause, where your opponent still gets the residue... I mean, the, you know, the... the... And it looks like J-King isn't even really going to need to win with Commonwealth. Probably is just going to be able to win through making these giant 73rd infantry regiments. Or maybe like keeping the keepers around if kill switch doesn't kill it right here. Having a keeper that pings is also uh that is not where i expected that is like the last place that i expected the bombing raid to go i mean it is not too bad like giving <clears throat> removing the uh immobilized i mean the... it hit the target that was most Im important so it ended up working out jaking just throwing into his commonwealth Which I highly doubt he's going to be able to play in this match, but... I... I would start off with a 73rd and then maybe a Sincerely Yours. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Kill Switch is really running out of resources here. The leftmost 73rd is going to start to get out of hand really quick, especially in a world where J-King gets to play that Kitty Hawk. And in a world where, um, oh, he has a second uh, kill, switch, uh, kill Switch just found a second Type 94 TK. Yeah, although uh, it's, he doesn't it's need a little it right late. Now. It's a little bit late. Yeah. I mean, trading out is really the only play you can make here. It's gonna die next turn anyways. 
I might have to retract the statement about Jaking not being able to play Commonwealth now that the Kitty Hawk is out. Um, yeah, I don't know. If Kill Switch pushes up and Jaking can get an airdrop, that would be huge. Um, because that plus a call to the colonies would enable that commonwealth. Oh. Then again, J King is honestly just in a position to win right here. You don't even need much else. Yeah, I I, I don't think. Well, he can play commonwealth, but I don't think he he's gonna need to. He's probably just gonna win with the board that he. You, if you trying to get rid of the sex snow would be and using the surprise attacks it would be better to use the surprise attacks before true yeah. true yeah it's just something and unfortunately that makes the 73rd bigger but again i mean we've mentioned it a couple of times it's been a super long day and I don't want to know. Yeah, I mean, the clock has been Kill Switch's enemy several yeah. times this match. And yeah, J, J King has Commonwealth. That's gonna be it. I mean, oh. Kill Switch can can first try and draw something to get out of it, but I wasn't expecting gonna be him. It. I wasn't expecting him to get into a position where he can play Commonwealth. Um... All right. Cool. So our last match is gonna be Jagger versus Frontline, I believe. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. It all comes down to this. To the El Clasico, as I like to mention, uh, as I like to uh, call it. This is it. Seven fifty mm. goes to the winner of this very game. It's a lot of money. <laughs> it's yeah. like a lot, a lot of money. <laughs> Shaking has the frontline deck, and Killswitch has a Jagger deck. Uh, <coughs> you're gonna need to clarify that, in fact, Jaking won with the mobilize list and still has the frontline list. Here we're gonna see Frontline versus Jagro. The Brazil card back, as some people call it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and J King starting off with two 164ths, which is really strong when you're going second. Because you Jagro. just get to trade them out mm -hmm. whenever you want against their one drop units, and it's really nice. There's like too many. Too many uh, Jaguar but units that have I am, defense to come. I am 99% sure that Kill Switch is going to start this game off by not pushing up the bicycle mm -hmm. to play around the 164th. Yeah. And I think that JK <clears throat> is probably going to play the Greyhound to play around the Panzer. I mean. You again! <laughs> Can... Who else would it be? I mean... Kill switch as expected, keeping it back. And J King as expected, playing the Greyhound. Ooh, 
tough decision here. Do you just, you, uh, just you probably just hit face. Yeah, you don't want to lose. You're not them. really getting a value trade and forcing them to spend their credits to trade off with you is not a bad thing. But unfortunately, J King with those 164ths has the opportunity of A, making a 3 5 Greyhound, B, uh, making a 2 2 Greyhound and keeping a 164th back and trading with the 35T. Oh, kill switch pushing up, which allows J King to make a super favorable trade with the 164th. Hmm. Very unfortunate for Kilsuch. Oh, and he also got his Red Devils, which... Yep, that's you definitely a big deal uh... too. It enables that 35T to come out. Yeah, I like this move from J-King. I think J-King's going to play the 164th and the Greyhound. And that way... Mm -hmm. You're guaranteed to get a really nice trade with the. Uh... Oh, okay. Yeah, that works too. <coughs> no reason spending the 164th or release as mm -hmm. J King. The kill switch dropping huge threats. That key 83 really needs a half track to be answered, and there is there not is one no half in sight. Half in so mm -hmm. I think we're just going to see this Red Devils and 35T come out from J King. And, you know, hopefully J King can remove it later. He's debating mm. about whether to move it up or not. Yeah. As you can I see, I mean, that is the best bombing raid positioning. Yep. He's playing around bombing raid. Uh, <clears throat> and kill switch is just gonna attack, just attack the HQ, which makes sense. But kill switch missed out on an opportunity to martyr, um, which I mean, getting two draws here. Yeah, it's not a good opportunity. Mm -hmm. But um, you kind of had you you kind of had to do that, right? You kind of had to trade off with those frontline units, but at the same time, it really does suck to. I mean, to not get the most use out of them. Oh, and that's gonna trade out with the thirty-five, or sorry, with the key eighty-three. If you're... Oh, that's not a good draw. No. <laughs> oh. Things are not looking super great for kill switch. J King has quite a lot of value. These fifth rangers are gonna come out. Um, but I I do have to say I like the trading with the front line because I mean your kill switch knowing that oh yeah hundred percent it's there could be a uh, blitz creek right around the corner right so it's a hundred percent the correct play. It's just it feels bad. It yeah, feels bad that you have missing to out on draw feels always bad. Hmm. Yeah, I feel like you have to martyr here, cause, or or you could uh, play type and naval supplier on and hit the the fifth rangers, but hmm. Only if you knew about the eagle cost. Oh, you can you can pin the fifth rangers and oh, interesting. Okay, not not going for the more. Oh yeah, no, not enough credits. I was thinking, or no, yeah, no, no, it's enough credits that you, you just have to not enable the fire run. All right. Jaking is getting scarily close to being able to let off a bullets Krieg and <clears throat> kill switch is out of ammo. I mean, uh, the naval oh, supply wow. run discard is coming out. There goes the pain. Thank God it hits surprise attack, because otherwise kill switch would be instantly out of the game. Mm -hmm. Adina, that comes in. But handy. the the fact that kill switch won the one in three, 
and then happen to draw Dina off of it. Absolutely huge. Nice. <clears throat> Wait, that's not quite lethal. Uh, nope. It's gonna be 15, which is not quite enough. He's pushing up with an 8-8. He's not pushing up. Why is J King keeping the Orwell in back? Maybe he knows about. Or he, his intuition tells him that there's a third Yokosuka in attack 93. I mean, that's one hell of an intuition. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, at the end of the day, that's shaking we we're talking about. So <laughs> I wouldn't be the least bit surprised if that's what's going on in his mind at the moment. If Jaking was counting every single one drop used, yeah. and it's like, yeah. there's a 63% probability <laughs> that Dina drew third Yokosuka in type 93, you mean, exactly. You mean 63.7, right? Oh, yeah, I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm sure. Yeah, I, I don't think Jaking does much of that, but he definitely does keep track of the things that yeah, when yeah. it's a played. But I don't think he's like one of these poker poker people that knows the probability of everything right off the top of their head. I think most most uh most players in this level like just especially in like this matchup keep track of what's been played. Oh yeah, uh, for sure. Otherwise they wouldn't they wouldn't they would probably not be here. Mm-hmm. So... Yeah, you have to keep track of what's been played at this level. And pushing up another fifth rangers is probably Yeah, you can. You can. It sets up your blitzkrieg really nicely, but Kill Switch is gonna get the opportunity to trade some stuff out here. You're gonna be able to trade the Aichi into the kill the Warbowind with the Aichi and trade the Yokozuka into the fifth rangers, leaving only J King's eight eight fifth rangers. So I would honestly prefer to see you know, it would be better for J King if he just Warbowind killed this Aichi to pin yep. to pin the unit coming down. But it is it is really the only punish for this is like very specifically Yokosuka type ninety three. <laughs> so yeah. um Ooh. Uh, No, it's not gonna He can trade with the Yokosuka here. And kill switch still has the Sendai, right? If I'm not mistaken. Uh, I think so. Yeah. I think so. Pushing up two eight yeah. eights. Yeah, these are really hard for kill switch to get rid of. Oh. I don't think there's actually even enough answers left in kill switch's deck to to get rid of them. So he can trade away one. Can he? Yeah. Is that the best play? Um, I guess so because you're not playing Sheedon. Yeah, so... yeah, he's not. Uh, he's not running Sheedon. Guess it is better to just trade out. And that should be game. That's lethal. The Hellcat plus the Blitzkrieg plus the Fifth Rangers should be game. Four credits plus three credits, seven credits plus three more, ten credits. Yep. So. J King just making sure it's all squared away, but we will see J King as the winner of this month's OCC Clash. Unless something is terribly, terribly wrong. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even need that. Well, congratulations. Exactly. Two very, very skilled players playing some hard fought matches. A coming down right down to it right down to uh final game take uh, winner takes all so 
Phenomenal job to both the players. Huge shout out to Jay King, who's going to be going into the World Championships on December 2nd and 3rd, having just won the OCC Clash. Killswitch had a phenomenal tournament. Uh, props to both of you. That was a long series to cast, and you kept your uh, wits about you for the whole thing. So, uh, you know, phenomenal shout out. You both did a, a fantastic job. Let's go. Let's go take a look at the bracket, the final bracket, and, and paint a picture of what we uh, accomplished here today. We will not be going to the bracket right away. So mm -hmm. while we wait for that, uh, why don't I remind all of you that we revealed three more cards for Winter War today, and uh, that is releasing November 29th. So you can get the pre-order in the store. It's ready to go. It's good to go. It's coming out in just about 10 days. So uh, keep your eye out for that. Of course, the World Championship happening on December 2nd and 3rd live from Iceland. Um, I'll be there. Sorry, I'll be there. Sorry, Red Sun. Didn't mean to rub it in. Just realized that as it came out of my mouth. But uh, it's going to be a fantastic event. So everybody stay tuned. Um, so that will be fantastic. And I do want to go through the bracket one last time. So uh, there you see J King's path to victory, defeating Godian in the uh, feature quarterfinal 2-1, to one, defeating Head 2-0, and uh, finally defeating Killswitch 3-2. to two. So J-King does take home 750 USD. Killswitch in second, 450 USD. Birdo there defeating Head in our bronze match for $300 as well. So prizes for the top three, right down to eight. They're all walking away with some diamonds. Not the real kind, the in-game kind, unfortunately. But uh, Starry, phenomenal job as always. But uh, yeah, special shout out. Corn Guy, Thanatron, Red Sun, uh, all of y'all did uh, just a fantastic job today. We had a wonderful performance by all the players, all the casters, and to each and every one of you, thank you for watching. We'll see you in Iceland.